Chapter 1. The Strange Man's Arrival The stranger came early in February, one wintry day, through a biting wind and a driving snow, the last snowfall of the year, over the down, walking from Bramblehurst Railway Station, and carrying a little black portmanteau in his thickly gloved hand. He was wrapped up from head to foot, and the brim of his so brim of his soft felt hat hid every inch of his face but the shiny tip of his nose. The snow had piled itself against his shoulders and chest, and added a white crest to the burden he carried. He staggered into the coach and horses, more dead than alive, and flung his portmanteau down. A fire! he cried. In the name of human charity! A room and a fire! He stamped and shook the snow fr from off himself in the bar, and followed Mrs. Hall into her guest parlour to strike his bargain. And with that much introduction, that and a couple of sovereigns flung upon the table, he took up his quarters in the inn. Mrs. Hall lit the fire and left him there while she went to prepare him a meal with her own hands. A guest to stop at Ipping in the winter time was an unheard of piece of luck, let alone a guest who was no haggler, and she was resolved to show herself worthy of her good fortune. As soon as the bacon was well under way, and Millie, her lymphatic maid, had been brisked up a bit by a few deftly chosen expressions of contempt. She carried the cloth, plates, and glasses into the parlour, and began to lay them with the utmost eclat. Although the fire was burning up briskly, she was surprised to see that her visitor still wore his hat and coat, standing with his back to her and staring out of the window at the falling snow in the yard. His gloved hands were clasped, clasped behind him, and he seemed to be lost in thought. She noticed that the melting snow that still sprinkled his shoulders dripped upon her carpet. "'Can I take your hat and coat, sir?' she said, "'and give them a good dry in the kitchen?' "'No,' he said without turning. She was not sure she had heard him, and was about to repeat her question. He turned his head and looked at her over his shoulder. "'I prefer to keep them on,' he said with emphasis, and she noticed that he wore big blue spectacles with side lights, and had a bush a bush side-whisker over his co coat collar that completely hid his cheeks and face. "'Very well, sir,' she said. "'As you like. In a bit the room will be warmer.' He made no answer, and had turned his face away from her again, and Mrs. Hall, fe feeling that her conversational advances were ill-timed, laid the rest of the table things in a quick staccato and whisked out of the room. When she returned, he was still standing there, like a man of stone, his back hunched, his collar turned up, his, dri his, dripping hat brim tu his dripping hat brim turned down, hiding his face and ears completely. She put down the eggs and bacon with considerable, considerable emphasis, and called rather than said to him, "'Your lunch is served, sir.' "'Thank you,' he said at the same time, and did not stir until she was closing the door. And then he swung round and approached the table with a certain eager quickness. As she went behind the bar to the kitchen, she heard a sound repeated at regular intervals. Chirk, 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 it went, the sound of a spoon being rapidly whisked around a basin. That sounds like chirk, 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 apparently. That girl, she said. There, I clean forgot it. It's her being so long. And while she herself finished mixing the mustard, she gave Millie a few verbal stabs for her excessive slowness. She had cooked the ham and eggs, laid the table, and done everything, while Millie, help indeed, had only succeeded in delaying the mustard, and him a new guest and wanting to stay. And then she filled the mustard pot, and putting it putting it with a certain stateliness upon a gold and black tea tray, carried it into the parlour. She rapped and entered promptly. As she did so, her visitor moved quickly, so that she got but a glimpse of a white object disappearing behind the table. It would seem he was picking something from the floor. She wrapped down the mustard pot on, on the table, and then she noticed the overcoat and hat had been taken off, and put it over a chair in front of the fire, and a pair of wet boots threatened rust to her steel fender. These thi the, uh, she went to these things resolutely. I suppose I may have them to dry now, she said in, that, in a voice that brooked no denial. Leave the hat, said her visitor in a muffled voice. Turning, she saw he had raised his head and was sitting and looking at her. For a moment she stood gaping at him, too surprised to speak. He held a white cloth. It was a serviette he had brought with him over the lower part of his face, so that his mouth and jaws were completely hidden, and that, and that was the reason of his muffled voice. But it was, not that, it was not that which startled Mrs. Hall. It was the fact that all of his forehead above his blue glasses was covered by a white bandage, and that another covered his ears. 
leaving not a scrap of his face exposed, excepting only his pink peaked nose. It was a bright pink and shiny just as it had been at first. He wore a dark brown velvet jacket with a high black linen, linen lined collar turned up against his neck. The thick black hair, escaping as it could below and between the cross bandages, projected in curious tails and horns, giving him the strangest appearance conceivable. This muffled and bandaged head was so unlike what she had anticipated, for that for a moment she was rigid. He did not remove the serviette, but remained holding it, as she saw now, with a brown gloved hand, and regarding her with his inscrutable blue glasses. Leave the hat, he said, speaking very distinctly through the white cloth. Her nerves began to recover from the shock they had received. She placed the hat on the chair by, again by the fire. I didn't know, sir, she began, that... And she stopped, embarrassed. Thank you, he said dryly, dryly, uh, glancing at her, glancing from the door to her and then at her again. I'll have them nicely dried, sir, at once, she said, and carried his clothes out of the room. She glanced at his white swathed head and blue goggles again as she was going out the door, but his napkin was still in front of his face. She shivered a little as she closed the door behind her, and her face was eloquent of her surprise and perplexity. I never, she whispered. There, she went softly to the kitchen, and was too preoccupied to ask Millie what she was messing about with now, when she got there. The visitor sat and listened to her retreating feet. She glanced in, uh, He glanced inquiringly at the window before he removed his serviette and resumed his meal. He took a mouthful, glanced suspiciously at the window, took another mouthful, and then rose, and taking the serviette in his hand, walked across the room and pulled the blind down to the top of the white muslin that ob obscured the lower panes. This left the room in a twilight. This done, he returned with an easier air to the table and his meal. The poor soul's had an accident or an operation or something, said Mrs. Hall. What a turn them bandages did give me, to be sure. Oh, Dreaded's in the chat. Hey, Dreaded. Why are you awake, man? You were awake, like, five hours ago. She put on some more coal, unfolded the clothes horse, and extended the traveller's coat upon this. And they goggles? Why, it looked more like a diving helmet than a human man. She hung his muffler on the corner of the horse. And holding that handkerchief to his mouth all the time, talking through it. Perhaps his mouth was hurt too, maybe. She turned round as one who suddenly remembers. Oh, bless my soul alive, she said, going off on a tangent. Ain't you done them taters yet, Millie? When Mrs. Hall went to, w went to clear away the stranger's lunch, her idea that his mouth must have also been cut or disfigured in the accident she supposed him to have suffered was confirmed, for he was smoking a pipe, and all the time that she was in the room he never loosened the silk muffler he had wrapped around the lower part of his face to put the mouthpiece to his lips. Yet he, it was not forgetfulness, for she saw he glanced as it, it was not forgetfulness, for she saw he glanced at it as it smouldered out. He sat in the corner with his back to the window blind, and spoke now, having eaten and drunk, by be and being comfortably warmed through, with less aggressive brevity than before. The reflection of the fire lent a kind of red animation to his big spectacles, and they had lacked hitherto. "'I have some luggage,' he said, "'at Bramblehurst Station.' And he asked her how he could have, sent could have it sent. He bowed his bandaged head quite politely in acknowledgement of her explanation. "'Tomorrow,' he said. There is no speedier delivery? And seemed quite disappointed when she answered, No. Was she quite sure? No man with a trap who would go over? Mrs. Hall, nothing loath, answered his questions and developed a conversation. It's a steep road by the down, sir, she said in answer to the question about a trap. And then, snatching at an opening, said, It was there a carriage was upsettled a year, a year ago or more. Uh, a gentleman killed beside this coachman. Accidents uh, happen in a moment, don't they? But the visitor was not to be drawn so easily. They do, he said through his muffler, eyeing her quietly through his impenetrable glasses. But they take... Uh, which one is this? Who's talking? I guess it, her. But they take long enough to get well, don't they? There was my sister's son, Tom. Jest cut his arm with a scythe. Tumbled on it in the A-field, and bless me, he were three months tied up, sir. You'd hardly believe it. It's regular giving me a dread of a scythe, sir. I can quite understand that, said the visitor. He was afraid one time that he'd have to have operation, that he was that bad, sir. 
The visitor laughed abruptly, a back of a laugh that he seemed to bite and kill in his mouth. Was he? he said. He was, sir. And no laughing matter to them as he'd as he'd and no laughing matter to them as had the doing for him. As I had, my sister being took up with the little one so much. There was bandages to do, sir, and bandages to undo. So that if I may, may be so bold so as to say it, sir. Will you give me some matches? the visitor quite abruptly. My pipe is out. Mrs. Hall was pulled up so suddenly. It was certainly rude of him after telling him all she'd done. She gasped at him for a moment, and remembered the two sovereigns, and went for the matches. Hang, hey, uh, thanks, he said concisely, as she put them down, and turned turned his shoulder upon her and stared out of the window again. It was altogether too discouraging. Evidently, it was he was a uh, he was sensitive on the topic of operations and bandages. She did not make so bold as to say, however, after all. But his snubbing way had had irritated her, and Millie had a hot time of it that afternoon. The visitor remained in the parlour until four o'clock, without giving the ghost giving the ghost of an excuse for an intrusion. For the most part, he was quite still during that time. It would seem he sat in the growing darkness, smoking in the firelight, perhaps dozing. Once or twice, a curious listener might have heard him at the coals, and for a space of five minutes he was audibly pacing the room. He seemed to be talking to himself, and then the armchair creaked as he sat down. End of chapter one. Chapter two. Mr. Teddy Henfrey's First Impressions At four o'clock, when it was fairly dark, and Mrs. Hall was screwing up her courage to go in and ask her visitor if he would take some tea, Teddy Henfrey, the clock jobber, what's he going to sound like? Teddy, Teddy Henfrey. Teddy Henfrey, the clock jobber, came into the bar. Teddy Henfrey. Henfrey. Henfrey sounds upper class and, and a little bit, a little bit of a... This sort of a face. Mm. Teddy. Hello, I'm Teddy Henfrey. This is it. I found it. My sakes, Mrs. Hall, said he. But this is terrible weather for thin boots. The snow outside was falling faster. Mrs. Hall agreed, and then sh and then noticed he had his bag with him. Now you're here, Mr. Teddy. Nope. Why is she suddenly West Country? She was Yorkshire before. Now you're here, Mr. Teddy, she said. I'd be glad if you'd give the old clock in the parlour a bit of a look. "'Tis going, and it strikes well and hearty, but the hour hand won't do nothing but point at six. And, the le and leading the way, she went across the pallet door and rapped and entered. Her visitor, she saw as she opened the door, was seated in the armchair before the fire, dozing, it would seem, with his bandaged head drooping on one side. The only light in the room was the red glow from the fire, which lit his eyes like averse railway signals, but left his downcast face in darkness, and the scanty vestiges of the day that came in through the open door. Everything was ruddy, shadowy, and indistinct to her, the more so since she had been lighting the bar lamp, and her eyes were dazzled. But for a second it seemed to her that the man she looked at had an enormous wide mouth open. Enormous mouth, wide open, a vast and incredible mouth that swallowed the whole of the lower portion of his face. It was the sensation for a moment, the white bound head, the monstrous goggle eyes, and this huge yawn below it. Then he started, stood up in his chair, and put up his hand. She opened the door wide so that the room was lighter, and she saw him more clearly, with the muffler held up to his face just as she'd seen him hold the serviette before. The shadows, she fancied, had tricked her. Um, would you mind, sir, this, this man are coming to look at the clock, sir? She said, recovering from the momentary shock. Look at the clock, he said, staring round in a drowsy manner and speaking over his hand and then getting more fully awake. Certainly. Mrs. Hall went away to get a lamp. And he rose and stretched himself, and then came the light, and Mrs. Teddy Hen Mr. Teddy Henfrey, entering, was confronted by this bandaged person. He was, he says, taken aback. Uh, wait, stranger is uh, that guy. Good afternoon, said the stranger, regarding him, as Mr. Henfrey says, with a vivid sense of the dark spectacles, like a lobster. I hope, Mr. S said Mr. Henfrey, that it's no intrusion. "'None whatever,' said the stranger. "'Though I understand,' he said, turning to Mrs. Hall, "'that this room is really to, to be mine for my own private use. "'I thought... Um, I, "'I thought, sir,' said Mrs. Hall, "'that you'd prefer the clock. "'Certainly,' said the stranger. "'Certainly. "'But as a rule, I like to be left alone and undisturbed.'" I've forgotten some close quotation marks there. 
But I'm really glad to have the... Oh, that's why, because he's continuing. But I'm really glad to have the clock seen to, he said, seeing a certain hesitation in Mr. Henfrey's manner. Very glad. Mr. Henfrey had intended to apologise and withdraw, but this anticipation reassured him. The stranger turned round with his back to the fireplace and put his hands behind his back. And presently, he said, when the clock mending is over, I think I should like to have some tea, but not till the clock mending is over. Mrs. Hall was about to leave the room. She made no conversational advances this time, because she did not want to be snubbed in front of Mr. Henfrey. When her visitor asked her if, when her visitor asked her if she had made any arrangements, what's the noise? The noise is from Red Gargoyle. Thank you, Red Gargoyle, for the five dollar donation. Very generous of you. Um, her visitor asked her if she had made any arrangements about his boxes at Bramblehurst. She told him she had mentioned the matter to the postman, and that the carrier could bring them over on the morrow. "'You are certain this, that's the earliest?' he said. She was certain, with a marked coldness. "'I should explain,' he added, "'what I was really too cold and fatigued to do before, that I am an experimental investigator.' "'Indeed, sir,' said Mrs. Hall, much impressed. "'And my baggage contains apparatus and appliances.' "'Oh, very useful things indeed they are, sir,' said Mrs. Hall. And I'm very naturally anxious to get on with my inquiries. Of course, sir. My reason for coming to Ipping, he proceeded with a certain deliberation of manner, was a desire for solitude. I do not wish to be disturbed in my work. In addition, my work, in addition to my work, an accident, I thought as much, said Mrs. Hall to herself, necessitates a certain retirement. My eyes are sometimes so weak and painful that I have to shut myself up in the dark for hours or, or hours together. Lock myself up. Sometimes, now and then, not at present, certainly, at such times the slightest disturbance, the entry of a stranger into the room, is a source of excruciating annoyance to me. It is well these things should be understood. Certainly, sir, said Mrs. Hall, and if I might be so bold as to ask... That, I think, is all, said the stranger, with a, quiet, a quietly irresistible air of finality he could assume at will. Mrs. Hall reserved her question and sympathy for a better occasion. After Mrs. Hall had left her room, he remained standing in front of the fire, glaring, so Mr. Henfrey puts it, at the clock mending. Mr. Henfrey not only took off the hands of the clock and the face, but extracted the works, and he tried to work in as slow and quiet and unassuming a manner as possible. He worked with the lamp close to him, and the green shade threw a brilliantly, brilliant light upon his hands, and upon the frame and the wheels, and left the rest of the room shadowy. When he looked up, coloured patches swam in his eyes. Being constitutionally of a curious nature, he had removed the works, a quite unnecessary proceeding, with the idea of delaying his departure, and perhaps falling into conversation with the stranger. But the stranger stood there, perfectly still and silent. So still, it got on Henry's nerves. He felt alone in the room, and looked up, and there, day, grey and dim, was the bandaged head and huge blue lenses staring fixedly, with the mi mist of green spots drifting in front of them. It was so uncanny to Henry that for a minute they remained staring blankly at one another. And then Henfrey looked down again. A very uncomfortable position. One would like to say something. Should he remark that the weather was very cold for the time of year? He looked up as if to take aim with that introductory shot. The weather, he began. Why don't you finish and go? Said the rigid, feather, uh, rigid figure, evidently in a state of painfully suppressed rage. All you've got to do is fix the hour hand on its axle. You're, still, you're simply humbugging. Certainly, sir. One minute more. I overlooked, and Mr. Henfrey finished and went. But he was feeling, he went feeling excessively annoyed. Damn it, said Mr. Henry to himself. Mr. Henfrey to himself, trudging down the village through the thawing snow. A man must do a clock at times, surely. And again, can't a man look at you, ugly? And yet again, seemingly not. If the police was wanting you, you couldn't be more ropped and bandaged. At Gleason's corner he saw Hall who had recently married the stranger's host hostess at the Coach and Horses, and who now drove the Ipping conveyance, when occasional people required it. You s sorry, this is a long sentence, so we haven't prepared for it properly. Start it again. At Gleason's corner, he saw Hall, who had recently married the stranger's hostess at the Coach and Horses, who, drove, who now drove the Ipping conveyance, when occasional people required it, to Sidderbridge Junction, coming towards him on his return from that place. Hall had evidently been stopping a bit at Sidderbridge, to judge by his driving. 
How do, Teddy? He said, passing. Hey, that's definitely a Yorkshire voice. They've written, they've written it, how do, as well. How do? <laughs> you've got a... You've got a run, rum up. You've got a rummen up home. A rummen. What is a rum? A rummen. Um, R U M space U N. You've got a rummen. You've got a rummen up home, said Teddy. Hall very social, sociably pulled up. What's that? He asked. Oh, he's going to explain it. <laughs> a rum-looking customer stopping at the coach and horses, said Teddy. My sakes! And he proceeded to give Hall a vivid description of his grotesque guest. Looks like a bit of a Henry. This is Henry. Looks like a bit of a disguise, don't it? I'd like to see a man's face if I had him stopping in my place," said Henry. "But women are that trustful, where strangers are concerned. He took your rooms, and he ain't even given a name, Hall." "You don't say," said Hall, who was a man of sluggish apprehension. "Yes," said Teddy. "By the week, whatever he is, you can't get rid of him under a, under a week, and he's got a log, lot of luggage coming tomorrow, so he says." Let's hope it won't be stones in boxes, Hall. He told Hall how his aunt at Hastings had been swindled by a stranger with empty portmanteau, although he left Hall vaguely suspicious. Get up, uh, wait, get up, old girl, said Hall. I suppose we'll see about this. And Teddy trudged his way, trudged on his way with his mind considerably relieved. Instead of seeing about it, however, Hall, on his return, was severely rated by his wife at the length of time he'd spent in Sidderbridge and his mild inquiries were answered snappishly and in a manner to, not to the point. But the seed of suspicion Teddy had sown germinated in the wind, germinated in the mind of Mr. Hall in spite of these discouragements. You whim don't know anything. You whim don't know everything, said Mr. Hall, resolved to ascertain more, more about the personality of his guest at the earliest possible opportunity. And after the stranger had gone to bed, which he did about half past nine, Mr. Hall went very aggressively into the parlour, and looked very hard at his wife's furniture, just to show that the stranger wasn't master there, scrutinised closely and a little contemptuously a sheet of mathematical computations the stranger had left. When retiring for the night, he instructed Mrs. Hall to look very closely at the stranger's luggage when it came next day. "'You mind your own business, Hall,' said Mrs. Hall, "'and I'll mind mine.' She was all the more, more inclined to snap at Hall, because the stranger was undoubtedly an unusually, unusually strange sort of stranger and she was by no means assured about him in her own mind. In the middle of the night, she woke up dreaming of huge white heads like turnips that came trailing after her, and the end of interminable necks with very vast black eyes. But being a sensible woman, she subdued her terrors and turned over and went to sleep again. End of chapter two. Chapter three. The Thousand and One Bottles. So it was that on that twenty-ninth day of February, at the beginning of the thaw, this singular person fell out of infinity into Iping village. Next day, his luggage arrived through the slush, and very remarkable luggage it was. There were a couple of trunks indeed, such as, such as a rational man might need, but in addition there was a box of books, big fat books of which some were just in incomprehensible handwriting, and a dozen or more crates, boxes and cases, containing objects packed in, packed in straw, as it seemed to Hall, tugging with a casual, casual curiosity at the straw, glass bottles. The stranger, muffled in hat, coat, gloves and wrapper, came out impatiently to meet Fearenside's cart, while Hall was having a word or so of gossip preparatory to helping bring them in. Out he came, not noticing Fearenside's dog, who was sniffing in a dilettante spirit at Hall's legs. Uh, which, is this Hall speaking? Come along with those bo boxes. Oh no, I think it's the stranger. Come along with those boxes, he said. I've been waiting long enough and he came down the steps towards the tail of the cart as if to lay hands on the smaller crate. No sooner had Fearenside's dog caught sight of him, however, than it began to bristle and growl savagely, and when he rushed down the steps, it gave an undecided hop and then sprang straight at his hand. Whoop! cried Hall, jumping back, for he was no hero with dogs. And Fearenside howled, howled, Lie down! and snatched his whip. They saw the dog's teeth and had slipped the hand, heard a kick, saw the dog execute a flanking jump, and get home on the stranger's leg, and heard the rip of his trousering, and then the fire, finer end of the Fearenside's whip reached his property, and the dog, yelping with dismay, reached, uh, retreated under the wheels of the wagon. <coughs> it was all the business of a swift half-minute. No one spoke, everyone shouted, the stranger glanced swiftly at his torn glove and at his leg, 
made as if the, made as if he would stoop to the latter, and then turned and rushed swiftly up, swiftly up the steps to the inn. They heard him go headlong across the passage and up the carpeted steps, uncarpeted steps to his bedroom. You brute, you! said Fear inside, climbing off the wagon with his whip in his hand, while the dog watched him through the wheel. Come here! said Fear inside. You'd better! Hall had, sto had stood gaping. It was bit, said Hall. I'd better go see to un. And he trotted after the stranger. He met Mrs. Hall in the passage. Carry his dog, he said. Bitten. Dog makes him sound like um, uh, uh, Pikey from um, from Snatch. Carry his dog, he said. He went straight upstairs and the stranger's door being ajar, he pushed it open, was entering without any ceremony, being of a naturally sympathetic turn of mind. The blind was down and the room dim. He caught a glimpse of a most singular thing. What seemed a handless arm waving towards him and a and a face of three huge indeterminate spots on white very like the pale of a, uh, the face of a pale pansy and then he was struck violently in the chest hurled back and the door slammed in his face and locked it was so rapid that it gave him no time to observe a waving of indecipherable shapes a blow and a concussion he stood on the d little dark landing wondering what it might have been that he'd seen a couple of minutes after he rejoined the little group that had formed outside the coach and horses there was fear inside, telling all about it over and over again for the second time. There was there was Mrs. Hall saying the dog didn't have no business to bite her guests. There was Huckster, the general dealer from over the road, interrogative, and Sandy Wodges from the forge, judicial. Besides women and children, all of them saying f fatuities. Wouldn't let and bite me, I knows. Tusn't right to have to have such dargs. What he biting for en then anyway, and so forth. This is really interesting because it's give, it's it's like writing it in a dialect, but it's not it's not come clear to me yet what dialect it should be because he he definitely said "how do" which I always thought was a, a a a an exclusively Yorkshire saying, but the rest of this isn't um, isn't Yorkshire. Like doesn't right to have such dogs. Like dogs is spelt D A R G S. Dogs. 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 So if you're saying dogs. If you're talking about dogs and saying dogs, that's definitely indicating that it might be Irish to me. Wouldn't let him bite me, I knows. It hasn't right to have such dogs. What are you biting for it then? Could be could be Irish. Mr Hall, staring at them from the steps and listening, found it incredible that he had seen anything so remarkable happen upstairs. Besides, his vocabulary Besides his vocabulary was altogether all too limited to express his impressions. You don't know. You don't want no help," he says. He said in an answer to his wife's inquiry. "Would better would better be a taking of his luggage in. He ought to have it cauterized. Oh no, Mister Huckster. Mister Huckster is the general dealer from over the road, right? Let's make him Irish just to be just to be safe. He ought to have it cauterized at once," said Mister Huckster, "especially if it's all inflamed." I'd shoot and that's what I'd do, said a lady in the group. Suddenly the dog began growling again. Come along, cried an angry voice in the doorway, and there stood the muffled stranger with his collar turned up and his hat brim bent down. The sooner you get those things in, the better I'll be pleased. It is stated by an anonymous bystander that his trousers and gloves had been changed. Was you hurt, sir? said Fear inside. I'm rare sorry, the dog... Not... Not a bit, said the stranger. Never broke the skin. Hurry up with those things. And then he swore to himself, so Mr. Hall asserts. Directly, the first crate was, in accordance with his directions, carried into the parlour. The stranger flung himself upon it with extraordinary eagerness and began to unpack it, scattering the straw with an utter disregard of Mrs. Hall's carpet. And from it he began to produce bottles, little fat bottles containing powders, small and slender bottles containing coloured and white fluids, Fluted blue bottles labelled labelled poison, bottles with round bodies and slender necks, large green glass bottles, large white glass bottles, bottles with glass stoppers and frosted labels, bottles with fine corks, bottles with bungs, bottles with wooden caps, bot wine bottles, salad bottle oils, salad oil bottles, putting them in rows on the chiffon chiffonier. That's not a thing I know. C H I double F O double N I E R chiffonier chiffonier. Putting them in rows in the, on the chiffonier, on the mantel, on the table under the window, round the floor, on the bookshelf, everywhere. The chemist's shop in Bramblehurst could not boast half so many. Quite a sight it was. 
Crate after crate yielded bottles, until all six were empty and the table high with straw. The only things that came out of these crates besides the bottles were a number of test tubes and carefully packed balance. And a carefully packed balance. And directly the crates were unpacked, the stranger went to the windows and, and set to work, not troubling in the, least, uh, in the least about the litter of straw, the fire which had gone out, the box of books. And directly the crates were unpacked, the stranger went to the window and set to work, not troubling in the least about the litter of straw, the fire which had gone out, the box of books outside, nor for the trunks and other luggage that had gone upstairs. When Mrs. Hall took his dinner to him, he was already so absorbed in his work, pouring little drops out of the bottles into test tubes, that he did not hear her until she had swept away all the bulk of straw and put the tray on the table, with some little emphasis perhaps, seeing the state that the floor was in. He half turned his head and immediately turned it away again, but she saw he had removed his glasses. They were beside him on the table, and it seemed to her that his eye sockets were extraordinarily hollow. He put on his spectacles again, and he turned and faced her. He was about to complain of the uh, she was about to complain of the straw on the floor when he anticipated her. "I wish you couldn't. I wish you wouldn't come in without knocking," he said with a tone of abnormal ex exasperation that seemed so characteristic of him. I knocked, but seemingly... Perhaps you did, but in my investigations, my really very urgent and necessary investigations, the slightest disturbance, the jar of a door, I must ask you... Certainly, sir. You can turn the lock if you like that, you know, any time. A very good idea, said the stranger. This straw, sir... It's spelt S-T-R-O-R, -R, straw. So they've obviously got um, a rounded accent, a rounded R. This straw, sir... So it makes me think West Country, that. This straw, sir. Norfolk can't be West Country. Maybe she should have been West Country the whole time. Sod it. She's going to be West Country now. Inconsistencies to boot. All right. This straw, sir, if I may be so bold as to remark. Don't. If the straw makes trouble, put it down in the bill. And he mumbled at her words suspiciously like curses. He was so odd, standing there, so aggressive and explosive, bottle in one hand and test tube in the other, that Mrs. Hall was quite alarmed. But she was resolute. She was a resolute woman. In which case, I should like to know, sir, what you consider a shilling. Put down a shilling. Surely a shilling's enough. So be it, sir, said Mrs. Hall, taking up the tablecloth and beginning to spread it over the table. If you're satisfied, of course. He turned and sat down with his, collar coat, his coat collar towards her. All the afternoon he worked with the door locked and Mrs. Hall th and, and as Mrs. Hall testifies, for the most part in silence. Wait. Oh man, I'm in trouble reading these sometimes with all these different sort of sub-clauses in the middle of the sentence. Af all the afternoon he worked with the door locked and, as Mrs. Hall testifies, for the most part in silence. But once there was a concussion and a sound of bottles ringing together as though the table had been hit and the smash of a bottle flung violently down and then the rapid pacing athwart and athwart the room. Athwart? That's not a word I know. A-T-H-W-A-R-T. What's that one mean? Athwart. A rapid pacing athwart the room. Presumably like about or around or something like that from context. A smash of a bottle flung violently down and the rapid pacing athwart the room. Fearing something was the matter, she went to the door and listened, not caring to knock. I can't go on, he was raving. I can't go on! Three hundred thousand! Four hundred thousand! A huge multitude! Cheated! All my life it may take me! Patience! Patience indeed! A fool! A fool! There was a noise on, of, of hobnails on the bricks in the bar, and Mrs. Hall had very reluctantly to leave the rest of his soliloquy. When she returned, the room was silent again, save for the faint crepitation of his chair and the occasional clink of a bottle. It was all over. The stranger had resumed work. So many bottles. Chiffonier is a sideboard. A chiffonier. Thank you. A chiffonier. With a sideboard with bookcase on top of it. A chiffonier. I wonder if that's a word. Oh, do we still use that today? A chiffonier? A type of furniture that we still have around? Oh! I'm unbreakable me. Can't break me, Nicole. Thank you for the... Thank you for the uh, the unbreakable bits. I'm now I'm now your text alert. In what sense? Which 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 noise? Athwart is from side to side or across. Cool 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 cool. Athwart. 
when you so you're pacing you always pace pace athwart then because pacing kind of means back and forth doesn't it across a room athwart would it be right to say that you if you're swimming in a pool uh, and you're going like you if you're swimming widths in a pool would you be swimming athwart crepitation what is crepitation it sounds like trepidation but it's not right in context when she returned to the room the room was silent save for the faint crepitation of his chair so presumably like creaking crepitation is creaking perhaps so pace so you can pacing circles i suppose but pacing athwart means pacing back and forth that's cool athwart I'll try and remember that one When she took in his tea, she saw broken glass in the corner of the room under the concave mirror, and a golden stain that had been carelessly wiped. She called attention to it. Put it down in my bill, snapped her visitor. For God's sake, don't worry me. If there's damage done, put it down in the bill. And he went on taking a list in the exercise book before him. I'll tell you something, said Fear inside mysteriously. It was late in the afternoon, and they were in the little beer shop of Ipping Hanger. Well? Well, said Teddy Henry, this chap you're speaking of, what my dog bit, well, he's black, leastways my leg his legs are. I seed through a tear of his trousers and the tear of his glove. You'd have expected a sort of pinky to show, wouldn't you? Well, there was none, nothing, just blackness. I tell you, he's as black as my hat. My six, said Henry, it's a rummy case altogether. Why, his nose is as pink as paint. Well, that's true, said Fear inside. I know that, and I tell thee what I'm thinking. That man's a piebald, Teddy. Black here and white there in patches, and he's ashamed of it. He's a kind of half-breed, and the colours come off patchy instead of mixing. I've heard of such things before, and it's a common way we horses, as anyone can see. That's the end of chapter 3. Chapter 4. Mr. Cuss interviews the stranger. I have told the circumstances of the stranger's arrival in Ipping with a certain fullness of detail in order that the curious impression he created may be understood by the reader. But excepting two odd incidents, the circumstances of his stay until the extraordinary day of the club festival may be passed over very uh, cursorially. There were a number of skirmishes with Mrs. Hall on matters of domestic discipline, but in every case until late April, when the first signs of penury, penury began. First signs of penury. Here's another one for you, Fancy, or someone else, if Fancy's bored of it. Uh, P-E-N-U-R-Y, penury. There were a number of skirmishes with Mrs. Hall on matters of domestic discipline, but in every case until late April, when the first signs of penury began, he overrode her by an easy ex expedient of an extra payment. Hall did not like him, and whenever he dared, to whenever he dared, he talked of the advisability. Hall did not like him, and whenever he dared, he talked of the advisability of getting rid of him. But he showed his dislike chiefly by concealing it ostentatiously, and avoiding his visitor as much as possible. Wait till the summer, said Mrs. Hall savage, uh, sagely, not savagely. Penury is poor, thank you. The first signs of penury began. Oh, so when he first started to show signs of running out of money. Penury. Penury is extreme poverty, thank you. Extreme poverty, so not just poor, but extremely poor. The first signs of extreme poverty began. Wait till the summer, said Mrs. Hall sagely, when the, when the artists are beginning to come. Then we'll see. He may be a bit overbearing, but Bill's settled punctual is Bill's settled punctual, whatever you'd like to say. The stranger did not go to church, and indeed made no difference between Sunday and the irreligious days, even in costume. He worked, as Mrs. Hall thought, very fitfully. Some days he would come down early and be continuously busy. On others he would rise late, pace his room, fretting audibly for hours together, smoke sleep in the armchair by the fire on others he would rise late pace his room fretting audibly for hours together smoke and sleep in the armchair by the fire communication with the world beyond the village he had none his temper his temper continued very uncertain for the most part his manner was that of a man suffering under almost unendurable provocation and once or twice things were snapped torn crushed or broken in spasmodic gusts of violence he seemed under a chronic irritation of the greatest intensity. 
His habits of talking to himself in a low voice grew steadily upon him, but though Mrs. Hall listened conscientiously, she could neither make head nor tail of what she heard. He rarely went abroad, abroad in daylight, but at twilight he would go out muffled up invisibly. Whether the weather were cold or not, and he chose the loneliest paths, and those most overshadowed by trees and banks. His goggling spectacles and ghastly bandaged face under the penthouse of his hat came with a disagreeable suddenness out of the darkness upon one or two home-going labourers, and Teddy Henfrey, tumbling out of the scarlet coat one night at half-past nine, was scared shamefully by the stranger's skull-like head. He was walking hat in hand. Lit, lit by the sudden light of the opening in, uh, the opened inn door. Such children as saw him at nightfall dreamt of bogies, and it seemed doubtful whether he disliked boys more than they disliked him, or the reverse. But there was a certain vivid enough dislike on either side. It was inevitable that a person of so remarkable an appearance and bearing should form a frequent topic in such a village as Ipping. Opinion was greatly divided about his occupation. Mrs. Hall was sensitive on the point. When questioned, she explained very carefully that he was an experimental investigator going gingerly over the syllables as one who dreads pitfalls. When asked what an experimental investigator was, she would say with a touch of superiority that most educated people knew such things, and that, as would, as would thus explain, that he discovered things. Her visitor had an accident, she said, which temporarily discoloured his face and hands, and being of a sensitive disposition, he was averse to any public notice of the fact. Out of her hearing that there was a view largely entertained, that he was a criminal trying to escape from justice by wrapping himself up so as to con conceal himself altogether from the eye of the police. Out of her hearing, there was a large blah blah blah. Okay. This idea sprang from the brain of Mr. Teddy Henfrey. No crime of any magnitude dating from the middle or end of February was known to have occurred. Elaborated in the imagination of Mr. Gould, the probationary assistant in the National School, this theory took the form that the stranger was an anarchist in disguise, preparing explosives, and as he resolved to undertake such detective operations as his time permitted. These consisted for the most part in looking very hard at the stranger whenever they met, or in asking people who had never seen the stranger leading questions about him, but he detected nothing. Another school of opinion followed Mr. Fearenside, and either, either accepted the piebald view, or some modification of it, as, for instance, Silas Durgan, who, had, who was heard to assert that if he chooses to show himself at first and makes his fortune in no time, and being of a bit of a theologian, uh, compared the stranger to a man with the one, the man with one talent. That's. Oh, I, I read read too much of that. I missed the. Uh, I was like, this doesn't make sense. I, missed, I read too much of it in, in his voice. Silas Durgan, who was heard to assert that if he chooses to show himself at fairs, he'd make a fortune in no time. And being a bit of a the the theologian, how do you pronounce that word? The theologian. Theologian. I never have to read that word, apparently. And being a bit of a theologian, compared the stranger to the man with the one talent. Yet another view explained the entire matter by regarding the stranger as a harmless lunatic. That had had the advantage of accounting for everything straight away. Between these main groups there were wavesters and compromisers. Sussex folk. Ooh, Sussex. We're getting talk of Sussex. So yeah, I think I think we are based in Norfolk here. Because Sussex is pretty close. Relatively speaking. Between these main groups there were waverers and compromisers, Sussex folk who uh, have few superstitions, and it was only after the events of early April that the thought of the supernatural was first whispered in the village. Even then it was only credited among the women folk. <laughs> yeah, only those bloody women. But whatever they thought of him, people in Ip Ipping on the whole dis agreed in disliking him. His irritability, though it might have been comprehensible to an urban brain worker. <laughs> an urban brain worker? <laughs> His irritabil irritability, though it might have been comprehensible to an urban brain worker, was an amazing thing to these quiet Sussex villagers. We're based in Sussex. There we go. We've got a final answer. The frantic gesticulations that they surprised now and then, the headlong pace after night nightfall that swept him up around them in quiet corners, the inhuman bludgeoning of all tentative advances of curiosity, the taste for twilight that's, that led to the closing of doors, the pulling down of blinds, the extinction of candles and lamps. Who could agree with su who could agree with such going ons? 
They drew aside as he passed down the village, and when he'd gone by, young humorists would up with their coat collars and down with their hat brims, and go pacing nervously after him in imitation of his occult bearing. There was a song popular at that time called The Bogeyman. Miss Satchel sang it at the schoolroom concert, in aid of the church lamps, and thereafter, when one or two of the villagers who gathered together went and the stranger appeared, a bar, bar or so of this tune, more or less sharp or flat, was whistled in the midst of them. Also berate Belated, ch belated little children. Belated. That means like, late means to come to come after, like a belated happy birthday. Also, belated little children would call bogeyman after him and make off tremulously, el tremulously elated. Theologian. Theologian. Thank you, Elbert. Theologian. 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 Also, belated children would call bogeyman after him and make off tremulously elated. Cuss, the general practitioner, was devoured by curiosity. The bandages excited his professional interest. The report of the thousand and one bottles aroused his jealous regard. All through April and May he coveted an opportunity of talking to the stranger. And at last, towards Whitsuntide, he could stand it no longer, but hit upon the subscription list for a village nurse as an excuse. He was surprised to find that Mr. Hall did not know his guest's name. He, he gave a name, said Mrs. Hall, an assertion which was quite unfounded. But I didn't rightly hear it. She thought it seemed so silly not to know the man's name. Cuss rapped at the parlour door and entered. There was a fairly audible Im imprecation from within. What should Cuss sound like? Maybe he's got a little bit of a touch of the nasal. Pardon my intrusion, said Cuss, and the door closed and cut Mrs. Hall off from the rest of the conversation. Maybe I won't have to know what he sounds like. She could hear the murmur of voices for the next ten minutes, and then a cry of surprise, a stirring of feet, a chair flung aside, a bark of laughter, quick steps to the door, and Cuz appeared, his face white, his eyes staring over his shoulder. He left the door open behind him, and without looking at her, strode across the hall and went down the steps. She heard his feet hurrying along the road. He carried his hat in his hand. She stood behind the door, looking at the open door of the parlour. And then she heard the stranger laughing quietly, and his footsteps came across the room. She could not see his face where she stood. The parlour door slammed, and the place was silent again. Cuss went straight up the village to Bunting the vicar. Uh, am I mad? Cuss began abruptly as, as he entered the shabby little study. Do I look like an insane person? Uh, what, what happened? said the vicar, putting an ammonite on the loose sheets of his forthcoming sermon. That chap at the inn. Well? Give me something to drink, he said, uh, said Cuss, and he sat down. When his nerves had been steadied by a glass of cheap sherry, the only drink the good vicar had available, he told him of the interview he'd just had. I went in, he gasped, and began to demand a subscription for that nurse fund. He'd stuck his hands in his pockets as I came in, and he, and he sat down lumpily in his chair, and sniffed. <coughs> I told him I'd heard... I told him I'd heard he took an interest in scientific things, and he said yes. He sniffed again. He kept on sniffing all the time, evidently re recently caught an infernal cold. No wonder wrapped up like that. I developed the nurse idea, all the while kept my eyes open. Bottles, chemicals everywhere. Balance and test tubes in stands. A smell of uh, evening primrose. Would he subscribe? He said he'd consider it. I asked him point blank what was he researching, and he said he. Uh, I said was he re researching? He said he was. I said a long research, and he got quite cross. A damnable long research, said he, blowing the cork out, so to speak. Oh, said I, and, and out came the grievance. The man was just on the boil, and my question boiled him over. He had been given a prescription, a most valuable prescription, for what he wouldn't for what he wouldn't say. Was it medical? Damn you! What are you fishing after? And I apologised dignified sniff and a cough and he resumed he'd read it five ingredients he put it down he turned his head a draft of air from window lifted the paper swish rustle he was working in a room with an open fireplace said he saw a flicker and there was the prescription burning and lifting chimney wood rushed towards it just as it whisked up the chimney so just at that point to illustrate his story out came his arm well no hand just an empty sleeve Lord, I thought, that's a deformity. Got a cork arm. 
I suppose, and uh, he's got a cork arm, I suppose, and he's taking it off. And then I thought, no, there's something odd in that. What the devil keeps that sleep, sleeve up and open if there's nothing in it? And there was nothing in it, I tell you. Nothing down it, right to the joint. I could see right down it to the elbow, and there was a glimmer of light shining through a tear of the cloth. Good God, I says. And then he stopped. He stared at me with those black gob goggles of his, and then at his sleeve. Well? That's all. Never said a word. He just glared and put his sleeve back in his pocket quickly. I was saying, said he, that there was a prescription burning, wasn't I? An interrogative cough. How the devil, said I, can you move an empty sleeve like that? Empty sleeve? Yes, said I, an empty sleeve. It's an empty sleeve, is it? You saw it was an empty sleeve? He stood up right away, and I stood up too. He came towards me in three very slow steps, and stood quite close, and sniffed venomously. I didn't flinch, though if I'm though I'm hang, hanged if that bandaged knob of his and that blinkers aren't enough to un unnerve anyone. Coming quietly up to you. You said it was an empty sleeve, he said. And certainly, I said. St uh, uh, staring and saying nothing, a barefaced man, on spectacles, starts scratch. And then very quietly, he pulled his sleeve out of his pocket again and raised his arm towards me as if he would show me it again. He did it very, very slowly. And I looked at it. it seemed an age. Well, said I, clearing my throat, there's nothing in it. I had to say something. I was beginning to feel frightened. I could see right down it. He extended it straight towards me, slowly, slowly, just like that, until the cuff was six inches from my face. Queer thing to see an empty sleeve come at you like that. And then... Well? Something, exactly like a finger and a thumb, it felt, nipped my nose. Bunting began to laugh. There wasn't anything there, said Cuss, his voice running up into a shriek at, at the there. It's all very well for you to laugh, but I tell you, I was so startled. I hit his cuff hard and I turned round and I cut out the room. I left him. Cuss stopped. There was no mistaking the sincerity of his panic. He turned round in a helpless way and took a second glass of the excellent vicar's very inferior sherry. When I hit his cuff, said Cuss, I tell you, it felt exactly like hitting an arm. And there wasn't an arm. There wasn't even the ghost of an arm. Mr. Bunting thought it over. He looked suspiciously at Cuss. It's a most remarkable story, he said. He looked very wise and grave indeed. It's really, said Mr. Bunting with judicial emphasis, a most remarkable story. End of chapter four. Chapter five, the burglary at the vicarage. The facts of the burglary at the vicarage came to us chiefly through the medium of the vicar and his wife. It occurred in the small hours of Whit Monday, the day devoted to nipping to the club festivities. Mrs. Bunting, it seems, woke up suddenly in the stillness that comes before the dawn, with the strong impression that the door of their bedroom had opened and closed. She did not arouse her husband at first. This is going to get creepy, isn't it? She did not arouse her husband at first, but sat up in bed listening. Then she distinctly heard the pad, pad, pad of bare feet coming out of the adjoining dressing room and walking along the passage towards the staircase. As soon as she felt assured of this, she aroused the Reverend Mr. Bunting as quietly as possible. He did not strike a light, but putting on his spectacles, her, putting on his spectacles, her dressing gown and his, ba his bath slippers, he went out onto the landing to listen. He heard quite distinctly a fumbling going on in his study desk downstairs and then a violent sneeze. At that he turned, he returned to his bedroom, armed himself with his most obvious weapon, the poker, and descended the, descended the staircase as noiselessly as possible. Mrs. Bunting came out on the landing. The hour was about four, and the ultimate darkness of the night was past. There was a faint shimmer of light in the hall, but the study doorway yawned impenetrably black. Everything was still except the faint creaking of the stairs under Mr. Bunting's tread and the slight movements in the study. And then something snapped. The drawer was open, and there was a rustle of papers. And then came an Im imprecation, and a match was struck, and the study was flooded with yellow light. Mr. Bunting was now in the hall, and through the crack of the door he could see the desk in the drawer open, and a candle burning on the desk. But the robber he could not see. He stood there in the hall, undecided what to do. And Mrs. Bunting, her face white and intent, crept slowly downstairs after him. One thing kept Mr. Bunting's courage. 
the persuasion that this burglar was a resident in this village. They heard the chink of money and realised the robber had found the housekeeping reserve of gold, two pounds ten in half sovereigns altogether. At that sound, Mr. Bunting was nerved to abrupt action. Gripping the poker firmly, he rushed into the room, closely followed by Mrs. Bunting. Surrender! cried Mr. Bunting fiercely, and then stooped amazed. Apparently the room was perfectly empty. Yet the conviction that they had yet their conviction that they had, that very moment, heard somebody moving in the room, had amounted to a certainty. For half a minute, perhaps, they stood gaping. And then Mrs. Bunting went across the room and looked behind the screen, while Mr. Bunting, with a kindred impulse, peered under the desk. Then Mrs. Bunting turned back the window curtains, and Mr. Bunting looked up the chin chimney and probed it around with the poker. And then Mrs. Bunting scrutinised the wa waste paper basket, and Mr. Bunting opened the lid of the coal scuttle. And then they came to a stop and stood with eyes interrogating each other. I, 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 I could have sworn, said Mr. Bunting. The candle, said Mr. Bunting. Who, who lit the candle? The drawer, said Mrs. Bunting, and the money's gone. And she went hastily to the doorway. Of all the strange occurrences. There was a violent sneeze in the passage. I'm not, not surprised he's walking around naked. Not that we know this, of course, at this stage, because a book entitled The Invisible Man, who could who could have seen what was coming. There was violent sneeze in the passage. They rushed out, and as they did so, the kitchen door slammed. Bring the candle, said Mr. Bunting, and led the way. They both heard a sound of bolts being hastily shot back. As he opened the kitchen door, he saw through the scullery that the back door was just opening, and the faint light of early dawn displayed the dark masses of the garden beyond. He is certain that nothing went out of the door. It opened, stood open for a moment, and then closed with a slam. As it did so, the candle Mrs. Bunting was carrying from the study flickered and flared. It was a minute or it was a minute or more before they entered the kitchen. The place was empty. They refastened the door, the back door, examined the kitchen, pantry, and scullery thoroughly, and at last went down into the cellar. There was not a soul to be found in the house, search as they would. Daylight found the vicar and his wife, a quaintly costumed little couple still marvelling about on their ground floor by the unnecessary light of a guttering candle. That's the end of chapter 5. Chapter 6. The Furniture That Went Mad Now it happened in the early hours of Whit Monday before Millie was hunted out for the day. Mr. Hall and Mrs. Hall both rose and went noiselessly down into the cellar. Their business there was of a private nature and had something to do with the specific gravity of their beer. They had hardly entered the cellar when Mrs. Hall found she had forgotten to bring down a bottle of sarsaparilla from their joint room. And she was the expert, and as she was the expert and principal operator in this affair, Hall very properly went upstairs for it. On the landing, he was surprised to see that the stranger's door was ajar. He went on into his own room and found the bottle as he had been directed. But returning with the bottle, he noticed that the bolts of the front door had been shot back, that the door was in fact simply on the latch and with a flash of inspiration he connected this with the stranger's room upstairs and the suggestions of Mr. Teddy Henfrey. He distinctly remembered holding the candle while Mrs. Hall shot these bolts overnight. At the sight he stopped, gaping, then with the bottle still in his hand he went upstairs again. He rapped at the stranger's door, and there was no answer. He rapped again, and then he pushed the door wide open and entered. Ooh, he's gonna go a-snooping. He's going a-snooping. He's gonna find some things. It was as he expected. The bed, the room also, was empty. And what was stranger, what was stranger even to his heavy intelligence, on the bedroom chair and along the rail of the bed were scattered the garments, and only garments so far as he knew, and the bandages of their guest. His big slouch hat even was cocked jauntily over the bedpost. As Hall stood there, he heard his wife's voice coming out of the depth of the cellar, with that rapid telescoping of the syllables, and interrogative cocking up of the final words to a high note by which the West Sussex villagers want to indicate a brisk impatience. I'm going to have to properly do it now. They've, they've like described it in great detail. Rapid telescoping of the syllables. Oh, jeez, I don't even know what this means. I don't know the West Country di um, uh, vocabulary enough, obviously. <clears throat> West Country. Uh, let's, let's, I, I'm not sure the, uh, the subtle differences between West Sussex and West Country, so I'll, I'll just do West Country for now. George, you got what I want. At that, he turned and hurried down to her. Johnny, he said over the rail of the. Oh, wait, no, he was. Johnny, 
he said over the rail of the cellar steps. Tells the truth what Anfi says. He's not in his room. He ain't. I love that. I love it when people write in an accent. Tells the truth what Anfi says. He's not in his room. He ain't. He ain't. And the front door's uh, uh, and the front door's unbolted. At first, Mrs. Hall did not understand, and as soon as she did, she resolved to see the empty room for herself. Hall, still holding the bottle, went first. If he ain't there, he said, his his clothes are. It's written clothes as clothes. His clothes are. And what's he doing out, out his clothes then? What's he doing out his clothes then? Tis a most curious business. As they came up the cellar steps, they both. As they came up the cellar steps, they both, it was afterwards ascertained, fancied they heard the front door open and shut. But seeing it, seeing it closed and nothing there, neither said a word to the other about it at the time. Mrs. Hall passed her husband in the passage and ran on first upstairs. Someone sneezed on the staircase. <coughs> Hall, following six steps behind, thought he heard this. Thought he heard her sneeze. She, going on first, was under the impression that Hall was sneezing. She flung open the door and, and stood regarding the room. Of all the curious, she said. She heard a sniff close behind her. She heard her sniff close behind her head, as, as it seemed, and turning was surprised to see Hall a dozen feet off on the topmost stair. But in another moment he was beside her. She bent forward and put her hand on the pillow and then under the clothes. Cold, she said. He's been up this hour or more. As she did so, a most extraordinary thing happened. The bedclothes gather gathered themselves together, leapt up suddenly into a sort of peak, and then jumped headlong over the bottom rail. It was exactly as if a hand had clutched them in the centre and flung them aside. Immediately after, the stranger's hat popped off the bedpost, described a whirling flight in the air through the better part of a circle, and then dashed straight at Mrs. Hall's face. Then as swiftly came the sponge from a wash washstand, and then the chair, flinging the stranger's coat and trousers carelessly aside, and laughing dryly in a voice singularly like the stranger's, turned itself up with its four legs at Mrs. Hall, seemed to take aim at her for a moment, and charged at her. She screamed and turned, and then the chair legs came gently but firmly against her back and impelled her and Hall out of the room. The door slammed violently and was locked. The chair and bed seemed to be ex executing a dance of triumph for a moment, and then abruptly everything was still. Mrs. Hall was left almost in a fainting condition, in Mr. Hall's arms. It was with the greatest difficulty that Mr. Hall and Millie, who had been roused by her scream of alarm, succeeded in getting her downstairs, and applying the restoratives customary in such cases. "'Tis spirits,' said Mrs. Hall. "'I know tis spirits!' I read in papers and oven, tables and chairs leaping and dancing. Take a, take a drop more, Jenny, said Hall. Tool steady ye. Lock him out, said Mrs. Hall. Don't let him come in again. I half guessed I might have known, with them goggling eyes and bandaged head and never going to church of a Sunday. And all laid bottles, more than is right for any one to have. He's put the spirits in the furniture, my good old furniture. "'Twas in that very chair my poor dear mother used to sit when I was a little girl. "'To think it should rise up against me now.' "'Just a drop more, Jenny,' said Hall. "'Your nerves is all upset.' "'They sent Millie across the street, through the golden five o'clock sunshine, "'to rouse up Mr. Sandy Wodgers, the blacksmith. "'Mr. Sandy Wodgers, the blacksmith. "'I'm going to have to come up with a name for him, uh, a voice for him now. Mr. Hall's compliments and the furniture upstairs was behaving most extraordinary. Was, was Mr. Would Mr. Hodges come round? He was a knowing man, and Mr. Wodgers was very resourceful. He took quite a grave view of the case. Is this... Yeah, this is him. Um, is this an interesting challenge? So they've all got West Country accents, so I can't differentiate by accent. I've got to differentiate by other means. I think I think he's gonna be a, a little bit more gravelly. He's, um, he had he got punched in the throat uh, one too many times as a child. <clears throat> well, not a child, but a teenager. Mr. Wodgers, he was a bit of um, he was a bit of a, a, a rough and tumbler, I think, Mr. Sandy Wodgers. Uh, so he he got into scraps a lot as a kid, uh, and he and he used to get beat up a bit. Uh, maybe his dad was a bit of a drunk as well, give him a bit of a beat so every so often. Uh, so he's, he's had quite a lot of beatings, and, and as such, he's got some some damage to his voice, and so he's a little bit like this. I think that's that's, that's a backstory I've just come up with for Sandy Watchers. <laughs> I'm damned if that ain't I'm damned if that ain't witchcraft. Was the view of Mr. Sandy Watchers. You want horseshoes for such gentry as he? 
He came round greatly concerned. They wanted him to lead the way upstairs to the room, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry. He preferred to talk in the passage. Over the way, Huxley's apprentice came out and began taking down the shutters of the tobacco window. That was a tobacco window. He was called over to join the discussion. Mr. Huxley naturally vo uh, followed in the course of a few minutes. The Anglo-Saxon genius for parliamentary government asserted itself. There was a great deal of talk and no decisive action. Let's uh, let's have the facts first. Let's, wait, he's going, he's going, uh, he's going Cockney with that. He's still West Country. Let's have the facts first," insisted Mr. Sandy Rogers. "Let's be sure we'd be acting perfectly right in busting that there door open. A door on burst is always open to busting, but you can't unbust a door once you're busting." <laughs> And suddenly, in the most wonderful, uh, suddenly and most wonderfully, the door of the room upstairs opened of its own accord. And as they looked up in amazement, they saw descending the stairs the muffled figure of the stranger, staring more blackly and blankly than ever with those unreasonably large blue eyes of his. He came down stiffly and slowly, staring all the time. He walked across the passage, staring, and then stopped. Oh crap! It's been too long. What did he? What did he sound like? It's been too long. It's been a day. Um, he, he had this sort of, uh, he was, he was down here, I think, and a little bit gravelly. Look there, he said, and their eyes followed the direction of his gloved finger and saw a bottle of sarsaparilla uh, hard by the cellar door. And then he entered the parlour and suddenly, swiftly, viciously slammed the door in their faces. <laughs> so he literally went, look over there, and, and then darted inside. Not a word was spoken until the last echoes of the slam had died away. They stared at one another. Well... If that don't lick everything, said Mr. Wadgers, and left the alternative unsaid. I'd I'd go in and ask him about it, said Wadgers to Mr. Hall. I'd demand an explanation. It took some time to bring the landlady's husband up to that pitch. At last he wrapped open the door and got as far as... Excuse me. Go to the devil, said the stranger in a tremendous voice, and shut that door after you. So that brief interview terminated. <laughs> The brief interview terminated. I liked that. And that's a good way of putting it. End of chapter 6. Chapter 7. The Unveiling of the Stranger The stranger went into the little parlour of the coach and horses, about half past five in the morning, and there he remained until near midday, the blinds down, the doors shut, and none after Hall's repulse venturing near him. All that time he must have fasted. Thrice he rang his bell, and third time furiously and continuously, but no one answered him. Him and his, go to the devil indeed, said Mrs. Hall. Presently came an imperfect rumour of the burglary of the vicarage, and two and two were put together. Hall, assisted by Wadgers, went off to find Mr. Shuckleforth, the magistrate. Shuckleforth, the magistrate, he sounds, he, he sounds posh. He sounds like he's come from elsewhere. He's moved here. Uh, find, had to find Mr. Shuckleforth, the magistrate, and take his advice. No one ventured upstairs. How the stranger occupied himself is unknown. Now and then he would stride violently up and down, and twice came an outburst of curses, a tearing of paper, and a violent smashing of bottles. Here's a question I've just that's just come to me. If that dude, if the if the dude, uh, the protagonist, if you want to call him that, is um, if the protagonist was stealing money from the vicar vicarage, why could they not see floating money? Like he must have stashed it somewhere, surely. But st but if he stashed it somewhere, like they came into the room and and saw nothing. So did he stash it in the room? Did he just not take it any after all? I don't I don't understand what's happened there. The little group of scared but curious people increased wait, the little group of scared but curious people increased. Mrs. H Huxter came over. Some gay young fellows res resplendent in black ready made jackets and peak paper ties, for it was Whit Monday, joined the group with confused interrogations. Young Archie Harker distinguished himself by going up the yard and trying to peep under the window blinds. He could see nothing, but gave reason for supposing that he did. Uh, and others of the Ipping youth presently joined him. It was the finest of, finest of all possible Whit Mondays, and down the village street stood a row of nearly a dozen booths, a shooting gallery, and on the grass by the forge were three yellow and chocolate wagons and some picturesque strangers of both sexes putting up a co coconut, a coconut shy. They spelt it cocoa nut with an A in the middle. The gentlemen wore blue jerseys, the ladies white aprons, and, fash and quite fashionable hats with heavy plumes. 
Wadger of the of the purple fawn, and Mr. Jaggers, the cobbler. Mr. Jaggers is a cobbler. He's a new one. Wadger of the purple fawn and Mr. Jaggers, the cobbler, who also sold old second-hand ordinary bicycles, were stretching the string of Union Jacks and Royal Ensigns, which had originally celebrated the first Victorian Jubilee, across the road. And inside, in the artificial darkness of the parlour, into which only one thin jet of sunlight penetrated, the stranger, hungry we must suppose, and fearful, hidden in his uncomfortable hot wrappings, poured through his darkness, poured through his dark glasses upon his paper, or chinked his dirty little bottles, and occasionally swore savagely at the boys, audible if invisible, outside the windows. In the corner by the fireplace lay the fragments of half a dozen smashed bottles, and a pungent twang of chlorine tainted the air. So much we know from what was heard at the time, and what was sub subsequently seen in the room. About noon he suddenly opened his pallid door, and stood glaring fixedly at the three or four people in the bar. "'Mrs. Hall!' he said. Somebody went sheepishly and called for Mrs. Hall. Mrs. Hall appeared after an interval, a little short of breath, but all the fiercer for that. Hall was still out. She had deliberated over this scene, and she came holding a little tray with an unsettled bill upon it. "'Is it your... is it your bill you're wanting, sir?' she said. "'Why wasn't my breakfast laid? Why haven't you prepared my meals and answered my bell? Do you think I live without eating?' "'Well, why isn't my bill paid?' said Mrs. Hall. "'That's what I want to know.' "'I told you three, a day, three days ago I was awaiting a remittance.' "'I told you two days ago I wasn't going to wait, await no remittances. "'You can't grumble if your breakfast waits a bit "'if my bill's been waiting these five days, can you?' "'The stranger swore briefly but vividly. "'No, nah, no,' nah, from the bar. "'And I'd thank you kindly, sir, "'if you'd keep your swearing to yourself, sir,' said Mrs. Hall. "'The stranger stood looking more like an angry diving helmet than ever. "'It was universally felt in the bar that Mrs. Hall had the better of him. "'His next words showed as much. "'Look here, my good woman,' he began. "'Don't good woman me,' said Mrs. Hall. "'I've told you my remittance hasn't come. "'Remittance indeed,' said Mrs. Hall. "'Still, I dare say, in my pocket. "'You told me three days ago you hadn't anything but a sovereign's worth of silver on you.' "'Well, I've found some more.' <laughs> "'Hello,' from the bar. "'I wonder where you found it,' said Mrs. Hall. "'That seemed to annoy the stranger very much. "'He stamped his foot. "'What do you mean?' he said. "'That I wonder where you found it,' said Mrs. Hall. "'And before I take any bills or get any breakfasts or do any such things whatsoever, "'you've got to tell me one or two one or two things I don't understand, "'and what nobody don't understand, and what everybody is very anxious to understand. "'I want to know what you've been doing to my chair upstairs, "'and I want to know how tis your room was empty and how you got in again. "'Them as stops in this house comes by the doors. "'That's the rule of the house, and that you didn't do.' And what I want to know is how you did come in, and how I want to know. Suddenly the stranger raised his glove hands, clenched, stamped his foot, and said, Stop! with such extraordinary violence that he silenced her instantly. You don't understand, he said, who I am or what I am. I'll show you. By heaven, I'll show you. And then he put, he put his open palm over his face and withdrew it. The centre of his face became a black cavity. Here, he said. He stepped forward and handed Mrs. Hall something, which she, staring at his metamorpho metamorphosed face, accepted automatically. Then when she saw what it was, she screamed loudly, dropped it, and staggered back. The nose! It was the stranger's nose, pink and shining, rolled on the floor. And then he removed his spectacles, and everyone in the bar gasped. He took off his hat, with a violent gesture tore at his whiskers and bandages. For a moment they resisted him. A flush of horrible anticipation passed, passed through the air. Oh, my God, said someone, and then off they came. It was worse than anything. Mrs. Hall, standing open-mouthed and horror-struck, shrieked at what she saw, and made for the door of the house. Everyone began to move. They were prepared for scars, disfigurements, tangled, ho tangible horrors, but nothing. The bandages and false hair flew across the passage into the, pa into the bar, making a hobbled hoy jump to avoid them. Everyone tumbled on, uh, everyone else down the steps. Everyone, everyone tumbled on everyone else down the steps. For the man who stood there shouting some incoherent explanation was a solid gesticulating figure up to the co collar of him, and then nothingness, no visible thing at all. People down the village heard shouts and shrieks, and looking up the street saw coach and horses violently firing out its humanity. They saw Mrs. Mrs. Hall fall down and Mr. Teddy Henfrey jump to avoid tumbling over her. 
and then they heard the frightful screams of Millie, who, emerging suddenly from the kitchen behind the noise of the tumult, had come across the headless, headless stranger from behind. These increased suddenly. Forthwith, everyone all down the street, the sweet stuff seller, coconut shy proprietor, and his assistant, the swing man, little boys and girls, rustic dandies, smart wenches, smocked elders and aproned gypsies, began running down towards the inn, and in a miraculously short space of time, a crowd of perhaps forty people, and, in rapidly uh, and rapidly increasing, swayed and hooted and inquired and exclaimed and suggested in front of Mrs. Hall's establishment. Everyone seemed eager to talk at once, and the result was babble. A small group supported Mrs. Hall, who was picked up in a state of collapse. There was a conference, and the incredible evidence was a v vociferous eyewitness. Oh, bogey! What's he been doing then? Ain't hurt the girl, has he? Run her in with a knife, I believe. No, Ed, I tell thee. Uh, I don't mean no manner of speaking. I mean man without a head. Nonsense! Tis some conjuring stick. Fetched off his wrapping, he did. And it struggles to see in through an open door. The crowd formed itself into a straggling wedge with the more adv adventurous apex nearest the, the inn. He stood for a moment. I heard the gal scream, and then he turned. I saw her skirts whisk, and he went after her. It didn't take ten seconds. Back he comes with a knife in his hand and a loaf, just as if he were staring. Not a moment ago. Went in that there door, I tell thee. He ain't got no head at all. <laughs> that must have been delightful to listen to. He ain't got no head at all. You missed him. There was a disturbance behind, and the speaker stopped to set it, step aside for a little procession that was marching very resolutely towards the house. First Mr. Hall, very red and determined, and then Mr. Bobby Jaffers, the village constable, and the wary Mr. Wadgers. They had come now armed with a warrant. People shouted conflicting information of the recent circumstances. Ed or no Ed, said Jaffers, I got to Reston, I, and, re and Reston I will. Mr. Jaffers, uh, Mr. Hall marched up the steps, marched straight towards the door of the parlour, and flung it open. Constable, he said, do your duty. Jaffers marched in, Hall next, and Wadgers last. They saw in the dim light the headless figure facing them, with, gnaw with gnawed crust of bread in one gloved hand, and a chunk of cheese in the other. That's him, said Hall. What's the devil's this? came a tone of angry expostulation from above the collar of the figure. You're a damn rum customer, mister, said Mr. Jaffers. But Ed or no Ed, the warrant says body, and the duty's duty. <laughs> Keep off, said the figure, starting back. Abruptly he whipped down the bread and cheese, and Mr. Hall just grasped the knife on the table in time to save it. Off came the stranger's left glove and was slapped in Jaffers' face. In another moment, uh, in another moment, Jaffers, Jaffers cutting some... Sh let me try this again. Off came the stranger's left glove and was slapped in Jaffer's face. In another moment, Jaffer's, cutting short some statement concerning a warrant, had gripped him by the handless wrist and caught his invisible throat. He got a sound kick on the shin that made him shout, but he kept his grip. Hall sent the knife sliding, to, sliding along the table to Wadgers, who acted as goalkeeper for offensive, so to speak, and then stepped forward as Jaffer's and the stranger swayed and staggered towards him, clutching and hitting in. A chair stood in the way and went, went aside with a crash as they came down together. Get the fleet! said Jaffers between his teeth. Mr. Hall, endeavouring to act on instructions, receiving a sound kick in the ribs that disposed of him for a moment, and Mr. Wadgers, seeing the decapitated stranger, had rolled over and got, on the, got the upper side of Jaffers, retreated towards the door, knife in hand, and so collided with Mr. Huckster and the Siderbridge Carter, coming, in, coming to the rescue of law and order. At the same moment, down came three or four bottles from the chiffonier, and shot a web of pungency into the air of the room. I'll surrender, cried the stranger, though he had Jaffers down, and in another moment he stood up panting. A strange figure, headless and handless, for he had pulled off his right glove now as well as his left. It's, it's, it's no good, he said, as if sobbing for breath. It was the strangest thing in the world to hear that voice coming out as if, an, as if out of empty space, but the Sussex peasants are perhaps the most matter-of-fact people under the sun. Jaffers got up also and produced a pair of handcuffs, and then he sta stared. Oi, say, said Jaffers, brought up short by a dim realisation of the incongru incongruity of the whole business. Darn it, can't use them as I can see. The stranger ran his arm down his waistcoat, and as if by miracle the buttons to which his empty sleeve pointed became undone. The buttons to which his empty sleeve pointed became undone. 
and then he said something about his shin, and stooped down. He seemed to be fumbling with his shoes and socks. Why? said Huxter suddenly. That's not a man at all, it's just empty clothes. Look, you can see down his collar into the lining of his clothes. I could put my arm... He extended his hand. It seemed to meet something in midair, and he drew it back with a sharp exclamation. I wish you'd keep your finger out of my eye, said the aerial voice in a tone of it, savage expostulation. The fact is, I'm all here. Head, hands, legs, and the rest of it. But it happens that I'm invisible. It's a confounded nuisance, but I am. That's no reason why I should be poached to pieces by every stupid bumpkin and nipping, is it? The suit of clothes, now all un unbuttoned and hanging loosely upon its unseen supports, stood up, arms akimbo. Several other, several other of the men folks had now entered the room, so that it was closely crowded. <laughs> Invisible, eh? said Huxter, ignoring the stranger's abuse. Who ever heard the likes of that? This guy's literally looking at it, and he's still sceptical. It's strange, perhaps, but it's not a crime. Why am I assaulted by a policeman in this fashion? Well, ah, that's a different matter, said Jeffers. Oh, no doubt you are a bit difficult to see in this light, but I got a warrant and it's all correct. What I'm after ain't no invisibility, it's burglary. There's a house been broken into and money took. Well, circumstances certainly point. Stuff and nonsense, said the invisible man. I hope so, sir, but I've got my instructions. Well, said the stranger, I'll come. I'll come, but no handcuffs. It's the regular thing, said Jaffers. No handcuffs, stipulated the stranger. Pardon me, said Jaffers. Abruptly, the figure sat down, and before anyone could realise what was being done, the slippers, socks and trousers had been kicked off under the table, and then he sprang up again and flung off his coat. Here! S stop that! said Jaffers, suddenly realising what was happening. He gripped at the waistcoat, it struggled, and the shirt slipped out of it and left it limp and empty in his hand. Hold him! said Jaffers loudly. Once he gets the things off! Hold him! cried everyone, and there was a rush at the fluttering white shirt which was which was now all that, the, that was visible to the stranger. The shirt sleeve planted a shrewd blow in Hall's face that stopped his open-armed advance and sent him backwards into Old Toothsome, the sexton. <laughs> There's another character, Old Toothsome. And in another moment, the garment was lifted up and became convulsed and vacantly flapping about his arms, even as a shirt that is being thrust over a man's head. Jaffers clutched at it and only helped to pull it off. He was struck in the mouth out of the air and in incontinently threw his truncheon and smote Jedi Te Teddy Henry savagely upon the crown of his head. Look out, said everybody, everybody fence fencing at random things and hitting nothing. Hold him! Shut the door! Don't let him get loose! I got something! Here he is! A perfect babble of noises they made. Everybody, it seemed, was being hit all at once, and Sandy Wadgers, knowing as ever as his wits sharpened by a frightful blow to the nose, reopened the door and le led the rout. The others, following incontinently, were jammed for a moment in the corner by the doorway, and hitting continued. Phipps, the Unitarian, had a fruit front tooth broken, and Henfrey was injured in the cartilage of his ear. Jaffers was struck under the jaw, and turning, caught at something that intervened between him and Huckster in the melee, and prevented their coming together. He felt a muscular chest, and in another moment the whole mass of struggling, excited men shot out into the crowded hall. I got him! shouted Jaffers, choking and reeling through them all, and wrestling with purple face and swelling veins against his unseen enemy. Men staggered right and left at the extraordinary conflict, swayed swiftly towards the house door, and went spinning down the half-dozen steps of the inn. Jaffers cried in a strangled voice, holding tight nevertheless, and making play with his knee. He spun around and fell heavily undermost with his head on the gravel. Only then did his fingers relax. There were excited cries of, Hold him! Invisible! and so forth. Just just somebody shouting, Invisible! <laughs> thanks. Thanks, everybody just stops and just goes, Thanks, Gary. You're really helping. You're a real, real assistant to the uh, to the whole endeavour. Um, <laughs> and a young fellow, a stranger in the place, whose name did not come to light, rushed in at once. He caught something, he missed his hole, he missed his hold, and... <laughs> that meant something different. Missed his hold, uh, and fell over the, the constable's prostrate body. Halfway across the road, a woman screamed as something pushed by her. A dog kicked, apparently, yar, yar, ar, ar, yelped and ran howling into Huxter's yard, and with that the transit of the invisible man was accomplished. For a space, people stood amazed and gesticulating, and then came panic, and scattered them abroad through the village as a gust scatters dead leaves. But Jaffers lay quite, quite still, face upward and knees bent, at the foot of the steps of the inn. I wonder if he's killed Jaffers. Because he cracked his head on the gravel, didn't he?
and fell heavily undermost with his head on the gravel. Then his fingers relaxed. I wonder if Jaffers is unconscious or dead. Just turned into a murder. Ooh, that's the end of chapter seven. That's the end of uh, Robert Reed's for today. Chapter eight, in transit. The eighth chapter is exceedingly brief and relates to that Gibbons, the amateur naturalist of the district, while lying out on the spacious open downs without a soul within a couple of miles of him, as he thought, and almost dozing, heard close to him the sound of a man coughing, sneezing, and then swearing savagely to himself. And looking, beheld nothing. Yet the voice was indisputable. It continued to swear that the breadth and variety that indistinguishes the swearing of a cultivated man. It grew to a climax, diminished again, and then died away in the distance, going as going as it seemed to him in the direction of Adderdean. It lifted to a spasmodic sneeze and ended. Gibbons had heard nothing of the morning's occurrences, but the phenomenon was so striking and disturbing that his philosoph philosophical tranquillity vanished. He got up hastily and hurried down the steepness of the hill towards the village as fast as he could go. And that is literally the end of chapter 8. Chapter 9. Mr. Thomas Marvel. You must picture Mr. Thomas Marvel as a person of copious, flexible visage, a nose of cylindrical protrusion, a licorice ample, fluctuating mouth, and a beard of bristling eccentricity. His figure inclined to Emben Point. What is Emben Point? E M B O N P O I N T. All one word. His figure inclined to Emben Point. His short limbs accentuated this inclination. He wore a furry silk hat and the frequent substitution of twine and shoelaces for buttons, apparent at critical points of his costume, marked a man essentially bachelor. Uh, Emben Point is the plump or fleshy part of a person's body, in particular a woman's bosom. His figure inclined to Emben Point, so he had like this, uh, an upward sort of triangle kind of figure. His short limbs accentuated this inclination. Cool. Mr. Thomas Marvel was singing with his... Singing. It's on my brain now. Mr. Thomas Marvel was sitting with his feet in a ditch by the roadside over the down towards Adderdean, about a mile and a half out of Ipping. His feet, save for socks of irregular openwork, were bare. His big toes were broad and prickled like the ears of a watchful dog. In a leisurely manner, he did everything in a leisurely manner. He was contemplating trying on a pair of boots. They were the soundest boots he had ever come across for a long time. Oh, I put in ever. They were the soundest boots he had come across for a long time, too large for him. Whereas the ones he had were, in dry weather, very, a very comfortable fit, but too thin-soled for damp. Mr. Thomas Marvel hated roomy shoes. But then he hated damp. He had never thought out which he hated most. And it was a pleasant day, and there was nothing better to do. So he put the four shoes in a graceful group on the turf and looked at them. And seeing them there among the grass and springing agrimony, it suddenly occurred to him that both pairs were exceedingly ugly to see. He was not at all startled by a voice behind him. They're boots anyhow, said the voice. What should Mr. Thomas Marvel sound like? Everybody from around here has kind of, um, kind of been West Country-esque. Copious, flexible visage, a, no a nose of cylindrical protrusion. Cylindrical protrusion. A an ample, fluctuating mouth. So he's got a big, wide mouth. And a beard of bristling eccentricity. A great, big, bushy beard. And his figure's inclined to Ebon Point. I feel like he's got a bold sort of... Uh, what's the name of the guy? A sort of... Mm, shit, why am I forgetting his name? Brian, Bri Brian Blessed. I feel like he's got a Brian Blessed sort of a voice. They are charity boots, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, with his head on one side regarding them distastefully. And which is the ugliest pair in the whole blessed universe, I'm damned if I know. Hmm, said the voice. I've worn worse. In fact, I've worn none. Is this the... Yeah, it is still him. I've worn worse. I've, in fact, I've worn none. But none so audaciously ugly, if you'll allow the expression. I've been cadging boots, in particular, for days. Because I was sick of them. They're sound enough, of course. But a gentleman on tramp sees such a thundering lot of his boots. And if you'll believe me, I've raised nothing in the whole blessed country, try as I would, but them. Look at them. And a good country for boots, too in a general way, but it's just my promiscuous luck. 
I've got my boots in this country ten years or more. Ooh, an anonymous gifter. And they'll treat you like this. It's a beast of a country, said the voice. And pigs for people. Wait, nope, that was the voice. Um, it's a beast of a country, and pigs for people. Ain't it, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. Lord, but them boots, it beats it. He turned his head over his shoulder to the right to look at the boots of his inter inter interlocutor. Uh, that's a nice word, interlocutor. Hmm, I like that. His interlocutor. It would. It's a very specific uh, word, though. It wouldn't come up very often. He turned his head over his shoulder to the right to look at the boots of his interlocutor with a view to, a view to comparisons. And lo, where the boots of, boots of his interlocutor should have been were neither legs nor boots. He was irradiated by the dawn of a great amazement. Oh, where are you? said Mr. Thomas Marvel over his shoulder and coming on all fours. He saw a stretch of empty downs with the wind swaying with swaying the remote green po green pointed furze bushes. Am I drunk? said Mr. Marvel. Have I had visions? Was I talking to myself? What is... Don't be alarmed, said the voice. Oh, no, none of your ventriloquizing me, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rising sharply to his feet. Where are you? Alarmed indeed. Don't be alarmed, repeated the voice. You'll be alarmed in a minute, you silly fool, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. Where are ye? Let me get my mark on you. Are you buried? said Mr. Thomas Marvel after an in interval. I like that it's his full name every single time. Mr. Thomas Marvel, every time. Not Thomas. There was no answer. Mr. Thomas Marvel stood bootless and amazed, his jacket nearly thrown off. Peewit, said a peewit, very remote. I assume from that a peewit is a type of bird. Peewit. Peewit indeed, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. This ain't no time for foolery. This... The down was desolate, east... Nope, this isn't a quote. This is just... God damn, I'm not doing very well with this. Peewit indeed, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. This ain't no time for foolery. The down was desolate, east and west, north and south. The road, with its shallow ditches and white bordering stakes, ran smoothly and empty, north and south. And save for that peewit, the blue sky was empty too. So help me, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, shuffling his coat on his shoulders again. It's the drink. I might have known. It's not the drink, said the voice. You keep your nerves steady. No, oh, said Mr. Marvel. Ooh, let's drop the Thomas now. Said Mr. Marvel, and his face grew white amidst its patches. It's the drink, his lips repeated noiselessly. He remained staring about him, rotating slowly backwards. I could have swore I heard a voice, he whispered. Of course you did. It's there again, said Mr. Marvel, closing his eyes and clasping his hand on his brow with a tragic gesture. He was suddenly taken by the collar and shaken violently, and left more dazed than ever. Don't be a fool, said the voice. I'm off my blooming chump, said Mr. Marvel. It's no good. It's fretting about them blasted boots. I'm off my blessed booming, blooming chump. Or it's the spirits. Neither one nor the other, said the voice. Listen. Chump, said Mr. Marvel. One minute said the voice, penetrating, tremulous with self-control. Well, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, Thomas is back, with a strange feeling of having been dug in the chest by a finger. You think I'm just imagination? Just imagination? Oh, what else can you be? said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rubbing the back of his neck. Very well, said the voice in a tone of relief. Then I'm going to throw flints at you till you think differently. But where are ye? The voice made no answer. Whizz! came a flint, apparently out of the air, and missed Mr. Marvel's shoulder by a hair's breadth. Mr. Marvel, turning, saw a flint jerk up into the air, trace a complicated path, hang for a moment, and then fling at his feet with almost invisible rap rapidity. He was too amazed to dodge. Whizz! it came, and ricocheted from a bare toe into the ditch. Mr. Thomas Marvel jumped a foot and howled aloud. And then he started to run, tripped over an unseen obstacle, and came head over heels into a sitting position. Now, said the voice as the third stone curved upwards and hung in the air above at the tramp, am I imagination? Mr. Marvel, by way of a reply, struggled to his feet and was immediately rolled over again. He lay quiet for a moment. If you struggle any more, said the voice, I shall throw flint at your head. 
It's a fair do, said Miss Thomas Marvel, sitting up, taking his wounded toe in hand and fixing his eye on the third missile. I don't understand it. Stones flinging themselves. Stones talking. Put yourselves down. Rot away. I'm done. And the third flint fell. It's very simple, said the voice. I'm an invisible man. Oh, tell us something I don't know, said Mr. Marvel. Thomas has gone again, gasping with pain. Where you've hid, how you do it, I don't know. I'm beat. That's all, said the voice. I'm invisible. That's what I want you to understand. Well, anyone could see that. There is no need for you to be so confounded impatient, mister. Now then, give us a notion. How are you hid? I'm invisible. That's the great point. And what I want you to understand is this. But whereabouts? interrupted Mr. Marvel. Here! Six yards in front of you! Oh, come, I ain't blind. You'll be telling me next you're just thin air. I'm not one of your ignorant tramps. Yes, I am. Thin air. You're looking through me. What? Ain't there any stuff to you? Uh, Vox at... What is it? Vox at Jabba? Uh, is it? I'm just a human being. Solid. Needing food and drink. And needing covering, too. But I'm invisible, you see. Invisible. Simple idea. Invisible. What? Real, like? Yes, real. Well, let's have a hand of you, said Marvel. If you are real, it won't be so damned out of the way, like, then... Lord, he said, how you've made me jump, gripping me like that. He felt the hand that had closed round his wrist, with his disengaged fingers. And his fingers went timorously up the arm. Timorously, that's one I don't understand. T-I-M-O-R, timor, timor. I feel like that is a familiar word of timor. Timorously, T-I-M-O-R-O-U-S-L-Y. His fingers went timorously up the arm, patted a muscular chest, and explored a bearded face. Marvel's face was astonishment. Marvel, he's lost the mister now as well. I'm dashed, he said. If this don't beat cockfighting. Most remarkable. And there I can see a rabbit clean through you, half a mile away. Not a bit of you visible, except... He scrutinised the apparently empty space keenly. You haven't been eating bread and cheese, he asked, holding the invisible arm. You're quite right, and it's not quite assimilated into my system. Oh, there we go. So we're getting some answers. So if he, if he digests something, if he eats it anyway, it doesn't go invisible until it assimilates into his system. That means nervous or scared. Thank you. Nervous or scared. What was the word? Where is it? Timorously. Timorously. To timorously do something is to do it in a nervous or scared manner. Timorous. He was quite timorous. Well, that's pretty cool. So he's got undigested bread and cheese just floating around in his gut. That must not be nice to look at. Ah, said Mr. Marvel. Sort of ghostly, though. Of course, all this isn't half so wonderful as you think. It's quite wonderful enough for my modest wants, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. Mr. Thomas is back. However you manage it. What the... How the deuce is it done? It's too long a story. And besides, I tell you, the whole business fairly beats me, said Mr. Marvel. What I want to say, what I want to say at present is this. I need help. I have come to that. I came upon you suddenly. I was wandering, mad with rage, naked, impotent. I could have murdered. And I saw you. Thank you, Shaquille Oatmeal. <laughs> nice name. Shaquille Oatmeal. Uh, thank you for the follow. We're reading The Invisible Man currently. I came up behind you, hesitated, and went on. Mr. Marvel's expression was eloquent. And then I stopped. Here, I said, is an outcast like myself. This is the man for me. So I turned back and came to you, you, and... Lord, said Mr. Marvel, but I'm all in a tizzy. How, I may ask, how is it? And what you may be requiring in the way of help? Invisible. I want you to help me get clothes and shelter, and then with, and then with other things. I've left them long enough. If you won't, well, well, but you will. You must. Look here," said Mister Marvel. "I'm too flabbergasted. Don't knock me about about any more, and leave me go. I must get steady a bit. And you've pretty near broken my toe. 
It's all so unreasonable. Empty downs, empty sky. Nothing visible for miles except the bosom of nature. And then comes a voice. A voice out of heaven. And stones. And a fist. Lord. Pull yourself together, said the voice. For you have, a jo you have to do the job I've chosen for you. Mr. Marvel blew out his cheeks, and his eyes were round. Like that. I've chosen you, said the voice. You are the only man except some of the fools down there, who knows there is such a thing as an invisible man. You have to be my helper. Help me, and I will do great things for you. An invisible man is a man of power. He stopped for a moment to <coughs> sneeze violently. But if you betray me, he said, if you fail to do as I direct you... He paused and tapped Mr. Marvel's shoulder smartly. Mr. Marvel gave a yelp of terror at the touch. I don't want to betray you, said Mr. Marvel, edging away from the direction of the fingers. Don't you go a-thinking that, whatever you do. All I want to do is help you. Just tell me what I got to do. Oh, Lord. Whatever you want done, that I'm the most willing to do. It's the end of Chapter 9. Chapter 10 Mr. Marvel's Visit to Epping after the first gusty panic had spent itself, Ipping became argumentative. Scepticism suddenly reared its head, rather nervous scepticism, not at all assured of its back, but scepticism nevertheless. It is so much easier not to believe in an invisible man, and those who had actually seen him dissolve into air, or felt the strength of his arm, could, could be counted on the fingers of two hands. And of these witnesses, Mr. Wodgers was presently missing, having retired impregnably behind the bolts and bars of his own house. And Jaffers was lying stunned at the parlour of the coach and horses. Okay, so Jaffers didn't die. Great and strange ideas transcending experience often have less, less effect upon men and women than smaller, more tangible considerations. Ipping was gay with bunting, and everybody was in gala dress. Whit Monday had been looked forward to for a month or more. By the afternoon, even those who believed in the unseen were beginning to resume their little amusements in a tentative fashion. On the supposition that he had gone quite away, with the sceptics he was already a jest. But people, sceptics, and believers alike, were remarkably sociable all that day. I, I, I listed people as a, as a separate thing to sceptics and believers there. It should have said, but people, sceptic and, sceptics and believers alike, were remarkably social. Hay Heyman's meadow was gay with the tent in which Mrs. Bunting and other ladies were preparing tea, while without, the Sunday school children ran races and played games under the noisy guidance of the curate and the Mrs. and the Mrs. Cuss and Sackbutt. No doubt there was a slight uneasiness in the air, but people, for the most part, had the sense to conceal whatever imagination, uh, whatever imaginative qualms they experienced. On the village green, an inclined strong rope. Rope is in. Oh, right. I see what happened. On the village green, an inclined strong rope, down which, clinging the, wa clinging the while to a pulley, swung pulley swung handle. On the village green, an inclined strong rope, down which, clinging the while to a pulley swung handle, one could be hurled violently against a sack at the other end, came in for considerable favour among the adolescents, as also did the swings and the coconut shies. There was also a promenading and the stream organ. Ah, oh, my goodness! There was also a promenading and a steam organ attached to a, a small roundabout filled the air with a pungent flavour of oil, and with equally pungent music. Members of the club who had attended church in the morning were splendid in badges of pink and green, and some of the gayer mind some of the gayer minded had also adorned their bowler hats with brilliant brilliant coloured favours of ribbon. Old Fletcher, whose conceptions of holiday making were severe was visible through the jasmine about his window, or through the open door, whichever way you chose to look at it. Poised delicately on a plank supported on two chairs, and whitewashing the ceiling of his front room. About four o'clock, a stranger entered the village from the direction of the Downs. He was a short, stout person in an extraordinarily shabby top hat, and he appeared to be very much out of breath. His cheeks were alternately limp and tightly puffed. <sighs> His mottled face was apprehensive, and he moved with a sort of reluctant alacrity. He turned the corner of the church and directed his way to the coach and horses. 
Among others, old Fletcher re remember seeing him, and indeed the old gentleman was so struck by his peculiar agitation that he inadvertently allowed a quantity of whitewash to run down the br brush into his sleeve of his coat while regarding him. This stranger, to the perceptions of the proprietor of the coconut shy, appeared to be talking to himself, and Mr. Huxter remarked the same thing. He stopped at the foot of the coach and horses, uh, he stopped at the foot of the coach and horses steps, and according to Mr. Huxter, appeared to undergo a severe internal struggle before he could induce himself to enter the house. Finally, he marched up the steps, and was seen by Mr. Huxter to turn to the left and open the door of the parlour. Mr. Huxter heard voices from within the room, and from the bar apprising, and from the bar apprising the man of his error. That room's. Oh God! What, was, what did Hall sound like? Yeah, he was definitely West Country, wasn't he? That room's private," said "private," said Hall. And the stranger shut the door clumsily and went into the bar. In the course of a few minutes, he reappeared, wiping his lips with the back of his hand in an air of quiet satisfaction that somehow impressed Mister Huxter, as he as he assumed. He stood looking about him for some moments, and then Mr. Huxter saw him walk in an oddly furtive manner towards the gates of the yard, upon which the parlour window opened. The stranger, after some hesitation, leant against one of the gate posts, produced a short clay pipe, and prepared to fill it. His fingers trembled while doing so. He lit it clumsily, and folding his arms, began to smoke in a languid attitude, an attitude which his occasional glances up the yard altogether belied. All this Mr. Huxt saw over the canisters of the tobacco window, and the singularity of the man's behaviour prompted him to maintain his observation. Presently the stranger stood up abruptly and put his pipe in his pocket, and then he vanished into the yard. Forthwith Mr. Huxter, conceived, conceiving he was witnessing some petty larceny, leapt round his counter and ran out into the road to intercept the thief. As he did so, Mr. Marfle reappeared, his hat askew, a big bundle in a blue tablecloth in one hand, and three books tied together as it proved ap afterwards with the vicar's braces in the other. <laughs> the books were tied together with the vicar's braces. <laughs> Directly he saw Huxter and gave a sort of gasp and turning sharply to the left began to run. Stop, thief! cried Huxter and set off after him. Mr. Huxter's sensations were vivid but brief. He saw the man just before him and spurting briskly from the church corner to the hill road. He saw the village flags and festivities beyond, and a face also turned towards him. He bawled, he bawled, stop, again. He had hardly gone ten strides before his shin was caught in some mysterious fashion, and he was no longer running, but flying with inconceivable rap rapidity to the, through the air. <sighs> he saw the ground suddenly close to his face. The world seemed to splash into a million whirling specks of light, and subsequent proceedings interested him no more. That's nice. That's a good way of putting it. He could have just been like, he was running, and then he tripped over something he didn't see and slammed against the ground. But rather, he was no longer running, but flying with inconceivable rapidity through the air. And then he saw the ground suddenly close to his face, and the world seemed to splash into a million whirling specks of light. The world splashed into a million specks of light. Subsequent proceedings interested him no more. It's in a, a good way of saying he was suitably distracted and or knocked unconscious. Subsequent proceedings interested him no more. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11. In the Coach and Horses. Now, in order, in order clearly to understand what has happened in the inn, it is necessary to go back to the moment when Mr. Marvel first came into view of Mr. Huxter's window. At that precise moment, Mr. Cuss and Mr. Bunting were in the parlour. They were seriously investigating the strange occurrences of the morning and were, with Mr. Hall's permission, making a thorough examination of the invisible man's belongings. Jeffers had partially recovered from his fall, and had gone home in the charge of his sympathetic friends. The stranger's scattered garments had been removed by Mrs. Hall and the room tidied up, and on the table under the window where the stranger had been wont to work, Cuss had hit almost at once on three big books in manuscript, labelled Diary. Diary, said Cuss, pointing the three books on the shelf putting the three books on the shelf. Now, at any rate, we shall learn something. The vicar stood with his hands on the table. Diary, repeated Cuss. Oh, Cuss is the vicar. He had he had this sort of thing going on. Diary, repeated Cuss, sitting down, putting two volumes to support the third and opening it. Hmm. No name on the flyleaf. Oh, bother. Cipher. And figures. 
The vicar came round to look over his shoulder. No, it's not because isn't the vicar then. God damn it. I hate when they, when they swap between names and occupations. And it makes it hard to know who it's talking about. Cus turned the pages over with a face, suddenly disappointed. I'm... Dear me, it's all cipher. Bunting. Oh, it's all cipher bunting. There are no diagrams, asked Mr. Bunting. No illustrations throwing light. See for yourself, said Mr. Cuss. Some of it's mathematical, and some of it's Russian or some other such language, to judge by the letters. And some of it's Greek. Now the Greek, I thought you... Of course, said Mr. Bunting, taking out and wiping his spectacles and feeling suddenly very, very uncomfortable, for he had no Greek left in his mind worth talking about. Ah, uh, yes, the Greek, of course, may furnish a clue. I'll find you a place. Uh, I'd rather uh, glance through the volumes first, said Mr. Bunting, still wiping. A general impression first, Cuss, and then, you know, we can go looking for clues. He coughed, put on his glasses, arranged them fastidiously, coughed again, and wished something would happen to avert the seemingly inevitable exposure. And then he took the volume Cuss handed him in a leisurely manner, and then, did some and then something did happen. The door suddenly opened. Both gentlemen started violently, looked round, and were relieved to see a sporadically rosy face beneath a furry silk hat. Uh, this is, I think, the guy who stood. This is Mr. Thomas, what is his face, probably. Tap! asked the face, and stood staring. No, said both gentlemen at once. Over the other side, my man, said Mr. Bunting, and please shut that door, uh, said irritably. All right, said the intruder, as it seemed in a low voice, curiously different from the huskiness of its first inquiry. Right you are, said the intru in intruder in the former voice. Stand clear, and he, and he vanished and closed the door. A sailor, I should judge, said Mr. Bunting. Amusing fellows they are. Stand clear, indeed. A nautical term, referring to his getting back out of the room, I suppose. I dare say so, said Cuss. My nerves are all loose today. It quite made me jump. The door opening like that? Mr. Bunting smiled as if he, as if he had not jumped. <laughs> and now, he said with a sigh, these books. Someone sniffed as he did so. One, one thing is indisputable, said Bunting, drawing up a chair next to that of Cuss. There certainly have been very strange things happen in Apin during the last few days. Very strange. I cannot, of course, believe in this absurd invisibility story. It's incredible, said that said Cuss. Incredible. But the fact remains I that I saw, I certainly saw, right down his sleeve. But did you? Are you sure? Suppose a mirror, for instance. Her hallucinations are so easily produced. I don't know if you ever have really seen a good conjurer. I won't argue again, said Cuss. We've thrashed that out, Bunting. And now just look, there's these books. Ah, and here's what some, some of what I take to be Greek. Greek letters, certainly. He pointed to the middle of the page. Mr. Bunting flushed slightly, uh, slightly and brought his face nearer, apparently finding some difficulty with his glasses. Suddenly he became aware that a strange, uh, of a strange feeling at the nape of his neck. He tried to raise his head and encountered an immovable resistance. The feeling was a curious pressure, the grip of a heavy, firm hand and it bore his chin irresistibly to the table. "'Don't move, little man,' whispered a voice, "'or I'll brain you both.' He looked into the face of Cuss, close to his own, and each saw a horrified reflection of his own sickly astonishment. "'I'm sorry to handle you so roughly,' said the voice, "'but it's unavoidable. "'Since when did you learn to pry into an investigator's private mem memoranda?' said the voice and two chins struck the table simultaneously, and two sets of teeth rattled. Since when did you learn to invade the private rooms of a man in misfortune? The concussion was repeated. Where have they put my clothes? Listen, said the voice. The windows are fastened, and I have taken the key out of the door. I am a fairly strong man, and I have the poker handy. Besides being invisible, there's not the slightest doubt that I could kill you both and get away quite easily if I wanted to, do you understand? Very well. If I let you go, will you promise not to try any nonsense and do what I tell you? The vicar and the doctor looked at one another, and the doctor pulled a face. Uh, yes, 
said Mr. Bunting, and the doctor repeated it. And then the pressure on the necks, necks relax, relaxed, and the doctor and the vicar sat up, both very red in the face and wriggling their heads. Please keep sitting where you are, said the invisible man. Here's the poker, you see. When I came into this room, continued the invisible man, after presenting the poker to the tip of, tip of the nose of each of his visitors, I did not expect to find it occupied, and I expected to find, in addition to my books of memoranda, an outfit of clothing. Where is it? No, don't rise. I can see it's gone. Now just at present, through, though the days are quite warm enough for an invisible man to ru run about stark, the evenings are quite chilly. I want clothing, and other accommodation, and I must also have those three books. That's the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12 is called The Invisible Man Loses His Temper. Loses his temper. It is unavoidable that at this point the narrative should break off again, for a certain very painful reason that will be presently apparent. While these things were going on in the parlour, and while Mr. Huxter was watching Mr. Marvel smoking his pipe against the gate, not a dozen yards away, blah 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 against the gate, not a dozen yard, not a dozen yards away were Mr. Hall and Teddy Henfrey, discussing in a state of cloudy puzzlement the one Ipping topic. There are a lot of names in this story, and I'm having a little bit of a hard time keeping them all straight. Mr. Hall is definitely the guy who owns the inn at which all of this is happening. Teddy Henfrey, I, I'm forgetting who he is. He's definitely been in this story before. He was like a... I can't remember. Uh, Mr. Huckster. Who was Mr. Huckster? I can't remember. But Mr. Marvel is the guy who... Uh, the, the sort of vagabond that um, has been hired, for want of a better word, by the Invisible Man. Suddenly there came a violent thud against the door of the parlour. A sharp cry, and then... Silence. Hello, said Teddy Henfrey. Hello, from the tap. Mr. Hall took things in slowly, but surely. That ain't right, he said, and came round from behind the bar towards the parlour door. He and Teddy approached the door together with intent faces. Their eyes considered. Somewhat wrong, said Hall, and Henfrey nodded agreement. Whiffs of an unpleasant chemical odour met them and there was a muffled sound of conversation, very rapid and subdued. "'You all right there?' said asked, uh, asked Hall, rapping. The muttered conversation ceased abruptly, for a moment silence, and then the conversation was resumed in hissing whispers, and then a sharp cry of, "'No! No, you don't!' Then uh, there came a sudden motion and the oversetting of a chair, a brief struggle, and then silence again. "'What the deuce!' exclaimed Henfrey, sotto voce, sotto voce. I'm not sure what that means. That is sotto voce. That's um, Italian, isn't it? Or Latin, maybe. Sotto. I feel like I should know what the sotto is. A quiet voice. Sotto voce. What the deuce? exclaimed Henfrey. You all right there? asked Mr. Hall again, sharply. The vicar's voice answered with a curious, jerking intonation. Quite r right. P please don't interrupt. Odd, said Mr. Henfrey. Odd, said Mr. Hall. Says don't interrupt, said Henfrey. I heard him, said Hall. And a sniff, said Henfrey. They remained listening. The conversation was rapid and subdued. I can't, said Mr. Bunting, his voice rising. I tell you, sir, I will not. What was that? asked Henfrey. Says he will not, said, said Hall. Weren't speaking to us, was he? Disgraceful, said Mr. Bunting within. Disgraceful, said Mr. Henry. I, I, I heard it distinct. Who's that speaking now? asked Henfrey. Mr. Cuss, I suppose, said Hall. Can you hear anything? Silence. The sounds within indistinct and perplexing. Seems like... Sounds like throwing the tablecloth about, said Hall. Mrs. Hall appeared behind the bar. Hall made gestures of silence and invitation. This aroused Mrs. Hall's wifely, wifely opposition. What you're listening there for, Hall? she asked. Ain't you nothing better to do? Busy day like this? Hall tried to convey everything by grimaces and dumb show. 
but Mrs. Hall was obdurate. There's a word I don't understand. Obdurate. O-B-D-U-R-A-T-E. Obdurate. Mrs. Hall was obdurate. From context, stubborn of some kind. She raises her voice. So Hall and Henry, rather crestfallen, tiptoed back to the bar, gesticulating to explain to her. At first she refused to see anything what they heard at all. Then she insisted on Hall keeping silence, while Henry told her his story. She was inclined to think the whole business nonsense. Perhaps they were just moving the furniture about. I heard him say disgraceful that I did, said Hall. Obdurate means stubborn, stubbornly refusing to change one's opinions of course of action. Thank you. I heard that. Uh, I, he I heard that, Mrs. Hall, said Henry. Like as not, began Mrs. Hall. Shh, said Mr. Teddy Henry. Didn't I hear the window? What window? asked Mrs. Hall. Parlour window, said Henry. Everyone stood listening intently. Mrs. Hall's eyes directly uh, stared directly before her. Mrs. Hall's eyes, directed straight before her, saw without seeing the brilliant oblong of the, th the inn door, the road white and vivid, and Huxter's shop front blistering in the June sun. Abruptly, Hus Huxter's door op uh, opened and Huxter appeared, eyes staring with excitement, arms gesticulating. Yap! he cried. Stop, thief! And he ran obliquely towards the oblong. Uh, he ran obliquely across the oblong towards the yard gates and vanished. Simultaneously came a tumult from the parlour, and a sound of windows being closed. Hall, Henfrey, and the human contents of the tap rushed out at once, pell-mell, into the street. They saw someone whisk round the corner towards the road, and Mr. Huxter executing a complicated leap in the air that ended on his face and shoulder. Down the street, people were standing astonished or running towards them. Mr. Huxter was stunned. Henfrey stopped to discover this, but, but Hall and the two labourers from the tap rushed at once to the corner, shouting incoherent things, and saw Mr. Marvel evanishing by the corner of the church wall. They appeared, they appeared to have jumped to the impossible conclusion that this was the invisible man suddenly become visible, and set off at once along the lane in pursuit. But Hall had hardly run a dozen yards before he gave a loud shout of astonishment, and went flying headlong sideways, clutching one of the labourers and bringing him to the ground. He had been charged just as one charges a man at football. The second labourer came round in a circle, stared, and conceiving that Hall had tum tumbled of his own accord, returned to resume the pursuit, only to be tripped by the ankle just as H Huxter had been. Then, as the first labourer struggled to his feet, he was kicked sideways by a blow that might have felled an ox. Quite a blow. As he went down, the rush from the direction of the village green came round the corner. The first to appear was the proprietor of the coconut shy, a burly man in a blue jersey. He was astonished to see the lane empty, save for three men sprawling absurdly on the ground. And then something happened to his rearmost foot, and he went headlong and rolled sideways just in time to graze the, graze the feet of his brother and partner, following headlong. The two were then kicked, knelt on, fallen over, and cursed by quite a number of over-hasty people. Now when Hall and Henfrey and the labourers ran out of the house, Mrs. Hall, who had been disciplined by years of experience, remained in the bar till the next, uh, next to the till. And suddenly the parlour door was opened, and Mr. Cuss appeared, and without glancing at her, rushed at once down the steps towards her, towards the corner. Hold him! he cried. Don't let him drop that parcel! He knew nothing of the existence of Marvel, for the invisible man had handed over the books and bundle in the yard. The face of Mr. Cuss was angry and resolute, but his costume was defective, a sort of limp white kilt that could have only passed muster in Greece. Hold him, he bawled. He's got my trousers and every stitch of the vicar's clothes. Tend to him in a minute, he cried to Henfrey as he passed the prostra prostrate Huxter. And coming round the corner to join the tumult was promptly knocked off his feet and into an indecorous sprawl. Somebody in full flight trod heavily on his finger. He yelled, struggled to regain his feet and was knocked against, uh, knocked against and thrown on all fours again and became aware that he was involved not only in a capture, but in a rout. Everyone was running back to the village. He rose again and was hit severely behind the ear. He staggered and set off, behind, uh, set off back to the coach and horses forthwith, leaping over the deserted huckster who was now sitting up on his way. Behind him, he was halfway up the inn steps. He heard a sudden yell of rage rising sharply out of the confusion of cries, and a sounding smack in someone's face. He recognised the voice as that of the invisible man and the note was that of a man suddenly infuriated by a painful blow. 
In another moment, Mr. Cuss was back in the parlour. He's coming back, Bunting, he said, rushing in. Save yourself! Mr. Bunting was standing at the window, engaged in an attempt to clothe himself in the hearth rug and a West Surrey Gazette. <laughs> Who's coming? Wait, no, the vicar was down here. Who Who's coming? He said, so startled that his costume narrowly escaped disintegration. Invisible man, said Cuss, and rushed on the window. We'd better clear out from here. He's fighting mad. Mad! In another moment, he was out in the yard. Good heavens! said Mr. Bunting, hesitating between two horrible alternatives. <laughs> he heard a frightful struggle in the passage of the inn, and his decision was made. He clambered out of the window, adjusted his costume hastily, and fled up the village as fast as his fat little legs would carry him. <laughs> Quite the visual. From the moment when the Invisible Man screamed with rage and Mr. Bunting made his memorable flight up to the village, it became impossible to give a, con a consecutive account of affairs in Ipping. Possibly the Invisible Man's original intention was simply to cover Marvel's retreat with the clothes and books, but his temper, at no time very good, seemed to have gone completely at some chance blow, and forthwith he set to smiting and overthrowing for the mere satisfaction of hurting. Ooh, he's going a bit, going a bit uh, sadistic. You must figure the street full of running figures, of doors slamming and fights for hiding places. You must figure the tumult suddenly striking on the unstable equilibrium of old Fletcher's planks and two chairs, with cataclysmic results. You must figure an appalled couple caught dismally in a swing. And then the whole tumultuous rush had passed, and the Ipping Street with its gourds and flags is deserted, save for the, sa the still raging, unseen, and littered with coconuts, overthrown canvas screens, and the scattered stock of trade in a sweetstuff stall. Everywhere there is sound of closing shutters and shoving bolts, and the only visible humanity is an occasional flitting eye under a raised eyebrow in the corner of a window pane. The invisible man amused himself for a little while by breaking all the windows in the coach and horses, and then he thrust a street lamp through a parlour window of Mrs. Gribble. Poor Mrs. Gribble, what did she do? He it must have been he it must have been who, who cut the telegraph wire to Adderdean, just beyond Higgins Cottage on the Adderdean Road. And after that, as his peculiar qualities allowed, he passed out of human perceptions altogether, and he was neither heard, seen, nor felt in Ipping any more. He vanished absolutely. But it was the best part of two hours before any human being ventured out again into the desolation of Ipping Street. It's the end of chapter 12. The next chapter is called Chapter 13, Mr. Marvel Discusses His Resignation. When the dusk was gathering and Ipping was just beginning to peep timorously forth uh, upon the shattered wreckage of its bank holiday, timorous was a word that we looked up in a previous stream, uh, which meant a sort of, uh, sh if I'm remembering, it was sort of like shy and creeping, and uh, if you're timorous, you're, you're being sort of uh, timid, I think. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was, if I'm remembering the word rightly just beginning to peep timorously forth again upon the shattered wreckage of its bank holiday. A short, thick-set man in a shabby silk hat was marching painfully through the twilight between the, behind the beech woods on the road to Bramblehurst. He carried three books bound together by some sort of an ornamental elastic ligature, and a bundle wrapped in a blue tablecloth. His rubicund face expressed const consternation and fatigue. He appeared to be in a spasmodic sort of hurry. He was accompanied by a voice other than, his own, other than his own, and ever and again he winced under the touch of unseen hands. If you give me the slip again, said the voice, if you attempt to give me the slip again. I can't remember what Mr. Marvel sounded like now. He, he, oh, he was Brian Blessed, that's right. He was Brian. He was, he was a very. because he was described as being quite something that made me think of Brian Blessed. Lord, said Mr. Marvel, that shoulder's a mass of bruises as it is. On my honour, said the voice, I will kill you. I didn't try to give you the slip, said Marvel in a voice that was not far remote from tears. I, I didn't try to give you the slip. I swear I didn't. I didn't know the blessed turning. That, that, that was all. How the devil was I to know the blessed turning? <laughs> as it is, I've been knocked about. You'll get knocked about a de great deal more if you don't mind, said the voice and Mr. Marvel abruptly became silent. He blew out his cheeks, and his eyes were eloquent of despair. Uh, who's speaking now? 
It's bad enough to let these floundering yokels explode my little secret without your cutting off my with my books. It's lucky for them some it's lucky for some of them they cut and run when they did. Here am I. No one knew I was invisible, and now what am I to do? What am I to do? asked Marvel. Sotto voce. Tell me that before, so that I can actually do it ahead of time. I don't need to read a line ahead every t every bloody time. What am I to do? What am what am I? It's hard to do, Brian. Blessed, but low and quiet. What am I to do? Asked Marvel. It's all about. It will be in the papers. Everybody will be looking for me. Everyone on their guard. The voice broke off into vivid curses and ceased. The despair of Mr. Marvel's face deepened, and his pace slackened. Go on said the voice. Mr. Marvel's face assumed a greyish tint b between the ruddier patches. Don't drop those books, stupid, said the voice, sharply overtaking him. The fact is, said the voice, I shall have to make use of you. You're a poor tool, but I must. I'm a miserable tool, said Marvel. You are, said the voice. I'm the worst possible tool you could have, said Marvel. I'm not strong, he said after a discouraging silence. I'm not over-strong, he repeated. No? And my heart's weak. That little business, I pulled it through, of course. But bless you, I, I could have dropped. Well? I haven't the nerve and strength for the sort of thing you want. I'll stimulate you. No, I wish you wouldn't. I wouldn't like to mess up your plans, but, y you know, I might out of sheer funk and misery. Well, you'd better not, said the voice with quiet em quiet emphasis. You'd better not, said the voice with quiet emphasis. I wish I was dead, said Marvel. <laughs> it ain't justice, he said. You must admit, it seems to me I've a perfect right. Get on, said the voice. Mr. Marvel mended his pace, and for a time they went in silence again. It's devilish hard, said Mr. Marvel. This was quite ineffectual, so he tried another tack. What do I make by it? He began again in a tone of unendurable wrong. Oh, shut up, said the voice with sudden amazing vigour. I'll see to you all right. You do what you're told. You'll do it all right. You're a fool and all that, but you'll do. I tell you, sir, I'm not the man for it. Respectably, respectfully, but it is so. If you don't shut up, I shall twist your wrist again, said the invisible man. I want to think. Presently, two oblongs of yellow light appeared through the trees, and a square tower of a church loomed through the gloaming. I shall keep my hand on your shoulder, said the voice, all through the village. Go straight through and try no foolery. It will be the worse for you if you do. I know that, cried Mr. Marvel. I, all, I know all that. The unhappy-looking figure in the obsolete silk hat passed up the street of the little village with his burdens, and vanished into the gathering darkness beyond the light of the windows. That's the end of chapter 13. Chapter 14 is called At Port Stowe. Ten o'clock the next morning found Mr. Marvel, unshaven, dirty, and travel-stained, sitting with the books beside him, and his hands deep in his pockets looking very weary, nervous, and uncomfortable and inflating his cheeks at infrequent intervals <laughs> on the bench outside a little inn on the outskirts of Port Stowe. Beside him were the books, but now they were tied with string. The bundle had been abandoned in the pine woods beyond Bramblehurst, in accordance with the change in the plans of the Invisible Man. Mr. Marvel sat on the bench, and although no one took the slightest notice of, notice of him, his agitation remained at fever heat. His hands would go ever again to his various pockets with a curious nervous fumbling. When he'd been sitting for the best part of an hour, however, an elderly mariner carrying a newspaper came out of the inn and sat down beside him. An elderly mariner. Um, elder, elderly, elderly man, mariner, and he spent his life at the on the on the ocean. What's he going to sound? He's going to sound a bit. Bit like this, I guess. Just uh, pleasant day, isn't it? Said the mariner. Mister Marvel glanced about him with something like terror. What the hell did Mister Marvel sound like? 
I don't remember what Mr. Man... Oh, he's Brian, Brian Blessed. Why do I forget that every time? Oh, oh, ha, <laughs> Brian Blessed. Rob, if you haven't seen it, you should check out the 1930s film version of The Invisible Man starring Claude Rains. It's quite good. I have not seen it. I shall try and find it. I doubt that it's on Netflix, but... Brian Blessed! <laughs> Mr. Marvel glanced about him something like ver something very like terror. <laughs> very! he said. Just seasonable weather for the time of year, said the Mariner, taking no denial. Quite! said Mr. Marvel. The mariner produced a toothpick, and, saving his regard, was engrossed thereby for some minutes. His eyes, meanwhile, were at liberty to examine Mr. Marvel's dusty figure and the books beside him. As he had approached Mr. Marvel, he had heard a sound like the dropping of coins into a pocket. He was struck by the contrast of Mr. Marvel's appearance with his suggestion of opulence. Thence his mind wandered back again to a topic that had taken curiously firm hold of his imagination. Books, he said, he said suddenly, noisily, noisily finishing with the toothpick. Books, he said suddenly. Mr. Marvel started and looked at them. Oh, oh yes, he said. Yes, they're, they're, they're books. There's some extraordinary things in books, said the mariner. I believe you, said Mr. Marvel. And some extraordinary things out of them, said the mariner. True, likewise said Mr. Marvel. He eyed his interlocutor, and then glanced about him. There's some extraordinary things in newspapers, for example, said the mariner. There are. In this newspaper, said the mariner. Ah, said Mr. Marvel. There's a story, said the mariner, fixing Mr. Marvel with an eye that was firm and deliberate. And there's a story about an invisible man, for instance. Mr. Marvel pulled his mouth askew, and scratched his cheek, and felt his ears glowing. Huh, what will they be writing next? he asked faintly. Austria or America? Neither, said the mariner. Here. Oh, Lord, said Mr. Marvel, starting. When I say here, said the mariner, to Mr. Marvel's intense relief, I don't, of course, mean here in this place. I mean hereabouts. An invisible man, said Mr. Marvel. And what's he been up to? Everything, said the mariner, controlling Marvel with his eye and then amplifying. Every blessed thing. Every Brian blessed thing. Thank you for the follow. The, uh, the, ap, ape, the, the ape lord. Their ape lord. Uh, where is it? Every Brian blessed thing. I ain't seen a paper these four days, said Marvel. Ipping's the place he started at, said the mariner. Scorn could have killed you that toothpick answer if she was still I know, right? I know. I ain't seen a paper these four days. Ipping's the place he started at, said the mariner. Indeed, said Mr. Marvel. He started there. And where he came from, nobody don't seem to know. Here it is. Peculiar story from Ipping. And it says in this paper that the evidence is extraordinary strong. Extraordinary. Lord, said Mr. Marvel. But then, it's an extraordinary story. There is a clergyman and a medical gent, witnesses, saw him all right and proper. Or leastways, didn't see him. He was staying, it says, at the coach and horses, and no one don't seem to have been aware of his misfortune, it says. Aware of his misfortune until, in an altercation in the inn, it says, his bandages on his head was torn off. It was then observed that his head was invisible. Attempts were, at once, made to secure him, but casting off his garments, it says, he succeeded in escaping. But not until after a desperate struggle, in which he had inflicted serious injuries, it says, on our worthy and able constable, Mr. J. A. Jaffers. Pretty straight story, eh? Names and everything. Lord, said Mr. Marvel, looking nervously about him, trying to count the money in his pockets by his unaided sense of touch, and full of a strange and novel idea. It sounds most astonishing. Don't it? Extraordinary, I call it. Never heard tell of invisible men before. I haven't. But nowadays, when he has such a lot of extraordinary things that... 
that all he did? asked Marvel, trying to seem it at his ease. Well, it's enough, ain't it? said the mariner. Well, he didn't go back by any chance, asked Marvel. Just escaped and that's all, eh? All, said the mariner. Why, ain't it enough? Well, it's quite enough, said Marvel. I should think it was enough, said the mariner. I should think it was enough. He didn't have any pals. It don't say he had any pals, does it? asked Mr. Marvel, anxious. Ain't one a sort of enough for you, said the mariner. No, thank heaven, as one might say, he didn't. He nodded his head slowly. It makes me reg it may it makes me regular uncomfortable the bare thought of that chap running about the country. Wait, is this the guy again? I hate that it splits them over two paragraphs sometimes when it's the same guy talking. I think it doesn't say. Okay, the next guy's Marvel, so this guy must be the mariner again. Is Jeanette off? Good night, Jeanette. Thanks for coming. He nodded his head slowly. It makes me regular uncomfortable, the bare thought of that chap running about the country. He is at present at large. Excuse me. He is at present at large, and from certain evidence, it's supposed that he has taken, or took, I suppose they mean, the road to Port Stowe. You see, we're right in it. None of your American wonders this time. And just think of the things he might do. Where'd you be if he took a drop over and above and had a fancy to go for you? Suppose he wants to rob. Who can prevent him? He can trespass. He can burgle. He could walk right through a cordon of policemen as easy as me or you could give the slip to a blind man. Easier. For these here blind chaps here uncommon sharp, I'm told. And wherever there was liquor, he fancied. He's got a tremendous advantage, certainly, said Mr. Marvel. He says tremendous. He's got a tremendous advantage. And, well... You're right, said the mariner. He has. All this time Mr. Marvel had been glancing about him intently, listening for faint footfalls, trying to detect imperceptible movements. He seemed on the point of some great resolution. He coughed behind his hand. <coughs> he looked about him again, listened, bent towards the mariner and lowered his voice. The fact of it is, I happen to know just a thing or two about this invisible man, from private sources. Oh, said the mariner, interested. You? Yes, said Mr. Marvel. Me. Indeed, said the mariner. And may I ask... You'll be astonished, said Mr. Marvel behind his hand. It's tremendous. So it's not just a, uh, it's not just a spelling mistake, it says it again, tremendous. It's tremendous. Indeed, said the mariner. The fact is, began Mr. Marvel, eagerly in a confidential undertone. Suddenly his expression changed, changed marvellously. Ow! he said. He rose stiffly in his seat. His face was eloquent of physical suffering. Wow! he said. What's up? said the mariner, concerned. A uh, toothache, Mr. Marvel said, putting a hand to his ear. He caught a hold of his books. I must be getting on, I, I think, he said. He edged in a curious way along the seat from his inter interlocutor. But you was just going to tell me about this here invisible man, protested the mariner. Mr. Marvel seemed to consult with himself. Hoax, said a voice. Uh, it's a hoax, said Mr. Marvel. But it's in the paper, said the mariner. Well, it's a hoax all the same, said Marvel. I know the chap that started the lie. There ain't no invisible man whatsoever, blimey. How about this paper? Do you mean to say... Not a word of it, said Marvel stoutly. The mariner stared, paper in hand. Mr. Marvel jerked, face faced about. Well, wait a bit, said the mariner, rising and speaking slowly. Do you mean to say... I do, said, the mis said Mr. Marvel. Then why did you let me go on and tell you all this blasted stuff, then? What do you mean by letting a man make a fool of himself like that for, eh? Mr. Marvel blew out his cheeks. <laughs> the mariner was suddenly very red indeed. He clenched his hands. I've been talking here this ten minutes, he said. And you, you little pot-bellied, leather-faced son of an old boot, couldn't have the elementary manners. Hey, don't you come brandying words with me, said Mr. Marvel. Brandying words? I'm a jolly good mind to... Come up, said a voice, 
and Mr. Marvel was suddenly whirled about and started marching off in a curious spasmodic manner. You'd better move on, said the mariner. Who's moving on? said Mr. Marvel. He was receding obliquely with a curious hurrying gait, with occasional violent jerks forward. Some way along the road he began mutter a muttered monologue, protests and reclamations. Silly devil, said the mariner, legs wide apart, elbows akimbo, watching the receding figure. I'll show you, you silly ass, hoaxing me. It's here on the paper. Mr. Marvel retorted incoherently, and receding was hidden by a bend in the road. But the mariner still stood magnificent in the midst of the way until the approach of a butcher's cart dislodged him. And then he turned himself towards Port Stowe. Full of extraordinary asses, he, s he said softly to himself. Just, just to me take, just to take me down a bit. That was his silly game. It's on the paper and everything. There was an extraordinary, another extraordinary thing he was presently to hear that had happened quite close to him. And that was the vision of a fistful of money, no less, travelling without visible agency along by the wall at the corner of St. Michael's Lane. A brother mariner had seen this wonderful sight that very morning. He had snatched at the money forthwith and had been knocked headlong, and when he had gotten to his feet the butterfly money had vanished. Our mariner was in the mood to believe anything, he declared, but that was a bit too stiff. Afterwards, however, he began to think things over. The story of the flying money was true and all about that neighbourhood, even from even from the August London and Co County the August London and Country Country Banking Company, from the tills of shops and inns, doors standing that sunny weather entirely open. Mon money had been quietly and dexterously making off that day in handfuls and rouleaux, floating quietly along by walls and shady places, dodging quickly from the approaching eyes of men. And then it had, though no man had traced it, invariably ended its mysterious flight in the pocket of that agitated gentleman in the obsolete, uh, obs obsolete silk hat, sitting outside the little inn on the outskirts of Port Stowe. It was ten days after, and indeed only when the burdock story was already old, that the mariner collated these facts and began to understand how near he had been to the wonderful, invisible man. That's the end of chapter 14. Chapter 15. The Man Who Was Running in the early evening time, Dr. Kemp was sitting in his study in the Belvedere on the hill overlooking Burdock. It was a pleasant little room with three windows, north, west and south, and bookshelves covered with books and scientific publica publications and a broad writing table. And under the north window, a microscope, glass slips, minute instruments, some cultures and scattered bottles of reagents. Dr. Kemp's solar lamp was lit, albeit the sky was still bright in the sunset light, and his blinds were up because there was no offence of peering outsiders to require them be pulled down. Dr. Kemp was a, a tall and slender young man, with flaxen hair and a moustache, almost white. What's he, what's he going to sound like? you got to start pitching Dr. Kemp's voice. Dr. Kemp was a tall and slender young man, with flaxen hair and a moustache of almost white, and the work he was upon would earn him, he hoped, the fellowship of the Royal Society, so highly did he think of it. And his eye, presently wandering from his work, caught the sunset blazing at the back of the hill, that is over against his own. For a minute, for a minute perhaps, he sat, pen in mouth, admiring the rich golden colour above the crest, and then his attention was attracted by the little figure of a man, inky black, running over the hill brow towards him. He was a shortish little, little man, and he wore a high hat, and was running so fast that his legs verily twinkled. Mm, another of those fools. Another of those fools, said Dr. Kemp. Like that ass who ran into me this morning round a corner, with the visible manner coming, sir. I can't imagine what possesses people. One, one might think we were in the thirteenth century. He got up, went to the window, and stared at the dusky hillside, and the dark little figure tearing down it. He seems in a confounded hurry said Dr. Kemp. Uh, is that why you went camp? Because his name's Kemp. <laughs> Dr. Kemp. But he doesn't seem to be getting on. If his pockets were full of lead, he couldn't run heavier. Spurted, sir, said Dr. Kemp. In another moment, the higher of the villas that had clambered up the hill from Burdock had occulted the ru running figure. He was visible again for a moment, and again, and then again, three times between the three detached houses that came next, and the then the terrace hid him. Asses, said Dr. Kemp, swinging round on his heel and walking back to his writing table. But those who saw the fugitive nearer, and perceived the abject terror on his perspiring face, 
being themselves in an open roadway, did not share in the doctor's contempt. By the man, <clears throat> by the man pounded, and as he ran, he chinked, he chinked like a well-filled purse that is tossed to and fro. He looked neither to the right nor the left, but his dilated eyes stared straight downhill to where the lamps were being lit, and the people were crowded in the street, and his ill-shaped mouth fell apart, and a glary foam lay on his lips, and his breath came hoarse and noisy. All he passed stopped and began staring up the road and down, and interrogating one another in the inkling of discomfort for the reason of his haste. And then presently, far up the hill, a dog playing in the road yelped and ran under a gate, and as they still wondered something, a wind, a pad, 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 a sound like a panting, breathing, rushed by. People screamed. People sprang off the pavement. It passed in shouts. It passed by instinct down the hill. They were shouting in the street before Marvel was halfway there. They were bolting into houses and slamming doors behind them. With the news, he heard it and made one last desperate spurt. Fear came striding by, rushing ahead of him, and in a moment had seized the town. The Invisible Man is coming! The Invisible Man! This is the end of chapter 15. Chapter 16, in the Jolly Cricketers. The Jolly Cricketers is just at the bottom of the hill, where the tram lines begin. The barman sent... Uh, lent his fat red arms on the counter and talked of horses with an anemic cabman, while a black bearded man in grey, a black bearded man in grey, snapped up biscuits and cheese, drank Burton, and conversed in American with a policeman off duty. Uh, so who's who's conversing in American? A black bearded man is conversing in American. So if the black bearded man speaks, he's, he has to be American. But we've got a bunch of different people here. An, an anemic cabman. Oh, darling cabman, I don't go south of the river. Yes, yes, you cabman. What's the shouting about? Said the anemic cabman, going off at a, ca a tangent, trying to see up the hill over the dirty yellow blind in the low window of the inn. Somebody ran by outside. Barman. All right, what can I get you? What can I get you? Sort of same cockney, but like lower and uh, deep, deeper laryngeal height. I don't know, fire perhaps, said the barman. Footsteps approached, running heavily. The door was pushed open violently, and Marvel, weeping and dishevelled, his hat gone, the neck of his coat torn open, rushed in, made a convulsive turn, and attempted to shut the door. It was half held open by a, uh, by a strap. Coming! he bawled. His voice shrieked with terror. He's coming! The visible man! After me! For God's sake, help! 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 Shut the doors, said the policeman. Who's coming? What's the row? He went to the door, released the strap, and it slammed. The American closed the other door. Let me go inside, said Marvel, staggering and weeping, but still clutching the books. Let me go, inside. Lock me in somewhere. I'll tell you he's after me. I give him the slip, and he said he'd kill me, and he will. You're safe, said the man with the black beard. The door is shut. What's it all about? Let me go inside, said Marvel, and shrieked aloud as a blow suddenly made the fastened door shiver, and was followed by a hurried rapping and a shouting outside. Hello, cried the policeman. Who's there? Mr. Marvel began to make frantic dives at panels that, lock, lock, uh, panels that looked like doors. He'll kill me! He's got a knife or something, for God's sake! Here you are, said the barman. Come in here. And he let, lift, held up a flap of the bar. Mr. Marvel rushed behind the bar as the summons outside was repeated. Don't open the door, he screamed. Please don't open the door. Where shall I hide? This, uh, this invisible man, then, asked the man with the black beard, with one hand behind him. I guess it's about time we saw him. The window of the inn was suddenly smashed in, and there was a screaming and running to and fro in the street. The policeman had been standing on the settee, staring out, craning it to see who was at the door. He got down with raised eyebrows. It's that, he said. The barman stood in front of the bar, the bar parlour door, which was now locked on Mr. Marvel. He stared at the smashed window and came round to the two other men. Everything was suddenly quiet. I wish I had my truncheon, said the policeman, going ir irresolutely to the door. Once we open, in he comes, and there's no stopping him. Oh, darling, don't you be uh, don't you be in too much hurry about that door," said the anemic cabman anxiously. "Draw the bolts," said the man with the black beard. 
If he comes... He showed a revolver in his hand. Because, of course, the American has a firearm. <laughs> that won't do, said the policeman. That's murder. I know what country I'm in, said the man with the beard. I'm going to let off at his legs. Draw the bolts. Not... Not with that blinking, not with that blinking thing going off behind me," said the bar. Uh, said the barman, craning over the blind. Well, "Very well," said the man with the black beard, and stooping down, revolver ready, drew them himself. Barman, cabman, and policeman faced about. "Come in," said the barman, uh, the bearded man, in an undertone, standing back and facing the unbolted doors with his pistol behind him. No one came in. The door remained closed. Five minutes afterwards, when a second cabman pushed his head in cautiously, they were still waiting, and an anxious face peered out of the bar parlour and supplied information. Are all the, ho all the doors of the house shut? asked Marvel. He's going round. He's, he's prowling round. He's as artful as the devil. Ah, uh, good lord, said the burly barman. There's the back. Just watch them doors, I say. He looked about him helplessly. The bar parlour door slammed and the, he heard the, tea, the, they heard the key turn. And then there's the yard door and the private door. Uh, the yard door, he rushed out of the bar. In a minute he reappeared with a carving knife in his hand. The yard door was open, he said, and his fat underlip dropped. He may be in the house now. He may be, or he may be in the house now, said the first cabman. He's not in the kitchen, said the barman. There's two women there. I've stabbed every inch of it with this little beef slicer. <laughs> you can just imagine him running around the kitchen, just stabbing at the air. They don't think he's come in. They haven't noticed. Have you fastened it? Said the first cabman. I'm out of the frocks, said the barman. The man with the beard replaced his revolver, and even as he did so, the flap of the bar was shut down and the bolt clicked, and then with a tremendous thud, the catch of the door snapped and the bar parlour door burst open. They heard, heard Marvel squeal like a caught leveret, and forthwith they were clambering over the bar to his rescue. The bearded man's revolver cracked, and the, a looking glass at the back of the parlour sh starred and came sh smashing and tinkling down. As the barman entered the room, he saw Marvel curiously crumpled up and struggling against the door that led to the yard and kitchen. The door flew open while the barman hesitated, and Marvel was dragged into the kitchen. There was a scream and a clattering of pans. Marvel, head down and, and lugging back obs obstinately, was forced to the kitchen door, and then the bolts were drawn. And then the policeman, who had been trying to pass the barman, rushed in, followed by one of the cabmen, gripped the wrist of the invisible man that collared Marvel, was about to hit in the face, and went reeling back. He was hit in the face, I don't know where about came from. Grabbed the, grabbed the wrist of the invisible man that collared Marvel, was hit in the face, and went reeling back. The door opened and Marvel made a frantic effort to obtain lodgment behind it. And then the cabman collared something. Oh, I've got him, said the cabman. The barman's red hands came clawing at the unseen. Here he is, said the barman. Mr. Marvel, released quite suddenly, dropped to the ground and made an attempt to crawl behind the legs of the fighting men. The struggle blundered round the edge of the door. The voice of the invisible man was heard for the first time, yelling out sharp, sharply as the policeman trod on his foot and then he cried out passionately as his fists flew round like flails. The cabman suddenly whooped and doubled up, kicking under a, uh, kicked under the diaphragm. The door into the bar parlour from the kitchen slammed and covered Mr. Marvel's retreat. The men in the kitchen found themselves clutching at and struggling with empty air. "'Where's he gone?' cried the man with the beard. "'Out?' "'This way!' said, no, this way, said the policeman, stepping out into the yard and stopping. A piece of tile whizzed past his head and smashed along among the crockery on the kitchen table. I'll show him, shouted the man with the black beard, and suddenly a steel barrel shone over the policeman's shoulder and five bullets had followed one another into the twilight whence the missile had come. As he fired, the man with the beard moved his hand like a horizontal curve so that his shots radiated out in the narrow yard like spokes from a wheel. A silence followed. Five cartridges, said the man with the black beard. That's the best of all. Four aces and a joker. Get a lantern, someone, and come feel about for his body. Because guns solve all problems. That's the end of chapter 16. Chapter 17. Dr. Kemp's Visitor. 
Dr. Kemp had continued writing in his study until the shots aroused him. Crack, 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 they came one after another. Hello, said Dr. Kemp, putting his pen into his mouth again and listening. Who's letting off revolvers in Burdock? <clears throat> what are the asses at now? He went to the south window, threw it up, and leaning out, stared down on the network of windows, beaded gas lamps and shops, with its black interstices of roof and yard that made up the town at night. Looks like a crowd down the hill, he said. By the cricketers. And he remained watching. Thence his eyes wandered over a town to... Over... Oh, then his, thence his eyes wandered over the town to far away where the ship's lights shone, and the pier glowed, a little illuminated faceted pavilion of a gem of, a, of yellow light. The moon in its first quarter hung over the westward hill, and the stars were clear and almost tropically bright. After five minutes, during which his mind had travelled into a remote speculation of special condo, uh, special, a remote speculation of social conditions at the t at, at, of the future, and lost itself at last over the time dimension, Doctor Kemp roused himself with a sigh, pulled down the window again, and returned to his writing desk. It must have been about an hour after this that the front door bell rang. He had been writing slackly, and with intervals of abstraction since the shots. He sat listening. He heard the servant answer the door, and waited for her feet on the staircase, but she did not come. "'I wonder what that was,' said Dr. Kemp. He tried to resume his will work, and failed, so he got up and went downstairs from his study to the landing. He rang, and called over the balustrade to the housemaid as she appeared in the hall below. "'Was that a letter?' he asked. "'Only a runaway ring, sir,' she answered. "'I'm restless tonight,' he said to himself. He went back into his study, and this time attacked his work r resolutely. In a little while he was hard at work again, and the only sounds in the room were the ticking of the clock and the subdued shrillness of his quill, hurrying in the very centre of the circle of light his lampshade threw on his table. It was two o'clock before Dr. Kemp had finished his work for the night. He rose, yawned, and went downstairs to bed. He had already removed his coat and vest when he noticed that he was thirsty. He took a candle and went down to the dining room in search of a siphon and whisky. Dr. Kemp's scientific pursuits had made him a very observant man, and as he recrossed the hall, he noticed a dark spot on the linoleum, near the mat at the foot of the stairs. He went on upstairs, and then it suddenly occurred to him to ask himself what the spot on the linoleum might be. Linoleum, that's a hard word to say. To ask himself what the spot on the linoleum might be. Apparently some subconscious element was at work. At any rate, he returned with a burden went back to the hall, put down the siphon and whiskey, and bending down, touched the spot. Without any great surprise, he found it had had the stickiness and colour of drying blood. He took up his burden again, and returned upstairs, looking about him and trying to account for the blood spot. On the landing, he saw something and stopped astonished. The door handle of his own room was blood-stained. He looked at his own hand. It was quite clean and then he remembered that the door of his room had been open when he came down from his study, and that consequently he had not touched the handle at all. He went straight into his room, his face quite calm, perhaps a trifle more resolute than usual. His glance, wandering inquisitively, fell on the bed. On the counterpane was a mess of blood, and the sheet had been torn. He had not noticed this before, because, because he had walked straight to the dressing table. On the further side, the bedclothes were depressed, as if someone had, re had been recently sitting there. Then he had an odd impression that he had he had heard a low voice say, Good heavens! Kemp! But Dr. Kemp was no believer in voices. He stood staring at the tumbled sheets. Was that really a voice? He looked about again, but noticed, noticed nothing further than the disordered and blood-stained bed. And then he distinctly heard movement across the room, near the washstand. All men, however highly educated, uh, all men, however highly educated, retained some superstitious inklings. The feeling that, that is called eerie came upon him. He closed the door of the room, came forward to the dressing table, and put down his burdens. Suddenly, with a start, he perceived a coiled and blood-stained bandage of linen rag hanging in midair between him and the washstand. He stared at this in amazement. It was an empty bandage, a bandage properly tied but quite empty. He would have advanced to grasp it, but a touch arrested him, and a voice speaking quite close to him. Kemp, said the voice. Eh? said Kemp, with his mouth, mouth open. Keep your nerve, said the voice. I'm an invisible man. Kemp made no answer for a space. 
simply stared at the bandage. Invisible man, he said. I am an invisible man, repeated the voice. The story had been active to ridicule only that morning. The story, he had been active to ridicule only that morning, rushed through Kemp's brain. He does not appear to have been either very much frightened or very greatly surprised at the moment. Realisation came later. I thought it was all a lie, he said. The thought, the, the thought uppermost in his mind was at the reiterated arguments of the morning. Have you a bandage on? he asked. Yes, said the invisible man. Oh, said Kemp, and then he roused himself. I say, he said. But this is nonsense. It's some trick. He stepped forward suddenly, and his hand extended towards the bandage, met invisible fingers. He recoiled at the touch, and his colour changed. Keep steady, Stem Kemp, for God's sake. I won't help badly. Stop it. The hand gripped his arm. He struck at it. Kemp! Uh, Kemp! said the voice. Kemp, keep steady! And the grip tightened. A frantic desire to free himself took possession of Kemp. The hand of the bandaged arm gripped his shoulder, and he was suddenly tripped and flung backwards on the bed. He opened his mouth to shout, and the corner of the street was corner of the sheet was thrust between his teeth. The invisible man had him down grimly, but his arms were free, and he struck and tried to kick savagely. Listen to reason, will you? said the invisible man, sticking sticking to him in spite of a pounding in the ribs. By heaven you'll make me madden you'll madden me in a minute. Lie still, you fool, bawled the invisible man in Kemp's ear. Kemp struggled for another moment and then lay still. If you shout, I'll smash your face, said the invisible man, relieving his mouth. I'm an invisible man. It's no foolishness and no magic. I really am an invisible man, and I want your help. I don't want to hurt you. But if you behave like a frantic rustic, I must. Don't you remember me, Kemp? Griffin of University College. We finally got a name. Seventeen chapters in. Let me get up, said Kemp. I'll stop where I am, but let me sit quiet for a moment. He sat up and felt his neck. I am Griffin of University College, and I've made myself invisible. I'm just an ordinary man, a man you've known, made invisible. Griffin, said Kemp. Griffin, answered the, answered the voice. A youngest. Uh, they've missed a, they've missed some quotation marks. A younger student than you were, almost an albino, six feet high, broad, with a pink and white face and red eyes, who won the medal for chemistry. Uh, but I'm confused," said Kemp. "My brain is rioting. What has this got to do with Griffin? I am Griffin," Kemp thought. "It's horrible," he said. But what devilry must happen to make a man invisible? It's no devilry, it's a process, sane and intelligent, intelligible enough. It's horrible, said Kemp. How on earth? It's horrible enough, but I'm wounded and I'm in pain and tired. Great God, Kemp, you're a man. Just take it steady. Give me some food and drink and let me sit down here. Kemp stared at the bandage as it moved across the room and then saw a basket, saw a basket chair dragged across the floor and come to rest near the bed. It creaked and the seat was depressed, a, the quarter of an inch or so. He rubbed his eyes and felt his neck again. This, this beats ghosts, he said, and laughed stupidly. That's better. Thank heaven you're getting sensible. Or oh, silly, said Kemp, and knuckled his eyes. Give me some whiskey, I'm, I'm near dead. I didn't feel, it didn't feel so. Where are you? If I get up, shall I run into you? There, all right, whiskey. Um, here, where shall I give it to you? The chair creaked and Kemp, Kemp felt the glass drawn away from him. He let go by an effort. His instinct was all against it. He came to rest, poised twenty inches above the front edge of the seat of the chair. He stared at it in an infinite perplexity. This is... this must be hypnotism. You've suggested you're invisible. Nonsense, said the voice. It's frantic. Listen to me. I demonstrated conclusively this morning, began Kemp, that invisibility... Never mind what you've demonstrated. I'm starving, said the voice. And the night is chilly to a man without clothes. Food, said Kemp. The tumbler of whiskey tilted itself. Yes, said the invisible man, wrapping it down. Have you a dressing gown? 
Kemp made some exclamation in an undertone. He walked to a wardrobe and produced a robe of dingy scarlet. Will this do? he asked. It was it was taken from him. It hung limp for a moment in midair, fluttered weir weirdly, stood full and decorous, buttoning itself, and sat down in its chair. Drawers, slippers, uh, socks, they'd all be a comfort, he said the unseen curtly. And food. Well, anything, I suppose, but this is the insanest thing I, uh, I ever was in, in my life. He turned out his drawers for the articles, and then went down outstairs. Uh, then went downstairs to ransack his larder. He came back with some cold cutlets and bread and pulled up a light table and placed them before his guest. Never mind knives, said his visitor, and a cutlet hung in midair with the sound of gnawing. Invisible, said Kemp and sat down on a bedroom chair. I always like to get something about me before I eat, said the invisible man with a mouthful, eating greedily. It's a queer fancy. I suppose that wrist is all right, said Kemp. Trust me, said the invisible man. Of all the strange and wonderful... Well, exactly, but it's odd I should blunder into your house to get my bandaging. My first stroke of luck. Anyhow, I meant to sleep in this house tonight. You must stand that. It's a filthy nuisance, my blood showing, isn't it? Quite a clot over there. It gets visible as it coagulates, I see. It's the only living tissue I've changed. It's only the living tissue I've changed, and as only for as long as I'm alive. I've been in this house for three hours. But how's it done? began Kemp in, an, in a tone of exasperation. Confound it, the whole business, it's unreasonable from beginning to end. It's quite reasonable, said the invisible man. It's perfectly reasonable. He reached over and secured the whiskey bottle. Kemp stared at the devouring dressing gown. A ray of candlelight penetrated a torn patch in the right shoulder, and made a triangle of light under the left ribs. What were the shots? he asked. How did the shooting begin? There was a... a real fool of a man. A sort of confederate of mine. Curse him. He tried to steal my money. Well, he has done so. Is he invisible too? No. Well? Well, can't I have some more to eat before I tell you all that? I'm hungry and I'm in pain. You want me to tell you stories? Well, you didn't do any shooting, Kemp asked as he got up. Not me, said his visitor. Some fool I'd never seen fired at random. A lot of them got scared. They all got scared of me. Curse them. Curse them, I say. I want more to eat than this, Kemp. Well, I'll, I'll see what there is downstairs, said Kemp. Well, there's not much, I'm afraid. After he'd done eating and he made a heavy... He After he'd done eating and he made a heavy meal, the invisible man demanded a cigar. He bit the end savagely before Kemp could find a knife and cursed when the outer leaf loosened. It was strange to see him smoking. His mouth and throat, pharynx and nares, all became visible as a sort of whirling smoke cast. It's a, some really good visuals. Really good imagery. Who'd have thought H.G. Wells was good at writing? This blessed gift of smoking, he said and puffed vigorously. I'm lucky to have fallen upon you, Kemp. You must help me. Fancy tumbling on you just now. I'm in a devilish scrape. I've been mad, I think, the things I've been through. But we will do things yet, let me tell you. He helped himself to more, more whiskey and soda. Kemp got up, looked about him, and fetched a glass from his spare room. It's wild, but I suppose... Wait, no, this might be Kemp. Yeah, this is Kemp. It's wild, but I suppose I may drink. You haven't changed much, Kemp, these dozen years. You fair men don't. Cool and methodical, after the first collapse. I must tell you, we will work together. But how was it all done? said Kemp. And how did you get like this? For God's sake, let me smoke in peace a little while. Then I'll tell you. But the, no the story was not told that night. The invisible man's wrist was growing painful. He was feverish, exhausted, and his mind came round to brood upon his chase down the hill, and the struggle about the inn. He spoke in fragments of, of marvel. He smoked faster. His voice grew angry. Kemp tried to gather what he could. He was afraid of me. I could see he was afraid of me, said the invisible man many times over. He meant to give me the slip. He was always casting about. Ah, what a fool I was. The cur. I should have killed him. 
Where did you get the money? asked Kemp abruptly. The invisible man was silent for a space. I can't tell you tonight, he said. He groaned suddenly and leapt forward, supporting his invisible head on invisible hands. Ah, Kemp, he said. I've had no sleep for near three days, except for a couple of doses of an hour or so. I must sleep soon. Well, have my room. Have this room. But how can I sleep? If I sleep, he'll get away. Oh, what does it matter? What's the shot wound? Asked Kemp, asked, asked Kemp abruptly. Oh, it's nothing. It's just a scratch and blood. Oh, God, how I won't sleep. Well, why not? The invisible man appeared to be regarding Kemp. Because I've got a particular objection to being caught by my fellow men, he said slowly. Kemp started. Fool that I am, said the invisible man, striking the table smartly. I've gone and put that idea into your head. That's the end of chapter 17. Chapter 18, The Invisible Man Sleeps. Exhausted and wounded as the Invisible Man was, he refused to accept, accept Kemp's word that his freedom should be respected. He examined the two windows of the bedroom, drew up the blinds and opened the sashes to confirm Kemp's statement that a retreat by them would be possible. Outside, the night was very quiet and still, and the new moon was settling over the, do uh, over the down. Then he examined the keys of the bedroom, and the two dressing room doors to satisfy himself that these could also be made an assurance of freedom. Finally, he expressed himself satisfied. He took on the hearth rug, and Kemp heard the sound of a yawn. Oh, I'm sorry, said the invisible man, but I cannot tell you all of that I've done tonight. I'm worn out. It's grotesque, no doubt. It's horrible. But believe me, Kemp, in spite of your arguments this morning, it's quite a possible thing. I've made a discovery. I meant to keep it to myself, but I, I can't. I must have a partner. I knew we can do such things. But tomorrow. Now, Kemp, I feel as though I must, I must sleep or perish. Kemp stood in the middle of the room, staring at the headless garment. I suppose I must leave. Uh, I suppose I must leave you," he said. "It's incredible. Three things happening like this, over overturning all of my preconceptions." It would make me insane. But it's real. Is there anything more I can get you? Only bid me good night, said Griffin. Good night, said Kemp, and shook an invisible hand. He walked sideways to the door. Suddenly the dressing, round, dressing gown walked quickly towards him. Understand me, said the dressing, dressing gown. No attempts to hamper me, or capture me, or... Kemp's face changed a little. I thought I gave you my word he said. Kemp closed the door softly behind him, and the key was turned upon him forthwith. Then as he stood with an expression of passive amazement on his face, the rapid feet came to the door of the dressing room, and that was too locked. Kemp slacked his brow with his hand. Am I dreaming? Has the world gone mad? Or have I? He laughed, and he put his hand to the locked door. Barred out of my own bedroom by a flagrant absurdity, he said. He walked to the head of the staircase, turned, and stared back at the locked doors. It's fact, he said, and he put his fingers to his slightly bruised neck. It's an undeniable fact. But, he shook his head hopelessly, turned, and went downstairs. He lit the dining room lamp, he got out a cigar, and began pacing the room, ejaculating. And now and then he would argue with himself. Invisible, he said. Is there such a thing as an invisible animal? Well, in the sea, yes. Thousands. Millions. All the lava. All the norpli in the tornarius. All the microscopic things. The jellyfish. In the sea, there are more things invisible than visible. I never thought of that before. And in the ponds, too. All these little pond life things. Specks of colourless, translucent jelly. But in air? No. It can't be. But after all, why not? If a man was made of glass, he would still be visible. His meditation became profound. The bulk of three cigars had passed into the invisible or diffused as a white ash over the carpet before he spoke again. Then it was merely an exclamation. 
He turned aside, walked out of the room, and went into his little consulting room and lit the gas there. It was a little room, because Dr. Kemp did not live by practice, and in it were the day's newspapers. The morning's paper lay carelessly open and thrown aside. He caught it up, turned it over, and read the account of a strange story from Ipping that the mariner at Port Stowe had spelt over so painfully to Mr. had spelt over so painfully to Mr. Marvel. Kemp read it swiftly. Wrapped up, he said. Disguised. Hiding it. No one seems to have been aware of his misfortune. What the devil is his game? He dropped the paper and his eye went seeking. Ah, he said, and caught up the St. James's Gazette, lying folded up as it arrived. Now we shall get the truth, said Dr. Kemp. He rent the paper open, a couple of, couple of columns confronted him. An entire, an entire village in Sussex goes mad, was the heading. Good heavens, said Kemp, reading eagerly an incredulous amount of the events of, in Ipping, of the previous afternoon, that had already been described and over the leaf the report in the morning paper had been reprinted. He re-read it. Ran through the street, striking right and left, Jap Jaffa's insensible, Mr. Huckster in great pain, still unable to describe what he saw. The painful humiliation, vicar, woman terrible, ill with terror, windows smashed. This extraordinary story, probably a fabrication, too good not to print. Cum grano. What is cum grano? That's obviously a Latin phrase. He dropped the paper and stared blankly in front of him. It's probably a fabrication. He caught up the paper again and reread the whole business. But when does the tramp come in? Why the deuce was he chasing a tramp? Bloody fly. He sat down abruptly on the surgical bench. He's not only invisible, but he's mad. He's homicidal. When dawn came to mingle its pallor with the lamplight, the cigar smoke of the dining room, Kemp was still pacing up and down, trying to grasp the incredible. He was alt altogether too excited to sleep. His servants, descending sleepily, discovered him and were inclined to think that overstudy had worked him this had worked this ill on him. He gave them extraordinary but quite uh, explicit instructions to lay breakfast for two in the Belvedere study, and then to confine themselves to the basement and ground floor. Then he continued to pace pace the dining room until the morning's paper came. That had much to say and little, little to tell, beyond the confirmation of the evening before, and a very badly written account of another remarkable tale from Port Burdock. That's uh, an interesting phrase I'm going to have to remember. Much to say, but little to tell. <laughs> uh, uh, my flatmate asked me what, recently why I don't watch the news, and that would sum it up pretty nicely. <laughs> much to say and little to tell. This gave this gave Kemp the essence of the happenings of the Jolly Cricketers, and the name of the Marvel. He has made me keep with him twenty-four hours. Wait, no. Who's speaking? Oh, it's it's a quote of quote from Marvel, who was Brian Blessed. This gave Kemp the essence of the happening at the Jolly Cricketers, and the name of Marvel. He has kept me kept me with him twenty-four hours. Marvel testified. Certain minor facts were added to the Ipping story, notably the cutting of the village telegraph wire. But there was nothing to throw light on the connection between the Invisible Man and the Tramp, for Mr. Marvel had supplied no information about the three books, or the money in which he was lined. In which was lined. What? Had supplied no information about the three books, or the money with which he was lined. The incredulous tone had vanished, and a shoal of reporters and inquirers were already at work elaborating the matter. Kemp read every scrap of the report and sent his housemaid out to get every one of the morning papers sh that she could. These he also he devoured. He is invisible, he said, and it reads like rage growing to mania. The things he may do. The things he may do. And he's upstairs free as the air. What on earth ought I do? What on, what on earth ought I to do? For instance, would it be a breach of faith if... No. He went to a little untidy desk in the corner and began a note. He tore this up, half-written, and wrote another. He read it over and considered it. And then he took an envelope and addressed it to Colonel Adier, Port Burdock. The invisible man awoke even as Kemp was doing this. He woke in an evil temper, and Kemp, alert for every sound, heard his pattering feet rush suddenly across the bedroom overhead. Then a chair was flung over and the washstand's tumbler smashed. 
Kemp hurried upstairs and rapped eagerly. That's the end of chapter 18. Chapter 19. Certain First Principles. What's the matter? asked Kemp when the Invisible Man admitted him. Nothing, was the answer. But confounded, the smash! It was a fit of temper, said the Invisible Man. I forgot this arm and it's sore. You're rather liable to that sort of thing. Yes, I am. Kemp walked across the room and picked up the fragments of broken glass. All the facts are out about you, said Kemp, standing up with the glass in his hand. All that happened in Ipping, and down the hill. The world has become aware of its invisible citizen, but no one knows you're here. The invisible man swore. Uh, who's this one? Um, the secret's out. I gather it was a secret. I don't know what your plans are, but of course I'm anxious to help you. The invisible man sat down on the bed. There's breakfast upstairs, said Kemp, speaking as easily as possible, and he was delighted to find his strange guest rose willingly. Kemp led the way up the narrow staircase to the Belvedere. Before we can do anything else, said Kemp, I must understand a little more about this invisibility of yours. He had sat down, after one nervous glance out of the window, with the air of a man who has talking to do. His doubts of the sanity of the entire business flashed and vanished again as he looked across to where Griffin sat at the breakfast table, a headless, handless dressing gown, wiping unseen lips on a miraculously held serviette. It's simple enough, and credible enough. Wait, Griffin. Ah, oh, it's Griffin Kemp. Why does it keep changing between first and last names? No, Griffin is the Invisible Man's name. It's finally given him a name instead of calling him the Invisible Man. Even though we learned his name like three chapters ago, it's been calling him the Invisible Man ever since. But now it's changed to his actual name. Okay, gotcha. It's simple enough, and credible enough said Griffin, putting the serviette aside and leaning his invisible hand, head on an invisible hand. No doubt to you, but... Kemp laughed. Well, yes, to me it seemed wonderful at first, no doubt. But now, great God. But we will do great things yet. I came on the stuff first at Ch Cheselstow. Cheselstow? I went there after I left London. You know I dropped medicine and took up physics. No? Well, I did. Light fascinated me. Ah. Optical density. The whole subject a network of riddles. A network with solutions glimmering elusively through. And being but two and twenty and full of enthusiasm, I said, I'll devote my life to this. This is worthwhile. You know what fools we are at two and twenty. Fools then or fools now, said Kemp. As though knowing could be any satisfaction to a man. But I went to work like a slave, and I had hardly worked and thought about the matter six months before light came through one of these meshes suddenly, blindingly. I found a general principle of pigments and refraction, a formula, a geometrical expression involving four dimensions. Fools, common men, even common mathematicians, do not know anything of what some general expression may mean to the student of molecular physics. In the books, the books that tramp was, the, the books that tramp has hidden. There are marvels, miracles, but this was not a method, it was an idea. An idea that may lead to a method by which it was, would be possible, without changing any other property of matter, except in some instances colours, to lower the refractive index of a substance, solid or liquid, to that of air, so far as all practical purposes are concerned. Phew, said Kemp, that's odd, but still I don't see quite... I can understand that thereby you could spoil the valuable stone, but personal invisibility is a far cry. Precisely, said Griffin. But consider visibility depends on the actions of the visible bodies on light. Either a body absorbs light, or it refracts or, re re reflects or refracts it, or does all of these things. If it neither reflects nor refracts nor absorbs light, it cannot of itself be visible. You see an opaque red box, for instance, because the colour absorbs some of the light and reflects the rest, all the red part of the light, to you. If it did not absorb any particular part of the light, but reflected them all, then it would be a shining white box, silver. A diamond box would neither absorb much of the light nor reflect much from the general surface, 
but just here and there where the surfaces were favourable to the light would be reflected and refracted, so you would get a brilliant appearance of flashing reflections and translucencies, a sort of skeleton of light. A glass box would not be so brilliant nor so clearly visible as a diamond box, because there would be less refraction and reflection. So you see that? From certain points of view you would see quite clearly through it. Some kinds of glass would be more visible than others. A box of flint glass would be brighter than a box of ordinary window glass. And then a box of very thin common glass would be hard to see in a bad light because it would absorb hardly any of the light and refract and reflect very little. And if you put a sheet of common white glass in water, still more if you put it in some denser liquid than water, it would vanish almost altogether because light passing from water to glass is only slightly refracted or reflected than indeed affected in any way. It is almost as invisible as a jet of coal gas or hydrogen is in the air, and for precisely the same reason. Well, yes, said Kemp, that's pretty plain sailing. Here's another fact you'll know to be true. If a sheet of glass is smashed, Kemp, and beaten into a powder, it becomes much more visible while it's in the air becomes at last an opaque white powder. This is because the powdering multiplies the surfaces of the glass at which refraction and reflection occur. In the sheet of glass there are only two surfaces. In the powder the light is reflected or refracted by each grain it passes through, and very little gets right through the powder. But if the white powdered glass is put into water, it forthwith vanishes. The powdered glass and water have much the same refractive index. That is, the light undergoes very little refraction or reflection in passing from one to the other. You make the glass invisible. Why would it... It's the same guy. Why would it change its paragraph all of a sudden? You make the glass invisible by putting it into a liquid of nearly the same refractive index. A transparent thing becomes invisible if it's put in any medium of almost the same refractive index. And you'll consider only a second. You'll see only the powder of glass might be made to vanish in air if its refractive index could be made the same as that of air. For then there'd be no refraction or reflection as the light passed from glass to air. Well, yes, yes, said Kemp, but a man's not powdered glass. No, said Griffin, he's more transparent. Nonsense. Huh, that's from a doctor. How one forgets. Have you already forgotten your physics in ten years? Just think of all the things that are transparent and seem not to be so. Paper, for instance, is made up of transparent fibres. It is white and opaque only for the same reason that a powder of glass is white and opaque. Oil, white paper, fill up the interstices between the particles with oil, so there's no longer refraction or reflection except at the surfaces, and it becomes as transparent as glass. And not only paper, but cotton fibre, linen, wool fibre, woody fibre, bone kemp, flesh kemp, hair kemp, nails and nerves. In fact, the whole fabric of a man, except the red of his blood and the black, black pigment of hair, are all made up of transparent, colourless tissue. So little, suffices, so little suffices to make us visible one to the other. For the most part, the fibres of a living creature are no more op opaque than water. This has got interesting, uh, interesting science to it. Like, the author obviously knows enough about the physics to have come up with a satisfying sort of explanation of how this could possibly work. Great heavens, cried Kemp. Of course, of course. I was I was thinking only last night of the sea larvae and, the, and all the jellyfish. Um, just that's a paragraph without telling me who is talking. Presumably Griffin. Well, now you have me, and all that I knew and had in mind after a year after I left London, six years ago. But I kept it to myself. I had to do my own work under frightful disadvantages. Oliver, my professor, Oliver, my professor, was a scientific bounder, a journalist by instinct, a thief of ideas. He was always prying, and you know the knavish system of the scientific world. I simply would not publish and let him share my credit. Uh, so I went on working. I got nearer and nearer making my formula into an experiment, a reality. 
I told no living soul because I meant to flash my work upon the world with crushing effect and become famous at a blow. I took up the question of pigments to fill up certain gaps, and suddenly, not by design but by accident, I made a discovery in physiology. Yes? You know the red colouring matter of blood? It can be made white, colourless, and remain with all the functions it has now. Kemp gave a cry of incredulous amazement. The invisible man rose and began pacing the, the little study. You may well exclaim. I remember that night. It was late at night. In the daytime, one was bothered with the gaping, silly students, and I worked then sometimes till dawn. It came suddenly, splendid and complete in my mind. I was alone. The laboratory was still, with the tall lights burning brightly and silently. In all my great moments, I've been alone. One could make an animal... A tissue, transparent. One could make it invisible. All except the pigments, I, I could be invisible. All except the pigments, I could be invisible, I said, suddenly realizing what it meant to be an albino with such knowledge. It was overwhelming. I left the filtering I was doing and went and stared out of the great window at the stars. I could be invisible, I repeated. To do such a thing would be to transcend magic. And I behold, unclouded by doubt, a magnificent vision of all that invisibility might mean to a man. The mystery, the power, the freedom. Drawbacks I saw none. You have only to think. And I, a shabby, poverty-struck, hemmed-in demonstrator, teaching fools in a provincial college, might suddenly become this. I ask you, Kemp, if you, anyone, I tell you, would have flung himself upon that research. And I worked three years, and every mountain of difficulty I toiled over showing another form of its summit. The infinite details. The exasperation. A professor, a provincial professor, always prying. When are you going to publish this work of yours? was his everlasting question. And the students, the cramped means, three years I had of it. And after three years of secrecy and exasperation, I found that to complete it was impossible. It was impossible. How? asked Kemp. Well, money, asked the invisible man, and went again to stare out the window. <sighs> he turned round abruptly. I robbed the old man. I robbed my father. And the money wasn't his. So he shot himself. Quite an abrupt end to the chapter there. Chapter 20. At the house in Great Portland Street. For a moment, Kemp sat in silence, staring at the back of the headless figure at the window. And then he started, struck by a thought. And then he rose, he took the invisible man's arm, and turned him away from the outlook. You're tired, he said. And while I sit, you walk about. Have my chair. He placed himself between Griffin and the nearest window. For a space, Griffin sat st silent, and then he resumed abruptly. I'd left the Chesil Stowe cottage already, he said, when that happened. It was last December. I had taken a room in London, a large unfurnished room in a big ill-managed lodging cottage in a slum near Great Portland Street. The room was sun soon full of appliances I'd brought with his money. The work was going on steadily, successfully, drawing near an end. I felt like a man emerging from a thicket, and suddenly coming upon some unmeaning tragedy. I went to bury him. My mind still on this research, and I did not lift a finger to save his character. I remember the funeral, the cheap hearse, the scant ceremony, the windy, frostbitten hillside, and the old college friend of his who read the service over him, a shabby, black, bent old man with a snivelling cold. I remember walking back to the empty house through the place that had once been a village and was now patched and tinkered by the jerry builders into the ugly likeness of a town. Every way the roads ran out at the last to the desecrated fields and ended in rubble heaps and rank wet weeds. I remember myself as a gaunt black figure going along the slippery, slippery shiny pavement and the strange sense of detachment I felt from this squalid respectability, the sordid commercialism of the place. I did not feel a bit sorry for my father. He seemed to me to be the victim of his own foolish sentimentality. The 
Edgar at Gant required my attendance at his funeral, but it was really not my affair. But going along the high street, my old life came back to me for a space, for I met the girl I'd known ten years since, and our eyes met. Something moved me to turn back and talk to her. She was a very ordinary person. It was all like a dream, a visit to the old places. I did not feel then as it was my that I was lonely, that I'd come out from the world into a desolate place. I appreciate my loss of sympathy, but I put it down to the general inanity of things. Re-entering my room seemed like the recovery of reality. There were the things I knew and loved. There stood the apparatus, the experiments arranged and waiting. And now there was scarcely a difficulty left beyond the planning of beyond the planning of details. I will tell you, Kemp, sooner or later, all the complicated process. We need not go into that now. For the most part, saving certain gaps I chose to remember, they are written in a cipher in those books that Tramp has hidden. We must hunt him down. We must get those books back. But the essential phase was to place the transparent object whose refractive index was to be lowered between two radiating centres of a sort of ethereal vi uh, vibration, of which I'll tell you more fully later. No, not those uh, Rontgen vibrations. I don't know. I don't know that these others of mine have been described. Yet they are obvious enough. I needed two little dynamos, and these I worked with a cheap gas engine. My first experiment was with a bit of white wool fabric. It was the strangest thing in the world to see it flicker in the flashes. So, uh, to see it f in the flicker of the flashes, soft and white, and then to watch it fade like a wreath of smoke and vanish. I could scarcely believe what I'd done. I put my hand into the emptiness, and there was the thing as solid as ever. I felt it awkwardly and threw it on the floor. I had, I had a little trouble finding it again. And then came a curious experience. I heard a meow right behind me, and turning I saw a lean white cat, very dirty, on the cistern cover outside of the window. A thought came into my head. Everything's ready for you. I went to the window, I opened it, and I called softly, and she came in purring. The poor beast was starving. I gave her some milk. All my food was in a cupboard in the corner of the room. After that she went smelling round the room, evidently with the idea of making herself at home. The invisible rag upset her a bit. You should have seen her spit at it. But I made her comfortable on the pillow of my truckle bed, and I gave her butter to get her to wash. And you processed her? Yes, I processed her. But giving drugs to a cat is no joke, Kemp, and the process failed. Failed? In two particulars. There were the claws and the pigment stuff. Uh, what is it? The, the stuff at the back of the eyes of the cat, you know? Uh, tapetum. Yes, the tapetum. It didn't go. After I'd given the stuff to bleach the blood and done certain other things to her, I gave the beast opium and put her in the pillow she was sleeping on, on the apparatus. And after all the rest had faded and vanished, there remained two little ghosts of her eyes. Hmm, how odd. Yeah, I can't explain it. She was bandaged and clamped, of course, so I had her safe. But she woke while well, she was still misty, and she meowed dismally. Someone came knocking. It was an old woman from downstairs who suspected me of vivisecting and drunk a drink-sodden old creature with only a white cat to care for in all the world. I whipped out some chloroform, applied it, and I answered the door. Did I hear a cat? she asked. My cat? Not here, said I, very politely. She was a little doubtful and tried to peer past me into the room, strange enough for her to no strange enough to her, no doubt, bare walls, uncurtained windows, truckle bed, with the gas engine vibrating and the seethe of the radiant points, and that faint ghastly stinging of chloroform in the air. She had to be satisfied at last and went away again. How long did it take? said Kemp. Three or four hours. The cat. The bones and sinews and the fat were the last to go. And the tips of the coloured hairs. And as I say, the back part of the eye. Tough, iridescent stuff it is. It wouldn't go at all. It was night outside, long before the business was over, and nothing was to be seen but the dim eyes and the claws. I stopped the gas engine, felt for and stroked the beast, which was still insensible, and then being tired, left it sleeping on the invisible pillow and went to bed. I found it hard to sleep. 
I lay awake thinking I lay I lay awake thinking weak aimless stuff, going over the experiment over and over again. Or dreaming feverishly of things growing misty and vanishing about me, until everything the ground I stood on vanished. And so I came to that sickly falling nightmare one gets. About two, the cat began meowing, meowing around the room. I tried to hush it by talking to it, and then I decided to turn it out. I remember the shock I had when striking a light. They were just the round eyes, shining green, and nothing around them. I would have given it milk, but I hadn't any. It wouldn't have been quiet. It just sat down and meowed at the door. I tried to catch it with an idea of putting it out the window, but it wouldn't be caught. It vanished. And then it began meowing in different parts of the room. At last I opened the window and made a bustle. I suppose it went out at last. I never saw any more of it. And then, heaven knows why, I felt thinking of my father's funeral again, and the dismal windy hillside, until the day had come. I found sleeping was hopeless, and locking my door after me, wandered, wandered out into the morning streets. You don't mean to say there's an invisible cat at large, said Kemp. Well, if it hasn't been killed, said the Invisible Man, why not? Why not? said Kemp. I didn't mean to interrupt. It's very probably been killed, said the Invisible Man. It was alive four days after, I know, and down a grating in Great Titchfield Street, because I saw a crowd round the place trying to see whence the meowing came. He was silent for the best part of a minute, and then he resumed abruptly. I remember that morning before the change very, very vividly. I must have gone up Great Portland Street. I remember the barracks in Albany Street and the horse soldiers coming out. And at last I found the summit of Primrose Hill. It was a sunny day in January. One of those sunny, frosty days that came before the snow this year. My weary brain tried to formulate the position, to plot out a plan of action. I was surprised to find, now that my prize was within my grasp, how inconclusive its attainment seemed. As a matter of fact, I, work, I was worked out. The intense stress of my nearly four years' continuous work left me incapable of any strength of feeling. I was apathetic and tried in vain to recover the enthusiasm of my first inquiries, the passion of discovery that had enabled me to compass even with the downfall of my father's grey hairs. Nothing seemed to matter. I saw pretty clearly this was a transient mood due to overwork and want of sleep and that either by drugs or rest it would be possible to recover my energies. All I could think clearly was that the thing had to be carried through. The fixed idea still ruled me, and soon, for the, mo for the money I had, was almost exhausted. I looked about me at the hillside, with children playing and girls watching them, and tried to think of all the fantastic advantages an invisible man would have in the world. After a time I crawled home, took some food and a strong dose of strychnine, and I went to sleep in my clothes on my unmade bed. Strychnine's a grand tonic camp to take to take the flabbiness out of a man. It's the devil, said Kemp. It's the Paleolithic in a bottle. Well, I awoke vastly invigorated and rather irritable, you know. I know the stuff. And there was someone rapping at the door. It was my landlord with threats and inquiries an old Polish Jew in a long grey coat and greasy slippers. I'd been tormenting, the, tormenting the, a cat in the night, he was sure. The old woman's tongue had been very busy. He insisted on knowing all about it. The laws in this country against vivisection were very severe. I, he might be liable. I denied the cat, and then the vibration of the little gas engine could be felt all over the house, he said. Well, that was true, certainly. He edged round me into the room, peering about over his German silver spectacles, and a sudden dread came into my mind that he might carry away something of my secret. I tried to keep it between him and the concentrating apparatus I'd arranged, and that only made him more curious. What was I doing? Why was I always alone and secretive? Was it legal? Was it dangerous? I paid nothing but the usual rent. He had always been a most respectable house in a disrespectful... Dis his had always been a most respectable house, in a disreputable neighbourhood. Suddenly my temper gave way, and I told him to get out. He began to protest, to jabber of his right of entry. But in a moment I had him by the collar. Something ripped and he went spinning out into his own passage. I slammed and locked the door and sat down quivering. He made a fuss outside, which I disregarded, but after a time he went away. 
but this brought matters to a crisis. I did not know what he would do, nor even, nor even what he had the power to do. To move to fresh apartments would have meant delay, although I had barely twenty pounds left in the world for the most part in a bank, and I could not afford that. To vanish, that was irresistible, and then there'd be an inquiry, the sacking of my room. At the thought of the possibility of my work being exposed or interrupted at, at its very climax, I became very angry and active. I hurried out with my three books of notes, my checkbook, the tramp has them now, and directed them from the nearest post office to a house of call for letters and parcels in Great Portland Street. I tried to go out noiselessly. Coming in, I found my landlord going quietly upstairs. He'd heard the door's door close, I suppose. He would have laughed to see him jump aside on the landing as I came tearing after him. He glared at me as I went by him, and I made the house quiver with the slamming of my door. I heard him shuffling up to my floor, hesita hesitate and go down. I set to work upon my preparations forthwith. It was all done that evening and night, while I was still sitting under the sickly, drowsy influence of the drugs that decolorized blood. There came a repeated knocking at the door. It ceased. The footsteps went away and returned, and the knocking was resumed. There was an attempt to push something under the door, a blue paper. And then in a fit of irritation I rose and went and flung the door wide open. Now then, said I. It was my landlord, with a notice of ejectment or something. He held it out to me, saw something odd about my hands, I expect, and he lifted his eyes to my face. For a moment he gaped. And then he gave a sort of inarticulate cry and dropped a candle and writ together, and went blundering down the dark passage to the stairs. I shut the door, locked it, and went to the locking glass, and then I understood his terror. My face was white, like white stone. But it was all horrible. I don't expect the suffering. A night of racking anguish, sickness, and fainting. I set my teeth, though my skin was perfectly afire, all my body afire. But I lay there like grim death. I understood now how it was how it was the cat had howled until I chloroformed it. Lucky it was lucky it, lucky it was I lived alone and untended in my room. There were times when I sobbed and groaned and talked. But I stuck to it. I became insensible and woke languid in the darkness. The pain had passed. I thought I was killing myself and I did not care. I shall never forget that dawn, and the strange horror of seeing that my hands had become as clouded glass, and watching them grow clearer and thinner as the day went by, until at last I could see the sickly disorder of my room through them. Though I closed my transparent eyelids, oh, I could see the sickly disorder of my room through them, though I closed my transparent eyelids. My limbs became glassy, the bones and arteries faded and vanished, and the little white nerves went last. I gritted my teeth and stayed there to the end. At last only the dead tips of the fingernails remained, pallid and white, and the brown stain of some acid upon my fingers. I struggled up. At first I was as inescapable as a swathed infant, stepping with limbs I could not see. I was weak and very hungry. I went and stared at nothing in my shaving glass, at nothing save where an attenuated pigment still remained behind the retina of my eyes, fainter than mist. I had to hang on the table and press my forehead against the glass. It was only by a frantic effort of will that I dragged myself back to the apparatus and completed the process. I slept during the forenoon, pulling the sheet over my eyes to shut out the light. Then about midday I was awakened again by a knocking. My strength had returned. I sat up and listened and heard a whispering. I sprang to my feet and as noiselessly as possible began to detach the connections of my apparatus and to distribute it about the room so as to destroy the suggestions of its arrangement. Presently the knocking was renewed and voices called, first my landlord's and then two others. To gain time I answered them. The invisible rag and pillow came to hand and I opened the window and pitched them out onto the cistern cover. As the window opened a heavy crash came at the door. Someone had charged it with the idea of smashing the lock, but the stout bolts I had screwed up some days before stopped him. That startled me, it made me angry. I began to tremble and do things hurriedly. I tossed together some loose paper, straw, packing paper and so forth in the middle of the room, and then I turned on the gas. Heavy blows began to rain upon the door. I could not find the matches. I beat my hands on the wall with rage. 
I turned down the gas again, stepped out of the window on the cistern cover with the su and, and very softly lowered the sash and sat down, sat down secure and invisible, but quivering with anger to watch, watch the events. They split a panel, I saw, and in another, another moment they'd broken away the staples of the bolts and stood in the open doorway. It was the landlord and his two stepsons, sturdy young men of three, three or four and twenty. Behind them fluttered the old hag of a woman from downstairs. You may imagine their astonishment to find the room em empty. One of the younger re men rushed to the window at once, flung it up, and stared out. His staring eyes and thick-lipped bearded face came a foot from my face. I was half-minded to hit his silly countenance, but I arrested my doubled fist. He stared right through me, and so did the others as they joined him. The old man went and peered under the bed, and then they all made a rush for the cupboard. They had to argue about it at length in Yiddish and Cockney English. They concluded I had not answered them, that their imagination had deceived them. A feeling of extraordinary elation took the place of my anger as I sat outside the window and watched these four people, for the old lady came in now, glancing suspiciously about her like a cat, trying to understand the riddle of my behaviour. The old man, so far as I could understand his patois, agreed with the old lady that I was a vivisectionist. The sons protested in garbled English that I was an electrician and appealed to the dynamos and radiators. They were all nervous about my arrival, although I found subsequently that they had bolted the front door. The old lady peered into the cupboard and under the bed, and one of the young men pushed up the register and stared up the chimney. One of my fellow lodgers, a costermonger who shared the opposite room with the butcher, appeared on the landing, and he was called in and told incoherent things. It occurred to me that the radiators, if they fell into the hands of some acute, well-educated person, would give me away too much. And watching my opportunity, I came into the room and tilted one of the little dynamos off its fellow, on which it was standing, and smashed both apparatus. Then, when they were trying to explain the smash, I dodged out of the room and went softly downstairs. I went into the one of the sitting rooms, and I waited until they came down, still speculating and argumentative, all a little disappointed at finding no horrors, and all a little puzzled how they stood legally towards me. And then I slipped up again with a box of matches. I fired my heap of paper and rubbish, put the chairs and bedding thereby, led the gas to the affair, and by means of an India rubber tube, and waving a fa farewell to the room, I left it for the last time. You fired the house, exclaimed Kemp. I fired the house. It was the only way to cover my trail, and no doubt it was insured. I slipped the bolt to the front door quietly and went out into the street. I was invisible, and I was only just beginning to realise the extraordinary advantage of the, my invisibility gave me. My head was already teeming with plans of all the wild and wonderful things I now had impunity to do. It's the end of chapter 20. Chapter 21. In Oxford Street. In going downstairs the first time, I found an unexpected difficulty, because I could not see my feet. Indeed, I stumbled twice and there was an unaccustomed clumsiness in gripping the bolt. By not looking down, however, I managed to walk on the level passably well. My mood, I say, was one of exaltation. I felt, a, felt as a seeing man might do, with padded feet and noiseless clothes, in a city of the blind. I experienced a wild impulse to jest, to startle people, to clap men on the back and fling people's hats astray, generally revel in my extraordinary advantage. But hardly had I emerged upon Great Portland Street, however, my lodging was very close to the big draper's shop there, when I heard a clashing conclusion, nope, a clashing concussion, and was hit violently behind, and turning saw a man carrying a basket of soda water siphons, and looking in amazement at his burden. Although the blow had really hurt me, I found something so irresistible in his astonishment that I laughed aloud. The devil's in the basket, I said, and suddenly twisted it out of his hand. He let go incontinently, and I swung the whole weight into the air. But a fool of a cabman standing outside a public house made a sudden rush for this, and his extending fingers took me with excru excruciating violence under the ear. I let the, hole, I let the hole down with a smash on the cabman, and then, with shouts of the clatter of feet about me, people coming out of the shops, vehicles pulling up, I realized what I'd done for myself. Cursing my folly, I backed up against the shop window and prepared to dodge out of the confusion. In a moment, I should be wedged into a crowd and inevitably discovered. I pushed by a butcher's boy, who luckily did not, it did not turn to see the nothingness that shoved him aside, and dodged behind a cabman's four-wheeler. 
I know not what, I know not how they settled the business. I hurried straight across the road, which was happily clear, and hardly heeding which way I went, in the fright of detection the incident had given me, plunged into the afternoon throng of Oxford Street. I tried to get into the stream of people, but they were too thick for me, and in moment in a moment my heels were being trodden upon. I tucked to the gutter, the roughness of which I found painful to my feet, and forthwith the shaft of the crawling hansom dug me forcibly under the shoulder plate, and reminding me that I was already bruised severely. I staggered out of the way of the cab, avoided a perambulator by a convulsive movement, and found myself behind the hansom. A happy thought saved me, and as this drove slowly along I followed in its immediate wake, trembling and astonished at my turn of the adventure. And not only trembling, but shivering. It was a bright day in January, and I was start, stark naked, and the thin slime of mud that covered the road was freezing. Foolish as it seems to me now, I had not reckoned that, transparent or not, I was still amenable to the weather and all its consequences. And then suddenly a bright idea came into my head. I ran round and got into the cab, and so, shivering, scared, and sniffing with the first in intimations of a cold, and with the bruises in the, back, in the small of my back growing upon my attention, I drove slowly along Oxford Street and past Tottenham Court Road. My mood was as different from that in which I had sallied forth ten minutes ago as it, as it is possible to imagine. This invisibility, indeed. The one thought possessed me was, how was I to get out of the scrape I was in? We crawled past Moody's, and there was a tall woman with five or six yellow-labelled books hailed my cab, and I sprang out just in time to escape her, shaving a railway van narrowly in my flight. I made off up the road to Bloomsbury Square, intending to strike north past the museum, and so get into the quiet district. I was now cruelly... Cru I was now cruelly chilled, and the strangeness of my situation so unnerved me that I whimpered as I ran. At the northward corner of the square, a little dog ran out of the pharmaceutical society's offices, and incontinently made for me, nose down. I'd never realised it before, but the nose is to the mind of a dog what the eye is to the mind of a seeing man. Dogs perceive the scent of a man moving as men perceive his vision. This brute began barking and leaping, showing as it seemed to me only too plainly he was aware of me. I crossed Great Russell Street, glancing over my shoulder as I did so, and went some way along Montague Street before I realised what I was running towards. And then I became aware of a blare of music, and looking along the street saw a number of people advancing out of Russell Square, red shirts and the banner of the Salvation Army to the fore. Such a crowd, chanting in the roadway and scoffing on the pavement, I could not hope to penetrate. But dreading to go back farther from home again, and deciding on the spur of the moment, I ran up the wide steps of the house, facing the museum railings, and stood there until the crowd should have passed. Happily, the dog stopped at the noise of the band too, hesitated, and turned tail, running back to Bloomsbury Square again. On came the band, bawling the unconscious irony some hymn about when shall we see his face, and it seemed an interminable time to me, for the tide of the crowd washed along the pavement by me. Thud, thud, thud came the drum with a vibrating resonance, and for the moment I did not notice two urchins stopping at the railings by me. See em, said one. See what, said the other. Why them, footmarks, bare, like what you makes in mud. I looked down and saw the youngsters had stopped and were gaping at the muddy footmarks I'd left behind me up to the, up the newly whitened steps. The passing people elbowed and jostled them, but their confounded intelligence was arrested. Thud, 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 when thud shall we, when thud shall we see thud, his face, thud, thud. There's a barefoot man gone up them steps, or we don't know nothing, said one. And he ain't never come down again. And his foot was a-bleeding. The thick of the crowd had already passed. Looky there, Ted, quoth the younger of the detectives, with the sharpness of surprise in his voice, pointed straight to my feet. I looked down and saw at once the dim suggestion of their outlines, sketched in splashes of mud. For a moment I was paralysed. Why, that's rum, said the elder. Dashed rum. It's just like the ghost of a foot, ain't it? He hesitated and advanced with outstretched hand. A man pulled up short to see. A man pulled up short to see what he was catching, and then a girl. In another moment he would have touched me, so I saw what I had to do. I made a step. The boy started back with an exclamation, and with a rapid movement I swung myself over into the portico of the next house. The smaller boy was sharp-eyed enough to follow the movement, and before I was well down the steps and upon the pavement, he had recovered from his momentary astonishment and was shouting out that the feet had gone over the wall. They rushed round and saw him. Nope. 
They rushed round and saw my new footmarks flushed into, flushed into being on the lower step and upon the pavement. What's up? asked someone. Feet! Look! Feet! Running! Everybody in the road except my three pursuers was pouring along after the Salvation Army. And this blow not only impeded me, but them. This blow not only impeded me, but them. And there was an eddy of surprise and interrogation. At the cost of bowling over one young fellow, I got through, and in another moment I was rushing headlong round the circuit of Russell Square, with six or seven astonished people following my footmarks. There was no time for explanation, or else the whole host would have been after me. Twice I doubled round corners, thrice I crossed the road, and came back upon my tracks, and then as my feet grew hot and dry, the damp impressions began to fade. At last I had a breathing space, and rubbed my feet clean with my hands, and so got away altogether. The last I saw of the chase was a little group of a dozen people, perhaps, studying with an infinite perplexity a slowly drying footprint that had resulted from a puddle in Tavistock Square, a footprint as isolated and incomprehensible to them as Crusoe's solitary discovery. This running warmed me to a certain extent, and I went on with a better courage through the maze of less frequented roads that runs hereabouts. My back had now become very stiff and sore, and my tonsils were painful for the cabman's fingers, and the skin of my neck had been sc scratched by his nails. So he jabbed him in the tonsils. I see. I was like, he got his fingers in his mouth? What? My tonsils were sore from the cabman's fingers, and the skin of my neck had been scratched, scratched by his nails. My feet hurt exceedingly, and I was lame from a little cut on one foot. I saw in time a blind man approaching me, and fled limping, for I feared his subtle intuitions. Once or twice accidental collisions occurred, and I left people amazed, with unaccountable curses ringing in their ears. And then some, came something silent and quiet against my face, and across the square fell a thin veil of slowly falling flakes of snow. I'd caught a cold, and do as I would, I could not avoid an occasional sneeze. And every dog that came in sight, with its po pointing nose and curious sniffing, was a terror to me. And then came men and boys running, first one and then others, and shouting as they ran. It was a fire. They ran in the direction of my lodging and looked back down a street. Looking back down a street, I saw a mass of black smoke streaming up above the roofs and telephone wires. It was my lodging burning, my clothes, my apparatus, all of my resources indeed, except for my checkbook and the three volumes of memoranda that awaited me in Great Portland Street. Were there? Burning. I had burnt all my boats, if ever a man did. The place was blazing. The invisible man paused and thought. Kemp glanced nervously out of the window. Yes, he said. Go on. That's the end of chapter one. Chapter twenty-two. In the Emporium. So last January, with the beginning of a snowstorm in the air about me, and it was, and if it settled on me, it would betray me. Weary, cold, painful, inexpressibly wretched, and still but half convinced of my invisible quality, I began this new life to which I've, I'm now committed. I had no refuge, no appliances, no human being in the world in whom I could confide. To have told the seek, to have told my secret would have given me away, and made me a mere show and rarity of me. Nevertheless, I was half-minded to accost some passer-by and throw myself upon his mercy, but I knew too clearly knew too clearly the terror and brutal cruelty my advances would evoke. I had made no plans in the street. My sole object was to get shelter from the snow, to get myself covered and warm, and then I might hope to plan. But even to me, an invisible man, the, rows, the rows of London houses looked latched, barred, and bolted impregnably. Only one thing I could clearly see before me, the cold exposure and misery of the snowstorm and the night. And then I had a brilliant idea. I turned down one of the roads leading from Gower Street to Tottenham Court Road, and found myself outside Omniums, a big establishment where everything is to be bought. You know the place. Meat, grocery, linen, furniture, clothing, uh, oil paintings even. A huge meandering collection of shops, rather than a shop. I had thought I should find the doors open, but they were closed. And as I stood in the wide entrance, a carriage stopped outside, and a man in uniform, you know, the kind of personage with omni omnium on his cap, flung open the door. I contrived to enter, and walking down the shop, 
It was a department where they were selling ribbons and gloves and stockings, that kind of thing. I came to a more spacious region, devoted to picnic blankets and wicker furniture. I didn't feel safe there, however. People were going to and fro. I prowled restlessly, and, uh, prowled restlessly about until I came upon a huge section in an upper floor, containing multitudes of bedsteads. And over these I clambered and found a resting place at last among a huge pile of folded flock mattresses. The place was already lit up and agreeably warm, and I decided to remain where I was, where I was, keeping a cautious eye on the two or three sets of shopmen and customers who were meandering through the place until closing time came. And then I should be able, I thought, to rob the place for food and clothing, and disguised, prowl through it and examine its resources, perhaps sleep on some of the bedding. That seemed like an acceptable plan. My idea was to procure clothing to make myself a muffled but acceptable figure, to get money, and then to recover my books and parcels where they awaited me, to take a lodging somewhere, and then elaborate plans for the uh, complete realisation of the advantages my invisibility gave me, as I still imagined, over my fellow man. Closing time arrived quickly enough. It could not have been more than an hour after. It could not have been more than an hour after I took up my position on the mattress before I noticed the blinds, the windows being drawn, and customers being marched doorward. And then a no number of brisk young men began, with remarkable alacrity, to tidy up the goods that remained disturbed. I left my lair as the crowds diminished and prowled cautiously out into the, desolate, the less desolate parts of the shop. I was really surprised to observe how rapidly the young men and women whipped away the goods displayed for sale during the day. All the boxes of goods, the hanging fabrics, the festoons of lace, the boxes of sweets in the grocery section, uh, the displays of this and that, were being whipped down and folded up and slapped into tidy receptacles. Everything that could not be taken down and put away had sheets of some coarse stuff like sacking flung over them. And finally all of the chairs were turned up onto the counters, leaving the floor clear. Directly each of these young men and... Uh, Directly each of these young people had done, he or she made promptly for the door with such an expression of animation as I've rarely observed in a shop assistant before. And then came a lot of youngsters scattering sawdust and carrying pails and brooms. I had to dodge to get out of the way, and as it was, my ankle got stung with the sawdust. For some time, wandering through the swathed and darkened departments, I could hear the brooms at work. And at last, a good hour or more after the shop had been closed, came a no noise of locking doors. Silence came upon the place, and I found myself wandering through the vast and intricate shops and galleries, showrooms of the place alone. It was very still. In one place, I remember passing near one of the Tottenham Court Road entrances and listening to the tapping of boot heels of the passers-by. My first visit was to the place where, they, where I'd seen stockings and gloves for sale. It was dark, and I had the devil of a hunt after matches, which I found at last in the drawer on the little cash desk. And then I had to get a candle. I had to tear down wrappings and ransack a number of boxes and drawers, but at last I managed to turn out what I th what I sought. A box label called them lamb's wool, lamb's wool pants and lamb's wool vests. And then socks, a thick comforter. And then I went to a clothing place and got trousers. I got a lounge jacket, an overcoat and a slouch hat. A clerical sort of hat with the brim turned down. I began to feel a human being again, and my next thought was of food. Strange that he went for gloves before pants. You know, that's just, I mean, to each his own, I guess. But, you know, I probably would have gone for pants first. Up, upstairs was a refreshment department, and there I got cold meat. There was coffee still in the urn, and I lit the gas and warmed it up again. And although I did not do badly, and altogether I did not do badly. Afterwards, prowling through the place in search of blankets, I had to put up at last with a heap of down, a heap of down quilts. I came upon, upon a grocery section with a lot of chocolate and candied fruits, more than was good for me indeed, and some white burgundy. White burgundy. It's a bit of an ox oxymoron. And near that was a toy department, and I had a brilliant idea. I was going to play with all the Lego. I found some artificial noses, dummy noses, you know, and I thought of dark spectacles, but Omnians had no op optical department. My nose had been a difficulty indeed. I'd thought of paint, but the difficulty set my mind running on wigs and masks and the like. But the discovery set my mind running on wigs and masks and the like. Finally, I went to sleep in a heap of down quilts, very warm and comfortable. My last thoughts before sleeping were the most agreeable I had I'd had since the change. I was in a state of physical serenity, and that was reflected in my mind. 
I thought that I should be able to slip out unobserved in the morning with my clothes upon me, muffling my face with a white wrapper I had taken, purchased with the money I had taken, spectacles and so forth, and so complete my disguise. I lapsed into disorderly dreams of all the fantastic things that had happened during the last few days. I saw the ugly little Jew of a landlord vociferating in his rooms. I saw his two sons marvelling, and the wrinkled old woman's gnarled face as she asked for her cat. I experienced again the strange sensation of seeing the cloth disappear, and so I came round to the windy hillside and the sniffing old clergyman mumbling, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, at my father's open grave. You also, said a voice, and suddenly I was being forced towards the grave. I struggled and shouted and appealed to the mourners, but they continued stonily following the service. The old clergyman, too, never faltered, droning and sniffing through the ritual. I realised I was invisible and inaudible, that overwhelming forces had their grip on me. I struggled in vain and I was forced over the brink. The coffin rang hollow as I fell upon it, and the, and the gravel came flying after me in spadefuls. Nobody heeded me, nobody was aware of me. I made convulsive struggles and then I awoke. The pale London dawn had come. The place was full of chilly grey light that filtered round the edges of the window blinds. I sat up, and for, for a time I could not think where this ample apartment with its counters, its pile of rolled stuff, its heap of quilts and cushions, its iron pillars might be. And then as recollection came back to me, I heard voices in conversation. Far down the place, in the brighter light of some department which had already raised its blinds, I saw two men approaching. I scrambled to my feet, looking about me for some way of escape, and even as I did so, the sound of my movement made them aware of me. I suppose they saw merely a figure moving quietly and quickly away. "'Who's that?' cried one. "'And stop there!' shouted the other. I dashed around a corner and came full tilt, a faceless figure, mind you, on a lanky lad of fifteen. He yelled and I bowled him over. I rushed past him and turned another corner. By a happy inspiration, threw myself behind a counter. In another moment, feet went running past and I heard voices shouting, "'All hands to the doors!' asking what was up and giving one another advice on how to catch me. Lying on the ground, I felt scared out of my wits, but odd as it may seem, it did not occur to me at the moment to take off my clothes as, it, as I should have done. I had made up my mind, I suppose, to get away in them, and that ruled me. And then down the vista of the counters came a bawling of, Here he is! I sprang to my feet, I whipped a chair off the counter and sent it whirling at the fool who'd shouted. And then I turned and came, in, came into another round, a corner, sent him, sprint, sent him spinning, and rushed up the stairs. He kept his footing, gave a view, a view hollow, and gave a view hollow, and came up the staircase hot after me. Up the staircase were piled a multitude of those bright-coloured pot things. Um, what are they? Art pots, suggested Kemp. Yeah, that's it, art pots. Well, I turned at the top step and swung round, plucked one out of a pile and smashed it on his silly head as he came at me. A whole pile of pots went headlong and I heard shouting and footsteps running from all parts. I made a mad rush for the refreshment place and there was a man in white like a, like a man-cook who took up the chase. I made one, de uh, one last desperate turn and found myself among lamps and ironmongery. I went behind the counter of this and waited for my cook as he bolted in at the head of the chase. I doubled him up with a lamp and down he went. Then I crouched down behind the counter and began whipping off my clothes as fast as I could. Coat, jacket, trousers, shoes, they were all, uh, they were all right, but a lamb's wool vest fits, like, fits a man like a skin. I heard more men coming, and my cook was lying quiet on the other side of the counter, stunned or scared speechless, and I had to make another dash for it, like a rabbit hunted out of woodpile. This way, policeman! I heard someone shouting. I found myself in the bedstead storeroom again, and at the end of a wilderness of wardrobes. I rushed among them, I went flat, and I got rid of my vest after infinite wriggling, and I stood a free man again, panting and scared as the policeman and the three of the shopmen came round the corner. They made a rush for the vest and pants and collared the trousers. "'He's dropping his plunder,' said one of the men. "'He must be somewhere here.' But they did not find me all the same. I stood watching them hunt for me for a time, and cursing my ill luck and losing the clothes. And then I went into the refreshment room, drank, drank a little milk I found there, and sat down by the fire to consider my position. In a little while, two assistants came in and began to talk over the business very excitedly and like the fools they were, I heard a magnified account of my de depredations and other speculations as to my whereabouts. And then I fell to scheming again. 
The insurmountable difficulty of the place, especially now it was alarmed, was to get any plunder out of it. I went down into the warehouse to see if there was any chance of packing and addressing a parcel, but I could not understand the system of checking. About eleven o'clock, the snow having thawed as it fell, and the day being finer and a little warmer than the previous one, I decided that the Emporium was hopeless, and I went out again, exasperated at my want of success, with only the vaguest plans of action in my mind. It's the end of chapter 22. Chapter 23, in Drury Lane. But now you begin to realise, said the Invisible Man, the full disadvantage of my condition. I had no shelter, no covering. To get clothing was to forego all my advantage, and to make myself a strange and terrible thing. And I was fasting, for to eat, to fill myself with unassimilated matter, would be to become grotesquely visible again. Oh, I never thought of that, said Kemp. Just FYI, this most recent D&D was the best. Thank you, uh, Billy Jean, for saying so. I never thought of that, said Kemp. Nor had I, and the snow had warned me of other dangers. I could not go abroad in snow. It would settle on me and expose me. Rain, too, would make me a watery outliner, a glistening, a glistening surface of a man, a bubble. And fog, <laughs> well, I should be like... I should be like a fainter bubble in a fog, a surface, a greasy glimmer of humanity. Moreover, as I went abroad in the London air, I gathered dirt about my ankles, floating smuts and dust upon my skin. I did not know how long it would be before I should become visible from that cause also, but I saw, I saw clearly that I could not be for long, not in London at any rate. I went into the slums towards Great Portland Street, and found myself at the end of the street in which I had lodged. I did not go that way because of, because of the crowd halfway down it opposite to the still-smoking ruins of the house I'd fired. My most immediate problem was to get clothing. What to do with my face puzzled me. And then I saw it in one of those little miscellaneous shops. News, news sweets, toys, uh, stationery, and belated Christmas tomfoolery and so forth. There was an array of masks and noses. I realized that problem was solved. In a flash I saw my course. I turned about, no longer aimless, and went, circuitously, in order to avoid the busy ways, towards the back streets north of the Strand, for I remembered, though not very distinctly where, that some theatrical costumiers had shops in that district. The day was cold, with a nipping wind down the northward running streets. I walked fast to avoid being overtaken. Every crossing was a danger, every passenger a thing to watch alertly. One man, as I was about to pass him at the top of Bedford Street, turned upon me abruptly and came into me, sending me into the road and almost under the wheel of a passing hansom. The verdict of the cab rank was that he had had some sort of stroke. I was so unnerved by this, unnerved by this encounter that I went into Covent Garden Market and sat down for some time in a quiet corner by a stall of violets, panting and trembling. I found I'd caught a fresh cold, and had to turn out after, the, after a time, lest my sneezes should attract attention. At last I reached the object of my quest, a dirty, fly-brown little shop in a byway near Drury Lane, with a window full of tinsel robes, sham jewels, wigs and slippers and dominoes and, and theatrical photographs. The shop, shop was old-fashioned and low and dark, and the house rose above it for four stories, dark and dismal. I peered through a window, and seeing no one within, I entered. The opening of the door set a clanking bell ringing. I left it open, and walked round a bare costume stand, into a corner behind a shovel glass. For a minute or so, no one came, and then I heard heavy feet striding across the room, and a man appeared down the shop. My plans were now perfectly definite. I proposed to make my way into the house, secrete myself upstairs, watch my opportunity, and when everything was quiet, rummage, rummage out a wig, mask, spectacles, and costume, and go out into the world, perhaps a grotesque but still credible figure. And incidentally, of course, I could rob the house of any available money. The man who had just taken, the man who had just entered the shop was a short, slight, hunched, beetle-browed man, with, a, with long arms and very bandy legs. Apparently I had interrupted a meal, he stared about the shop with an expression of expectation. This gave way to surprise, and then to anger as he, sh he saw the shop empty. Damn the boys, he said, 
and he went to stare up and down the street. He came in again in a minute. He kicked the door with his foot, too, spitefully, and went muttering back to the house door. I came forward to follow him, and at the noise of my movement he stopped dead. I did so, too, startled by his quickness of ear. He slammed the house door in my face. I stood hesitating. Suddenly I heard his quick footsteps returning, and the door reopened. He stood looking out at the, about the shop like one who was still not satisfied, and then murmuring to himself, he examined the back of the counter and peered behind some fixtures, and he stood doubtful. He'd left the house door open, and I slipped into the inner room. It was a queer little room, poorly furnished, with a number of big masks on the corner. On the table was his belated breakfast, and it was a confoundedly exasperating thing for me, to have to sniff his coffee and stand watching while he came in and resumed his meal. And his table manners were irritating. Three doors opened into the little room, one going upstairs, one down, but they were all shut. I could not get out of the room while he was there, and I could scarcely move because of his alertness. And there was a draught down my back. Twice I strangled a sneeze just in time. The spectacular quality of my sensations was curious and novel, but for all that I was heartily tired and angry long before he'd done eating. But at last he made his end and put his beggarly, beggarly crockery on the black tin tray upon which he had had his teapot, and gathering all the crumbs upon the mustard-stained cloth, he took the whole lot of things after him. His burden prevented, me shut, prevented his shutting the door behind him as he would have done. I never saw such a man for shutting doors and I followed him into a dirty underground kitchen and scullery. I had the pleasure of seeing him begin to wash up, and then finding no good in keeping down there, and the brick floor being cold on my feet, I returned upstairs and sat in his chair by the fire. It was, it was burning low, and scarcely thinking I put on a little coal. The noise of this brought him up at once, and he stood aglare. He peered about the room and was within an ace of touching me. Even after that examination, he scarcely seemed satisfied. He stopped in the doorway and took a final inspection before he went down. I waited in the little parlour for an age, and at last he came up and opened the upstairs door. I just managed to get by him. On the staircase, he stopped suddenly, and so that I, and so that I very nearly blundered into him. He stood looking back straight into my face and listening. I could have sworn, he said. His long, hairy hands pulled at his lower lip. That was his upper lip. I could have sworn, he said. His eye went up and down the staircase, and then he grunted and went on again. His hand was on the handle of a door, and then he stopped again with the same puzzled anger on his face. He was becoming aware of the faint sounds of my movements about him. The man must have had diabolically acute hearing. He suddenly flashed into rage. If there's anyone in this house, he cried with an oath, and then left the threat unfinished. He put his hand into his pocket, failed to find what he wanted, but rushed past me went, uh, and went blundering noiseless, noiselessly. Rushing past me, he went blundering noisily and pug pugnaciously downstairs. I did not follow him. I sat on the head of the staircase until his return. But presently he came up again, still muttering, and opened the door of the room, and before I could enter, slammed it in my face. I resolved to explore the house, and spent some time in doing so as noises, noiselessly as possible. The house was very cold, uh, very old, and tumble down, damp so that the paper in the attics was peeling from the walls, and it was rat-infested. Some, some of the door handles were stiff, and I was afraid to turn them. Several rooms I did inspect were unfurnished and others were littered with theatrical lumber, bought second-hand, I judged from experience. In one room next to his, I found a lot of old clothes. I began routing, rout, uh, rooting among these, and in my eagerness forgot again the evident sharpness of his ears. I heard a stealthy footstep, and looking up just in time, saw him peering in the tumble, tumbled heap and holding an old-fashioned revolver in his hand. I stood perfectly still while he stared about, an op about open-mouthed and suspicious. It must have been her, he said slowly. Damn her. And then he shut the door quietly, and immediately I heard the key turn in the lock, and then his footsteps retreated. I realized abrupt abruptly that I was locked in. For a minute I did not know what to do. 
I walked from door to window and back, and stood perplexed. A gust of, a gust of anger came upon me, but I decided to inspect the clothes before I did anything further, and my first attempt brought down a pile from an upper shelf. This brought him back more sinister than ever. This time, he actually touched me. He jumped back with amaz amazement and stood astonished in the middle of the room. Presently, he calmed a little. Rats, he said in an undertone, fingers on lips. He was evidently a little bit scared. I edged quietly out of the room, but a plank creaked. And then the infernal little brutes started going off all around the house, revolver in hand, locking door after door and pocketing the keys. And when I realised what he was up to, I had a fit of rage. I could hardly control myself sufficiently to watch my opportunity. By this time I knew I, I knew he was alone in the house, and so I made no more ado, but I knocked him on the head. You knocked him on the head? exclaimed Kemp. Yes, I stunned him. As he was going downstairs, I hit him from behind with a stool, the stool that stood on the landing. He went downstairs like a bag of old boots. But, I say, the common conventions of humanity are all very well for common people. But the point was, Kemp, that I had to get out of that house in a disguise without his seeing me. I couldn't think of any other way of doing it. And so I gagged him with a Louis, C Louis Couture's vest and tied him up in a sheet. You tied him in a sheet? I made a sort of bag of it. It was a rather good idea to keep the idiot scared and quiet, and a devilish hard thing to get out of, head away, head away from the string. My dear Kemp, it's no good you're sitting glaring at me as though I was a murderer. It had to be done. He had his re revolver. If once he saw me, he would have been able to describe me. But still, said Kemp, in England, today, and this man was in his own house, and you were, well, robbing him. Robbing? Confound it! You call me a thief next! Surely, Kemp, you're not fool enough to dance on the old strings. Can't you see my position? And his, too, said Kemp. The invisible man stood up sharply. What do you mean to say? Kemp's face grew a little, tr uh, a trifle hard. He was about to speak, and then checked himself. I, s I suppose, after all, he said with a sudden change of manner, the thing had to be done. You were in a fix. But still, of course I was in a fix, an infernal fix. And he made me go wild, too, hunting me about the house, fooling about with his revolver, locking and unlocking doors. He was simply exasperating. You don't blame me, do you? You don't blame me. I never blame anyone, said Kemp. It's quite out of fashion. What did you do next? Well, I was hungry. So downstairs I found a loaf and some rank cheese, more than suffi sufficient to satisfy the hunger. I took some brandy and water, and then went back up past my impromptu bag. He was lying quite still, to the room containing the old clothes. This looked out upon a street, two lace curtains blown with dirt guarding the window. I went and peered out through their interstices. Outside the day was bright, by contrast with the, the brown shadows of the dismal house in which I found myself dazzlingly bright. A brisk traffic was <laughs> a brisk traffic was going by. Fruit carts, a handsome a, a four wheeler with a pile of boxes, and a fishmonger's cart. I turned with spots of colour swimming before my eyes to the shadowy fixtures behind me. My excitement was giving place to a clear ap apprehension of my position again. The room was full of faint scent of benzoline, I, I suppose, used in cleaning the garments. I began a systematic search of the place. I should judge the hunchback had been alone in the house for some time. He was a curious person. Everything that could possibly be of service to me, I collected in the clothes storeroom. And then I made a deliberate selection. I found a handbag, I thought a suitable possession, and some powdered rouge, and a sticking plaster. I thought of painting and powdering my face, and all that, all that there was to show of me, in order to render myself visible. But the advantage of this lay in the fact that I should be, I should require turpentine and other appliances, and a considerable amount of time before I could vanish, vanish again. Finally, I chose a mask of the better type, slightly grotesque, but no more so than any human beings. Dark glasses, greyish whiskers, and a wig. I could find no underclothing, but that I could buy subsequently, for and for the time I swathed myself in calico dominoes and some white cashmere scarves. I could find no socks, but the hunchback's boots were rather a loose fit and sufficed. 
in, in a desk in the shop with three sovereigns and about 30 shillings worth of silver. And in a, in a locked up cupboard, I, I, in a locked cupboard I burst in the inner room were eight pounds in gold. I could go forth into the world again equipped. And then came a curious hesitation. Was my appearance really credible? I tried myself with a little bedroom looking glass, inspecting myself from every point of view to discover any forgotten cl uh, any forgotten chink, but it all seemed sound. I was grotesque to the theatrical pitch, a stage miser, but I was certainly not a physical impossibility. Gathering confidence, I took my looking glass down to the shop, pulled down the shop blinds and surveyed myself from every point of view with it, with the help of a shovel glass in the corner. I spent some minutes screwing up my courage and then unlocked the shop door and marched out into the street, leaving the little man to get out of his sheet again when he liked. In five minutes, a dozen turnings intervened between me and the costumier's shop. No one appeared to notice me very pointedly. My, my last difficulty seemed overcome. But then he stopped again. And you troubled no more about the hunchback, said Kemp. No, said the invisible man. Nor have I heard what became of him. I suppose he untied himself or kicked himself out. The knots are pretty tight. He became silent and went to the window and stared out. What happened when you went out into the Strand? Oh, disillusionment again. I thought my troubles were over. I thought my troubles were over. Practically, I thought I had impunity to do whatever I chose. Everything save to give away my secret. So I thought. Whatever I did, whatever the consequences might be, was nothing to me. I had merely to fling myself in my, uh, aside my garments. I had merely to fling aside my garments and vanish. No person could hold me. I could take my money where I found it. I decided to treat, treat myself to a sumptuous feast, and then put up at a good, good hotel and a con. A, 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 Robert. I decided to treat myself to a sumptuous feast and then put up, put up at a good hotel and accumulate a new outfit of property. I felt amazingly confident. It's not particularly pleasant recalling that I was an ass. I went into a place that I was already ordering lunch when it occurred to me that I could not eat unless I exposed my invisible face. I finished ordering the lunch, told the man I should be back in ten minutes, and went out exasperated. I don't know if you have ever been disappointed in your appetite. Not quite so badly, said Kemp, but I can imagine it. I could have smashed the silly devils. At last, faint with the desire for tasteful food, I went into another place and demanded a private room. I am dis I'm disfigured, I said, badly. They looked at me curiously, but of course it was not their affair, and so at last I got my lunch. It was not particularly well served, but it sufficed. And when, I had, when I'd had it, I sat over a cigar, trying to plan the line, line of action. And outside, a snowstorm was beginning. The more I thought it over, Kemp, the more I realized what a helpless absurdity an invisible man was, in a cold and dirty climate and a crowded civilized city. Before, this, before I made this mad experiment, I had dreamt of a thousand advantages. That afternoon, it all seemed so disappointment. No, oh, in that afternoon, it seemed all disappointment. I went over the heads of the things a man reckons desirable. No doubt invisibility made it possible to get them, but it made it impossible to enjoy them when they are got. Ambition. What is the good of pride of place when you cannot appear there? What is the good of the love of a woman when her name must be Delia, Delilah? I don't understand that reference. Why does her name need to be Delilah? Delilah's a biblical reference, isn't it, I think? What is the good of a good of the love of, of a woman? What is the good of a love of a woman? It's like a tongue twister, that. The good of a love of a woman. What is the good of good of a love of a woman when her name must must needs be Delilah? I have no taste for politics, for the black guardisms of fame, for philanthropy, or for sport. So what was I to do? And for this I'd become a wrapped-up mystery, a swathed and bandaged caricature of a man. This is a long chapter. He paused. His attitude suggested a roving glance at the window. 
But how did you get to Ipping? said Kemp, anxious to hear his guest busy talking. Well, I went there to work. I had one hope. It was a half idea, and I have it still. It is a full-blown idea now. A way of getting back, of restoring what I've done. When I choose. When I've done all I mean to do invisibly. And that's what I chiefly want to talk to you about now. You went straight to Ipping? Delilah's the one who tricked Samson into cutting off his hair. But then why... What 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 reference does that have now? I don't understand the uh, significance. You went straight to Ipping? Yes, I had to simply get my three volumes of memoranda and my checkbook, my luggage and my underclothing. Order a quantity of chemicals to work out this idea of mine. I'll show you the uh, calculations as soon as I get my books. And then I started. Jove, I remember the sto snowstorm now, and the accursed bother it was to keep the snow from damping my paste pasteboard nose. At the end, said Kemp, the day before yesterday, when you found out, you rather, uh, to judge by the papers, yes, I did. Rather. Did I, um... Did I kill that fool of a constable? No, said Kemp, he's expected to recover. Well, that's his luck, then. I just clean lost my temper. The fools. Why couldn't they leave me alone? And that grosser lout. There are no deaths expected, said Kemp. Well, I don't know about that tramp of mine, said the invisible man with an unpleasant laugh. By heaven, Kemp. You don't know what rage... Wait, no. Why does it start a new paragraph if it's not a new character? I don't know about that tramp. I, I don't know about that tramp of mine," said the invisible man with an unpleasant laugh. "By heaven, Kemp! By heaven, Kemp! You don't know what rage is, to have worked for years, to have planned and plotted, and then to get some fumbling, purblind, uh, purblind idiot messing across your course. Every conceivable sort of silly creature that has ever been created has been sent across me. I, if I have much more of it, I shall go wild. It's the same guy again. Why is it keeping changing paragraphs?" Same guy. Stop starting a new quotation. Every conceivable sort of silly creature that has ever been created has been sent to cross me. If I have much more of it, I shall, I shall go blind. I shall go wild. I shall start mowing them. As it is, they've made things a thousand times more difficult. Yes, well, no doubt it's exasperating, said Kemp dryly. And that's the end of chapter three. Chapter 24, The Plan That Failed. But now, said Kemp, with a side glance out of the window, what are we to do? He moved nearer his guest as he spoke in such a manner. Uh, he spoke in such a manner as to prevent the possibility of a sudden glimpse of the three men who were advancing up the hill road, with an intolerable slowness as it seemed to Kemp. What were you planning to do when you were heading for Port Burdock? Had you any plan? I was going to clear out of the country. But I've altered that plan, rather, since seeing you. I thought it would be wise, now the weather is hot and invisibility possible, to make for the south. Especially as my secret was known, and everyone would be on the lookout for a masked and muffled man. You have a line of steamers from here to France. My idea was to get aboard one and run the risks of passage. Thence I could go by train into Spain, or else get to Algiers. It would not be difficult. There a man might always be invisible, and yet live, and do things. I was using that tramp as a money box and lug luggage carrier until I decided how to get my books and things sent over to meet me. Well, that's clear. And then the filthy brute must needs try and rob me. He has hidden my books, Kemp. He's hidden my books. If I can lay my hands on him... Best plan to get the books out of him first. But where is he, do you know? He's in the town police station, locked up by his own request, in the strongest cell in the place. Kerr, said the invisible man. But that hangs up your plans a little. We must get those books. Those books are vital. Oh, well, certainly, said Kemp, a little nervously, wondering if he heard her footsteps outside. Certainly we must get those books, but that won't be difficult if he doesn't know they're for you. No, said the invisible man and thought. Kemp tried to think of something to keep the talk going, but the invisible man resumed of his own accord. 
Blundering into your house, Kemp, he said, changes all my plans. For you are a man that can understand. In spite of all that's happened, in spite of all this publicity, of the loss of my books, of what I've suffered, there still remain great possibilities, huge possibilities. You... you have told no one I'm here, he, he asked abruptly. Kemp hesitated. That was implied, he said. No one, insist, insisted Griffin. Griffin is the name of the Invisible Man. Not a soul. Ah, now. The Invisible Man stood up and, sticking his arms akimbo, began to pace the study. I made a, I made a mistake, Kemp. A huge mistake in carrying this thing through alone. I've wasted strength, time, opportunities. Alone. It's wonderful how little a man can do alone. To rob a little, to hurt a little, and there's an end. What I want, Kemp, is a goalkeeper, a helper, and a hiding place. An arrangement where I, whereby I can sleep and eat and rest in peace and unsuspected. I must have a confederate. With a confederate, with food and rest, a thousand things are possible. Hitherto I've gone on vague lines. We have to consider all that invisibility means, all that it does not mean. It means little advantage for eavesdropping and so forth. One makes sounds. It's of little help, a little help perhaps, in housebreaking and so forth. Once you've caught me, you could easily imprison me. But on the other hand, I am hard to catch. This invisibility, in fact, is only good in two cases. It's, it's useful in getting away, and it's useful in approaching. It's particularly useful, therefore, in killing. I can walk round a man, whatever weapon he has, choose my point, and strike as I like. Dodge as I like, and escape as I like. Kemp's hand went to his moustache. Was that a movement downstairs? It is killing we must do, Kemp. It is killing we must do, repeated Kemp. I'm listening to your plan, Griffin, but I'm not agreeing, mind. Why killing? Not wanton killing, but a judicious slaying. The point is, they know there is an invisible man, as well as we know there is an invisible man. And that invisible man, Kemp, must now establish a reign of terror. Yes, no doubt it's startling, but I mean it. A reign of terror. He must take some town like your burdock and terrify and dominate it. He must issue his orders. He can do that in a thousand ways. Scraps of paper thrust through doors would suffice. And all who disobey, disobey his order must he must kill, and kill all who would defend them. <laughs> said Kemp, no longer listening to Griffin but the sound of his front door opening and closing. It uh, seems to me, Griffin, he said to cover his wandering attention, that your confederate would be in a difficult position. No one would know he was a confederate, said the invisible man eagerly. And then suddenly, Hush! What's that downstairs? What? Nothing, said Kemp, and suddenly began to speak loud and fast. I don't agree to this, Griffin, he said. Understand me, I don't agree to this. Why dream of playing this game against the race? How can you hope to gain hum happiness? Don't be a lone wolf. You need to publish your results and take to the world. Take the nation at, la at, at least into your confidence. Think what you might do with a million helpers. The invisible man interrupted, arm extended. There are footsteps coming upstairs, he said in a low voice. Nonsense, said Kemp. Let me see, said the invisible man, and advanced, arm extended to the door. And then things happened very swiftly. Kemp hesitated for a second, and then moved to intercept him. The invisible man started and stood still. Traitor, cried the voice, and suddenly the dressing gown opened, and sitting down the unseen, sitting down the unseen, began to disrobe. Kemp made three swift steps to the door, and forthwith the invisible man, his legs had vanished, sprang to his feet with a shout. Kemp flung the door open. As it opened, there came a sound of hurrying feet downstairs and voices. With a quick, mo quick movement, Kemp thrust the invisible man back, sprang aside, and slammed the door. The key was outside and ready. In another moment, Griffin would have been alone in the Belvedere study, a prisoner, save for one little thing. The key had been slipped in hastily that morning. As Kemp slammed the door, it fell noisily upon the carpet. Kemp's face became white. He tried to grip the door handle with both hands. For a moment he stood lugging, and then the door gave six inches, but he got it closed again. The second time it was jerked a foot wide, and the dressing gown came wedg wedging itself into the opening. His throat was gripped by invisible fingers, and, it, and he left his hold on the handle to defend himself. 
He was forced back, tripped and pitched heavily on the corner of the landing. The empty dressing gown was flung on top of him. Halfway up the stairs was staircase was Colonel Ad Adye, the recipient of Kemp's letter, the chief of the Burdock Police. He was staring aghast at the sudden appearance of Kemp, followed by the extraordinary sight of, of clothing tossing empty in the air. He saw Kemp felled and struggling to his feet. He saw him rush forward and go down again, again felled like an ox. And then suddenly he was struck violently by nothing. A vast weight, it seemed, leapt upon him, and he was hurled headlong down the staircase with a grip on his throat and a knee in his groin. An invisible foot trod on his back. A ghostly patter passed downstairs. He heard the two police officers in the hall shout and run, and the front door of the house slammed violently. He rolled over and sat up staring. He saw, staggering down the staircase, Kemp, dusty and dishevelled, one side of his face white from a blow, his lip bleeding in a pink dressing gown, and some underclothing held in his arms. "'My God!' cried Kemp. "'The game's up! He's gone!' And that's the end of chapter 24. Chapter 25 The Hunting of the Invisible Man For a space, Kemp was too inarticulate to make Adye understand the swift things that had just happened. They stood on the landing, Kemp speaking swiftly, the grotesque swathings of Griffin still on his arm. But presently, Adye began to grasp something of the situation. "'He's mad,' said Kemp. "'Inhuman. He is pure selfishness. He thinks of nothing but his own advantage, his own safety. I have listened to such a story this morning of brutal self-seeking. He has wounded men.' He will kill them unless we can prevent him. He will create a panic. Nothing can stop him. He's going out. He's going out now. Furious. He must be caught, said Adye. That is certain. But how? cried Kemp, and suddenly became full of ideas. You must begin at once. You must set every available man to work. You must prevent his leaving this district. Once he gets away, he may go through the countryside as he wills, killing and maiming. He dreams of a reign of terror. A reign of terror, I tell you. You must set a watch on trains and roads and shipping. Uh, the garrison must help. You must wire for help. The only thing that may keep him here is the thought of recovering some of some bucks of notes he counts of value. I'll tell you of that. Th there is a man in your police station, a marvel. Yes, I know, said Adye. I know, those books, yes. But the tramp... He says, he says he hasn't got them, yes, but he thinks the tramp has. Uh, and you must prevent him from eating or sleeping. Day and night, the country must be astir for him. Food must be locked up and secured. All food, so that he will have to break his, his way into it. Uh, the, the houses everywhere must be barred against him. Uh, heaven send us cold nights and rain. The whole countryside must begin hunting and keep hunting. I tell you, Adye, he's a danger, a disaster. Unless he's pinned and secured, it's frightful to think of the things that may happen. Well, what else can we do? said Adye. I must go down at once and begin organising. But why not come? Yes, you you should come too. Come, and we we must go uh, hold a sort of council of war. Get Hops to help, and the railway managers. By Jove, it's urgent. Uh, come along. Tell me as we go. What what uh, what else is there we can do? Put that stuff down. In another moment, Adye was leading the way downstairs. They found the front door open and the policeman standing outside, staring at empty air. He's got away, sir," said one. We must go to the central station at once said Adye. One of you uh, go on down and get a cab and come up and meet us, quickly. And now, uh, Kemp, what else was there? Uh, dogs, said Kemp. Get dogs. They don't, they, they, they don't see him, but they wind, they wind him. Uh, get, get dogs. Oh, yes, good, said Adye. It's not generally known, but the prison officials over at Halstead know a man with bloodhounds. Uh, dogs, yes. Uh, what else? Well, bear in mind, said Kemp, his food shows. After eating, his food shows until it's assimilated. Uh, so that he has to hide after eating. You must keep on beating every thicket, every quiet corner, and put all weapons, all implements that might be weapons, away. He can't carry such things for long, and what he can snatch up and strike men with must be hidden away. Yes, good again, said Adye. We shall have him yet. And and on the roads, said Kemp, and hesitated. Yes, said Adye. Put powdered glass, said Kemp. It's it's cruel, I know, but think of think of what he may do. Adye drew the air in sharply between his teeth. Oh, that's uh, unsportsmanlike. I don't know, but I'll I'll have proud, powdered glass got ready. And if he goes too far, the man's become inhuman. I tell you," said Kemp. "I'm as sure he will establish a reign of terror. 
so soon as he has got over the emotions of this escape, as I am sure I am talking to you. Our only chance is to be ahead. He has cut himself off from his kind. His blood will be upon his own head. That's the end of chapter 25. Chapter 26 is called The Wicksteed Murder. Bit of a spoiler, I'm pretty sure he's going to murder somebody. Or attempt to. The Wicksteed Murder. The Invisible Man seems to have rushed out of Kemp's house in a state of blind fury. A little child playing near Kemp's gateway was violently caught up and thrown aside so that, it, so that its ankle was broken. And thereafter, for some hours, the Invisible Man passed out of human perceptions. No one knows where he went, nor what he did, but one can imagine him hurrying through the hot June forenoon, up the hill and onto the open downland behind Port Burdock, raging and despairing at his intolerable fate, and sheltering at last, heated and weary, amid the thickets of Hin Hintondine, uh, to piece together again his shattered schemes against his species. That seems the most probable refuge for him, for there it was he reasserted himself in a grimly tragical manner about two in the afternoon. One wonders what his state of mind may have been during that time, and what plans he devised. No doubt he was almost ecstatically yes, exasperated by Tremp's, Kemp's treachery. And though we may be able to understand the motives that led to that deceit, we may still imagine and even sympathise a little with the fury he attempted to surprise. With the fury the attempted surprise must have occasioned. Perhaps something of the stunned astonishment of his Oxford Street experiences might have returned to him for he had evidently counted on Kemp's cooperation in his brutal, brutal dream of a terrorised world. At any rate, he vanished from human ken about midday, and no living witness can tell what he did until about half-past two. It was a fortunate thing, perhaps, for humanity, but for him it was a fatal inaction. During that time, a growing multitude of men scattered all over the countryside were busy. In the morning he had still been simply a legend, a terror, but in the afternoon, by virtue chiefly of Kemp's dryly worded proclamation, he was presented as a tangible antagonist, to be wounded, captured, or overcome, and the countryside began organising itself with, with inconceivable rapidity. By two o'clock even he might by two o'clock even he might still have removed himself out of the district by getting aboard a train. But after two that became impossible. Every passenger train along the lines of the great parallelogram between Southampton, Manchester, Brighton, and Horsham, travelled with locked doors, and the goods traffic was almost entirely suspended. And in a great circle of twenty miles round Port Burdock, men armed with guns and bludgeons were presently setting out in groups of three or four, with dogs, to beat the roads and fields. Mounted policemen rode along the country lanes, stopping at every cottage and warning people to lock up the houses, and keep indoors unless they were armed and all the elementary schools had broken up by three o'clock, and the children, scared and keeping together in groups, were hurrying home. Kemp's proclamation, signed indeed by Adye, was posted over almost almost the whole district by four or five o'clock in the afternoon. It gave briefly but clearly all the conditions of the str struggle, the necessity of keeping the invisible man from food and sleep, the necessity for incess incessant watchfulness, and for a prompt attention to any evidence of his movements. And so swift and decided was the action of the authorities, so prompt and universal was the belief in this strange being, that before nightfall an area of several hundred square miles was in the stringent, stringent state of siege. And before nightfall too, a thrill of horror went through the whole watching, the whole, and through a thrill of horror went through the whole watching nervous countryside. Going from whispering mouth to whispering mouth. Swift and certain over the length and breadth of the country, passed the story of the murder of Mr. Wicksteed. If our sup supposition that the invisible man's refuge was the Hinton Dean thickets, then we must suppose that in the early afternoon he sallied out again, bent upon some project that involved the use of a weapon. We cannot know what the project was, but the evidence that he had the iron rod in hand before he met Wicksteed is to me at least overwhelming. Of course we can know nothing of the details of that encounter. It occurred on the edge of a gravel pit, not two hundred yards from Lord Burdock's lodge, lodge gate. Everything points to a desperate struggle. The trampled ground, the numerous wounds Mr. Wicksteed received, his splintered walking stick. But why the attack was made, save in a f murderous frenzy, it is impossible to imagine. Indeed, the theory of madness is almost unavoidable. Mr. Wicksteed was a man of forty-five or forty-six, steward to Lord Burdock, and of inoffensive habits and appearance the very last person in the world to provoke such a terrible antagonist. Against him it would seem the invisible man used an iron rod dragged from a broken piece of fence. 
He stopped this quiet man going quietly home to his midday meal, attacked him, beat down his feeble defences, broke his arm, felled him, and smashed his head to a jelly. That's pleasant. It's interesting it's interesting how it's written sometimes as though it's told from the perspective of a particular person in the world who doesn't know information about the like like this chapter's being written as though like we don't know where the invisible man was for two hours of that day because there was no um it's it's written like it's a journalist writing about it. And then other times like the Emporium chapter, it told us exactly what the imp the invisible man was doing all night. Like he was he was rummaging around looking for clothes and things. Sometimes it's written from the perspective of the invisible man, like as he walked past the window of the shop and saw the um, saw the fake noses and the masks and thought, oh, I need I need a fake face, and then was pushed aside by a passenger and almost fell in front of a, a the wheels of a wagon. Like all of that shouldn't have been known, but it was anyway. It's written in interesting perspective. Of course, he must have dragged this rod out of the fencing before he met his victim. He must have been carrying it ready in his hand. Only two details beyond what has already been stated seem to bear on the matter. One is the circumstance that the gravel pit was not in Mr. Wicksteed's direct path home, but nearly a couple of hundred yards out of his way. The other is the assertion of a little girl to the effect that, going to her afternoon school, she saw the murdered man trotting in a peculiar manner across a field towards the gravel pit. Her pant pantomime of his action suggests a man pursuing something on the ground before him, and striking at it ever and again with his walking stick. She was the last person to see him alive. He passed out of his, her sight. He passed out of her sight to his death, the struggle being hidden from her only by a clump of beech trees and a slight depression in the ground. Now this, to the present writer's mind at least, lifts the murder out of the realm of the absolutely wanton. We may imagine that Griffin had taken the rod as a weapon indeed, but without any deliberate intention of using it in murder. Wicksteed may have then come by and noticed this rod inexplicably moving through the air. Without any thought of the invisible man, for Paul Burdock is ten miles away, he may have pursued it. It is quite conceivable that he may not have even heard of the invisible man. One can then imagine the invis invisible man making off quietly in order to avoid discovering his presence in the neighbourhood, and Wicksteed, excited and curious, pursuing this unaccountably locomotive object, finally striking at it. No doubt the invisible man could easily have distanced this middle-aged pursuer under no ordinary circumstances but the position in which Wicksteed's body was found suggests that he had the ill luck to drive his quarry into a corner between a drift of stinging nettles and the gravel pit. And those who appreciate the extraordinary ir irascibility of the invisible man, the rest of the encounter will be easy to imagine. But this is pure hypothesis. The only undeniable facts for stories of children are often unreliable. Are the discovery of Wicksteed's body, done to death, and of the blood-stained iron rod flung among the nettles, the abandonment of the rod by Griffin suggests that in the emotional excitement of the affair, the purpose f for which he took of it, if he had a purpose, was abandoned. He was certainly an intensely egotistical and unfeeling man, but the sight of his victim, his first victim, bloody and pitiful at his feet, may have released some long pent fount uh, must may have released some long pent fountain of remorse for which a time may have for which a time may have flooded whatever scheme of action he had contrived. After the murder of Mr. Wicksteed, he would seem to have struck across the country, towards the downland. There is a story of a voice heard about sunset by a couple of men in a field near Fern Bottom. It was wailing and laughing, sobbing and groaning, and ever and again it shouted. It must have been queer hearing. It drove up across the middle of a clover field and died away towards the hills. That afternoon the invisible man must have learnt something of the rapid use Kemp had made of his confidences. He must have found horses... No, nope, he must have found houses locked and secured. He may have loitered about railway stations and prowled ba about inns. No doubt he read the proclamations and realised something of the nature of the campaign against him. And as the evening advanced, the fields became dotted here and there with groups of three or four men, and noisy with the yelping of dogs. These men-hunters had particular instruction in the case of an encounter as to the way they should spot one another, but he avoided them all. We may understand something of his exas exasperation and it could have been nonetheless because he, because he himself had supplied the information that was being used so remorselessly against him. For that day, at least, he lost heart. For nearly twenty-four hours, save when he turned on Wicksteed, he was a hunted man. In the night he must have eaten and slept, for in the morning he was himself again, active, powerful, angry and malignant, prepared for his last great struggle.
last great struggle against the world. That's the end of chapter 6. Chapter 27. <clears throat> the Siege of Kemp's House. Kemp read a strange missive written in pencil on a greasy sheet of paper. You have been amazingly energetic and clever, this letter ran, though what you have to stand by it I cannot imagine. You are against me. For a whole day you have chased me. You have tried to rob me of a night's rest. But I have food in spite of you, I have slept in spite of you, and the game is only beginning. The game is only beginning. There is nothing for it but to start the terror. This announces the first day of the terror. Port Burdock is no longer under the Queen. Tell your Colonel of Police and the rest of them. It is under me, the terror. This is day, this is day one of year one of a new epoch. The epoch of the Invisible Man. I am Invisible Man the first. To begin with the rule, to begin with, the rule will be easy. The first day there will be one, ex one execution for the sake of example. A man named Kemp. Death starts for him today. He may lock himself away, hide himself away, get guards about him, put on armour if he likes. But death, the unseen death, is coming. Let him take precautions. It will impress my people. Death starts from the pillar box by midday. The letter will fall in as the postman comes along, and then off. The game begins. Death starts. Help him not, my people, lest death fall upon you too. Today, Kemp is to die. Kemp read this letter twice. It's no hoax, he said. That's, that's his voice, and he means it. He turned the fold folder sheet over, and saw on the addressed side of it the postmark Hintendeen, and the prosaic detail, two... 2D to pay, 2 pence. He got up slowly, leaving his lunch unfinished. The letter had come by one o'clock post, and went into his study. He rang for his housekeeper and told her to go round the house at once, examine all the fastenings of the windows, and close all the shutters. He closed the shutters of his, his study himself. From a locked drawer in his bedroom, he took a little revolver, examined it carefully, and put it into the pocket of his lounge jacket. He wrote a number of brief notes, one to Colonel Adye, gave them to his servant to take, with the explicit instructions as to her way of leaving the house. There is no danger, he said, and added a mental reservation, to you. He remained meditative for a space after doing this, and then returned to his cooling lunch. He ate with gaps of thought. Finally, he struck the table sharply. We have him, he said, and I am the bait. He will come too far. He went up to the Belvedere, carefully shutting every door after him. It's a game, he said. An odd game, but the chances are all for me. Mr. Griffin, in spite of your invisibility, Griffin contramundum with a vengeance. He stood at the window, staring at the hot hillside. He must get food every day, and I don't envy him. Did he really sleep last night? Out in the open somewhere, secure from collisions. I wish we could get some, some good cold wet weather instead of the heat. He may well be watching me now. He went, close, he went close to the window. Something rapped smartly against the brickwork over the frame and made him start violently back. I'm getting nervous, said Kemp. But it was five minutes before he went to the window again. It must have been a sparrow, he said. Presently he heard the front doorbell ringing and hurried downstairs. He unbolted and unlocked the door. He examined the chain, put it up, and opened cautiously without showing himself. A familiar voice hailed him. It was Adye. Your servant's been assaulted, Kemp, he said round the door. What? exclaimed Kemp. Had that note of yours taken away from her. He's close about here. Let me in. Kemp released the chain, and Adye entered through as narrow an opening as possible. He stood in the hall, looking with infinite relief at Kemp, refastening the door. Note was snatched out of her hand. It scared her horribly. She's down at the station in hysterics. He's close here. What was it about? Kemp swore. Ah, what a fool I was, said Kemp. I might have known. It's not an hour's walk from Hintendine. Already? What's up? said Adye. Well, look here, said Kemp, and he led the way into his study. He handed Adye an in the invisible man's letter, 
Adye read it and whistled softly. Oh, and you, said Adye. Proposed a trap, like a fool, said Kemp. And I sent my proposal out by a maidservant to him. Adye followed Kemp's profanity. Well, he'll clear out, said Adye. No, not he, said Kemp. A resounding smash of glass came from upstairs. Adye had a silvery glimpse of a little revolver half out of Kemp's po pocket. It's a window upstairs, said Kemp, and led the way up. There came a second smash while they were still on the staircase. When they reached the study, they found two of the three windows smashed, half the, half the room littered with splintered glass, and one big flint lying on the writing table. And then the two men stopped in the doorway, contemplating the wreckage. Kemp swore again. As he did so, the third window went with a snap like a pistol, hung, hung starred for a moment, and collapsed in jagged, silvering triangles into the room. Man, he's got a good way with words, hasn't he? The third window went snap like a pistol, hung starred for a moment, and collapsed in jagged, shivering triangles into the room. What evocative language. What's this for? said Adye. It's a beginning, said Kemp. There's no way of climbing up here. Well, not for a cat, said Kemp. Not for a cat, said Kemp. I think that's like, if not for a cat, then not for anybody else, surely. No shutters? Well, not here, no, on all the downstairs rooms. Oh, hello! <laughs> Smash, and then whack of boards hit hard came from downstairs. Oh, confound him, said Kemp. That must be... Yes, it's one of the bedrooms. He's going to do all the house. But he's a fool. The shutters are up and the glass will fall outside. He'll cut his own feet. Another window proclaimed its destruction. Wait, the shutters are on the inside of the glass. I thought shutters were, were to protect the glass. Like, you shut the, you shut the shutters and then you close the glass on the inside. I don't know. Another window proclaimed its destruction. The two men stood on the landing perplexed. I have it, I have it, said Adye. Let me have a stick or something. I'll go down to the station and get the bloodhounds put on. That ought to settle him. They're hard by, not ten minutes. Another window went the way of its fellows. You haven't a revolver? asked Adye. Kemp's hand went to his pocket, and then he hesitated. Uh, no, I haven't one. At least, not to spare. I'll bring it back, said Adye. You'll be safe here. Kemp, ashamed of his momentary lapse from truthfulness, handed him the weapon. And now for the door, said Adye. As they stood hesitating in the hall, they heard one of the first floor bedroom windows crack and clash. Kemp went to the door and began to slip the bolts as silently as possible. His face was a little paler than usual. You must step straight out, said Kemp. In, a, in, a, in another moment, Adye was on the doorstep and the bolts were dropping back into the staples. He hesitated for a moment, feeling more comfortable with his back against the door, and then he marched upright and square down the steps. He crossed the lawn and approached the gate. A little breeze seemed to ripple over the grass. Something moved near him. Stop a bit, said the voice, and Adye stopped dead to stopped dead, and his hand tightened on the revolver. Well, said Adye, white and grim and every nerve tense. Oblige me by going back to the house, he said the voice, as tense and grim as Adye's. Sorry, said Adye a little hoarsely, and moistened his lips with his tongue. The voice was on his left front, he thought. Suppose he were to take take his luck with a shot. What are you going for? said the voice, and there was a quick movement of the of the two and a flash of sunlight from the open lip of Adye's pocket. Adye desisted and thought Where I go, he said slowly, is my own business. The words were still on his lips when an arm came round his neck and uh, his back felt a knee and he was sprawling backwards. He drew clumsily and fired absurdly. In another moment, he was struck in the mouth and the revolver wrestled from his grip. He made a vain clutch at a slippery limb, tried to struggle up and fell back. Damn it, he said. The voice laughed. <laughs> I'd kill you now if it wasn't the waste of a bullet, he, it said. And he saw the revolver in midair, six feet off, covering him. Well, said Adye, sitting up. Get up, said the voice. Adye stood up. Attention, said the voice, and then fiercely, don't try any games. Remember, I can see your face and you can't see mine. You've got to go back to the house. You won't let me in, said Adye. Well, that's a pity. I've got no quarrel with you. Adye moistened his lips again. 
He glanced away from the barrel of the revolver and saw the sea far off, very blue and dark under the midday sun. The smooth green down the white cliff of the head, and the multitudinous town. And suddenly he knew that life was very sweet. His eyes came back to this little metal thing hanging between heaven and earth, six yards away. What am I to do? he said suddenly, sullenly. What am I to do? asked the invisible man. You will get help. The only thing is for you to go back. I will try. If he lets me in, will you promise not to rush the door? I've got no quarrel with you, said the voice. Kemp had hurried up, upstairs after left, letting Adye out, and now, crouching among the broken glass and peering cautiously over the edge of the st study window sill, he saw Adye standing parleying with the unseen. Why doesn't he fire? whispered Kemp to himself, and then the revolver moved a little and the glint of sunlight flashed in Kemp's eyes. He shaded his eyes and tried to see the source of the blinding beam. Surely, he said, Adye has given up the revolver. Promise not to rush the door, Adye was saying. Don't push a winning game too far. Give a man a chance. You go back to the house. I tell you flatly, I will not promise anything. Adye's decision seemed suddenly made. He turned toward the ha towards the house, walking slowly with his hands behind him. Kemp watched him, puzzled. The revolver f vanished, flashed again into sight, vanished again, and became evident on a closer scrutiny as a, da a little dark object following Adye. And then things happened very quickly. Adye leapt backwards, swung round and clutched at this little object, missed it, threw up his hands and fell forward on his face, leaving a little puff of blue in the air. Kemp did not hear the sound of the shot. Adye writhed, raised himself on one arm, fell forward and lay still. For a space, Kemp remained staring at the quiet carelessness of Adye's attitude. The afternoon was very hot and still. Nothing seemed stirring in all the world, save a couple of yellow butterflies chasing each other through the shrubbery between the house and the road gate. Adye lay down on the lawn near the gate. The blinds of all the villas round the hill road were drawn. But in one little green summer house was a white figure, apparently an old man, asleep. Kemp scrutinised the surroundings of the house for the glimpse of the revolver, but it had vanished. His eyes came back to Adye. The game was opening well. Then came a ringing and knocking at the front door. That grew at last tumultuous. But pursuant to Kemp's instructions, the servants had locked themselves into their rooms. This was followed by a silence. Kemp sat listening, and then began peering cautiously out of the three windows, one after another. He went to the staircase head and stood listening, uneasily. He armed himself with a bedroom poker, and went to examine the interior fastenings of the ground floor windows again. Everything was safe and quiet. He returned to the Belvedere. Adye lay motionless over the edge of the gravel just as he had fallen. Coming along the road by the villas were the housemaid and the two policemen. Everything was deadly still. The three people seemed to seem very slow in approaching. He wondered what his antagonist was doing. He started. There was a smash from below. He hesitated and went downstairs again. Suddenly the house resounded with heavy blows and the splintering of wood. He heard a smash and the destructive clang of the iron fastenings of the shutters. He turned the key and opened the kitchen door. As he did so, the shutters, split and splintering, came flying inwards. He stood aghast. The window frame, save for one crossbar, was still intact, but only, one, only little teeth of glass remained in the frame. The shutters had been driven in with an axe, and now the axe was descending in sweeping blows upon the window frame and the iron bars defending it, and then suddenly it leapt aside and vanished. He saw the revolver lying on the path outside, and then the little weapon sprang into the air. He dodged back. The revolver cracked just too late, and a splinter from the edge of the closing door flashed over his head. He slammed and locked the door, and as he stood outside, he heard Griffin shouting and laughing, and then the blows of the axe with its splintering and smashing consequences were, were resumed. Kemp stood in the passage, trying to think. In a moment, the invisible man would be in the kitchen. The door would not keep him a moment. And then... A ringing came at the front door again. It would be the policeman. He ran into the hall, put up the chain, and drew the bolts. He made the girl speak before he dropped the, the chain, and then the three people blundered into the house in a heap, and Kemp slammed the door again. The invisible man, said Kemp. He has a revolver with two shots left. He's killed Adye, uh, shot him anyhow. Didn't you see him on the lawn? He's lying there. Who? said one of the policemen. Adye, said Kemp. We came in the back way, said the girl. What's that smashing? asked one of the policemen. He's in the kitchen, or, or he will be. He's found an axe. Suddenly the house was full of the invisible man's resounding blows in the kitchen door. 
The girl stared towards the kitchen, shuddered, and retreated into the dining room. Kemp tried to explain in broken sentences. They heard the, t the kitchen door give way. This way, said Kemp, starting into activity and bundled the policeman into the dining room doorway. A poker, said Kemp, and rushed to the fender. And the policeman said, I hardly know her. <laughs> Sorry. Poker, said Kemp, and rushed to the fender. He handed the poker he had carried to the policeman and the dining, uh, and the dining room one to another. He, f he suddenly flung himself backwards. Whoop, said the policeman, ducked and caught the axe on his poker. The pistol snapped its penultimate shot and ripped a valuable Sydney Cooper. The second policeman brought his poker down on the little weapon, as one might knock down a wasp, and sent it rattling to the floor. At the first clash, the girl screamed, stood screaming for a moment by the fireplace, and then ran to the open shutters, possibly with an idea of escaping by shattered windows. The axe receded into the passage and fell, fell to a position about two feet from the ground. They could hear the invisible man breathing. Stand away, you two, he said. I want that man Kemp. We want you, said the first policeman, making a quick step forward and wiping with his p p poker at the voice. The invisible man must have started back, and he blundered into the umbrella stand. Then as the policeman staggered with the swing of the blow he had aimed, the invisible man countered with the axe. The helmet crumpled like paper, and the blow sent the man spinning to the floor in the head of, at the head of the kitchen stairs. But the second policeman, aiming behind the axe with his poker, hit something soft that snapped. There was a sharp exclamation of pain, and then the axe fell to the ground. The policeman swiped again at that vicinity, at that vacancy, and hit nothing. He put his foot on the axe and struck again, and then he stood, poker clubbed, listening intent for the slightest movement. He heard the dining room window open, and a quick rush of feet within. His companion rolled over and sat up, with the blood running down between his eyes and ears. Where is he? asked the man on the floor. I don't know. I've hit him. He's standing somewhere in the hall, unless he's slipped past you. Dr. Kemp, sir? Pause. Dr. Kemp! cried the policeman again. The second policeman began struggling to his feet. He stood up. Suddenly the faint pad of bare feet on the kitchen stairs could be heard. Yep! cried the f first policeman, and incontinently flung his poker. It smashed a little, uh, little gas bracket. He made as if he would pursue the invisible man downstairs, and then he thought better of it and stepped into the dining room. Dr. Kemp! he began and stopped short. Dr. Kemp, Dr. Kemp's a hero, he said, as his companion looked over his shoulder. The dining room window was wide open, and neither housemaid nor Kemp was to be seen. The second policeman's opinion of Kemp was terse and vivid. End of chapter 27. Chapter 28. The Hunter Hunted. Mr. Helas, Mr. Kemp's nearest neighbour among the villa holders, was asleep in his summer house when the siege of Kemp's house began. Mr. Helas was one of the sturdy minority who refused to believe in all this nonsense about an invisible man. His wife, however, as he was subsequently to be reminded, did. He insisted upon walking about his garden as just as if nothing was the matter, and he went to sleep in the afternoon in accordance with the custom of years. He slept through the smashing of windows, and then woke up suddenly with a curious persuasion of something wrong. He looked across at Kemp's house, rubbed his eyes, and looked again and then he put his feet to the ground and sat listening he said he was damned but the still but he said he was damned but the st still the strange thing was visible the house looked as though it had been deserted for weeks after a violent riot every window was broken and every window save those of the belvedere study was blinded by the in internal shutters i could have sworn it was all right he looked at his watch 20 minutes ago he became aware of a measured con concussion and the clash of glass far away in the distance and then, as he sat open-mouthed, came a still more wonderful thing. The shutters of the drawing-room window were flung violently open, and the housemaid, in her outdoor hat and garments, appeared struggling in a frantic manner to throw up the sash. Suddenly a man bes appeared beside her, helping her. Dr. Kemp! In another moment the window was open, and the housemaid was struggling out. She pitched forward and vanished among the shrubs. Mr. Helas stood up, exclaiming vaguely and vehemently all at all these wonderful things. He saw Kemp standing on the sill, spring from the window and reappear almost inst instantaneously running along the path in the shrubbery and stooping as he ran, like a man who evades observation. He vanished behind a laburnum and appeared again clambering over a fence that abutted the open down. In a second he had tumbled over and was running at a tremendous pace towards the slope, uh, down the slope towards Mr. Helas. Lord! cried Mr. Helas, struck with an idea. 
It's that invisible man brute. It's right after all. And with Mr. Helis to think things like that. And with Mr. Helis to think things like that was to act. And his cook watching him from the top window was amazed to see him come pelting down, uh, pelting towards the house at a good nine miles per hour. There was a slamming of doors, a ringing of bells, and the voice of Mr. Helis bellowing like a bull. Shut the doors! Shut the windows! Sh shut everything! The invisible man's coming! Instantly the house was full of screams and directions and scurrying feet. He ran himself to shut the French windows that opened on the veranda. As he did so, Kemp's head and shoulders and knee appeared over the edge of the garden fence. In another moment, Kemp had ploughed through the as asparagus and was running across the tennis lawn to the house. You can't come in, said Mr. Helis, shutting the bolts. I'm very sorry if he's after you, but you can't come in. Kemp appeared with a face of terror close to the glass, rapping and then shaking frantically at the French windows. And then seeing his efforts were useless, he ran along the veranda, vaulted the end, and went to hammer at the side door. And then he ran round the side gate to the front of the house, and so and so into the hill road. And Mr. Helis, staring from his window, a face of horror, had scarcely witnessed Kemp vanish. Ere the asparagus was being trampled this way and that by feet unseen. At that, Mr. Helis fled precipitately up precipitately upstairs, and the rest of the chase is beyond his purview. But as he passed the staircase window, he heard the side gate slam. Emerging into the hill road, Kemp naturally took the downward direction, and so it was he came to run into his own, to run his own person the very race he had watched with such a critical eye from the Belvedere study only four days ago. He ran it well, for a man out of training, and though his face was white and wet, his wits were cool to the late. His wits were cool to the last. He ran with wide strides, and wherever a patch of rough ground intervened, wherever there came a patch of raw flints, or a bit of broken glass shone dazzling, he crossed it and left the bare invisible feet that followed to take what line they would. For the first time in his life, Kemp discovered that the hill road was indescribably vast and desolate, and that the beginnings of the town far below the hill foot, the hill foot were strangely remote. Never had there been a slower or more painful method of progression than running. All the gaunt villas, sleeping in the afternoon sun, looked locked and barred. No doubt they were locked and barred, by his own orders. But at any rate, they might have kept a lookout for an eventuality like this. The town was rising up now, the sea had dropped out of sight behind it, and people down below were stirring. A tram was just arriving at the hill foot. Beyond that was the police station. Was that footsteps he heard behind him? Spurt. The people below were staring at him. One or two were running, and his breath was beginning to slow in his throat. The tram was quite quite near now, and the jolly cricketers was noisily barring its doors. Beyond the tram were posts and heaps of gravel, the drainage works. He had a trans transitory idea of jumping into the tram and slamming the doors, and then he resolved to go for the police station. In another moment he had passed the door of the jolly cricketers. The jolly cricketers and was in the blistering fag-end of a street, with human beings about him. The tram drivers and his helper, arrested by the sight of his furious haste, stood staring with the tram horses, unhitched. Further on, the astonished faces of navvies appeared above the, above the mounds of gravel. His pace broke a little, and then he heard the swift pad of his pursuer, and leapt forward again. "'The invisible man!' he cried to the navvies, with a vague, indicative gesture, and by an inspiration leapt to the excavation and placed a burly group between him and the chase. Then, abandoning the idea of the police station, he turned into a little side street, rushed by a greens greengrocer's cart, hesitated for the tenth of a second at the door of a sweetstuff shop, and then made for the mouth of an alley that ran back into the main street, uh, the main hill street again. Two or three little children were playing here, and shrieked and scattered at his apparition, and forthwith the doors and windows opened and excited mothers revealed their hearts. Out he shot into Hill Street again, three hundred yards from the tram line, end, and immediately he became aware of a tumultuous vociferation and running people. He glanced up towards, he glanced up the street towards the hill. Hardly a dozen yards off ran a huge navvy, curse, uh, cursing in fragments and slashing viciously with a spade, and hard behind him came the tram conductor with his fists clenched. Up the street, others following. Up the street, others followed these two, sh sh uh, striking and shouting. Down towards the town, men and women were running, and he noticed clearly one man coming out of a shop door with a stick in his hand. Spread out! Spread out! cried someone. Kemp suddenly grasped the altered condition of the chase. He stopped and looked round, panting. He's close here! he cried. Form a line across! 
He was hit hard under the ear and went reeling, trying to face round towards his unseen antagonist. He just managed to keep his feet and he struck a vain counter in the air. He was hit hard on, again under the jaw and sprawled headlong on the ground. In another moment a knee compressed his diaphragm and a couple of eager hands gripped his throat, but the grip was one of uh, the grip of one was weaker than the other. He grasped the wrist, wrists and heard a cry of pain from his assailant, and then the spade of the navvy came whirling through the air above him and struck something with a, a dull thud. He felt a drop of moisture on his face. The grip at his throat suddenly relaxed, and with a convulsive effort, Kemp loosened himself, grasped a, li a limp shoulder, and rolled uppermost. He gripped the unseen elbows near the ground. "'I've got him!' screamed Kemp. "'Help! Help me! H hold! He's down! Hold his feet!' In another second there was a simultaneous rush upon the struggle, and a stranger coming into the road suddenly might have thought an ex exceptionally savage game of rugby football was in pro progress. And there was no shouting after Kemp's cry, only a sound of blows and feet and heavy breathing. And then came a mighty effort, and the invisible man threw off a couple of his antagonists and rose to his knees. Kemp, clutched, uh, Kemp clung to him in, f in front like a hound to a stag, and a dozen hands gripped and clutched and tore at the unseen. The tram conductor suddenly got the neck and shoulders and lugged him back. Down went the heap of struggling men again, uh, down went the heap of struggling men again, and rolled over. There was, I am afraid, I am afraid, some savage kicking, and then suddenly a wild scream of mercy, mercy that died down swiftly like a sound of choking. "'Grip back, you fools!' cried the muffled voice of Kemp, and there was a vigorous shoving back of stalwart forms. "'He's hurt, I tell you! Stand back!' There was a brief struggle to clear a space, and then the circle of eager faces saw the doctor kneeling, as it seemed, fifteen inches in the air, holding invisible arms to the ground. Beside him, a comfortable uh, constable gripped invisible ankles. "'Don't you go... Don't you, don't you leave go and, don't you leave go of him, cried the big navvy, holding a blood-stained spade. He's shamming. He's not shamming, said the doctor, cautiously raising his knee, and I'll hold him. His face was bruised and already going red. He spoke thickly because of a bleeding lip. He released one hand and seemed to be feeling at the face. The mouth's all wet, he said, and then, oh, good God. He stood up abruptly and then knelt down on the ground by the side of the thing unseen. There was a pushing and shuffling, a sound of heavy feet as, f as fresh people turned up the, to increase the pressure of the crowd. People now were coming out of the houses. The doors of the Jolly Cricketers stood suddenly wide, wide open. Very little was said. Kemp felt about, his hand seeming to pass through empty air. He's not breathing, he said, and then, I can't feel his heart. His side, ugh. Suddenly an old woman, peering under the arm of a big navvy, screamed sharply, sharply. Looky there, she said, and thrust out a wrinkled finger. Looking where she pointed, everyone saw, faint and transparent though it was, uh, faint and transparent as though it was made of glass, so that veins and arteries and bones and nerves could be distinguished, the outline of a hand, a limp hand and prone. It grew clouded and opaque even as they stared. Oh, hello, cried the constable. Here's his feet a-showin'. And so, slowly, beginning at his hands and feet and creeping along his limbs to the vital senses of his body, that strange change continued. It was like the slow spreading of a poison. First, first came the little white nerves, a hazy grey stretch of a limb, and then the glassy bones and intricate arter arteries, and then the flesh and skin. First a faint fogginess, and then growing rapidly dense and opaque. Presently they could see his crushed chest and his shoulders, and the dim outline of his drawn and battered features. When at last the crowd made, f made way for Kemp to stand erect, there lay, naked and pitiful on the ground, the bruised and broken body of a young man about thirty. His hair and brow were white, not grey with age, but white with the whiteness of albinism, and his eyes were like garnets. His hands were clenched, his eyes wide open, and his expression was one of anger and dismay. "'Cover his face,' said a man. "'For God's sake, cover that face!' And three little children, pushing forward through the crowd, were suddenly twisted round and sent packing off again. Someone brought a sheet from the Jolly Cricketers, and having covered him, they carried him into that house. And there it was, on a shabby bed in tawdry, ill-lighted bedroom, surrounded by a crowd of ignorant and excited people, broken and wounded, betrayed and unpitied, that Griffin, the first of all men to make himself invisible, Griffin, the most gifted physicist the world has ever seen, ended in an infinite disaster his strange and terrible career. And that's the end of the story. The epilogue. 
So ends the story of the strange and evil experiments of the Invisible Man. And if you would learn more of him, you, would, you must go to a little inn near Port Stowe and talk to the landlord. The sign of the inn is an empty board save for a hat and books, and the name is the title of this story. The landlord is a short and corpulent little man with a nose of cylindrical proportions, wiry hair, and a sporadic rosiness of visage. Drink generously, and he'll tell you generously of all the things that happened to him after that time, and how, of how the lawyers tried to do him out of the treasure found upon him. When they found they couldn't prove whose money was which, I'm blessed, he says. If they didn't try and ma to make me out a blooming treasure trove, do I look like a treasure trove? And then a gentleman gave me a guinea that night to tell the story at the Empire Music. All just to tell him in my own words, barring one. And if you want to cut off the flow of his reminiscence abruptly, you can always do so by asking if there weren't three manuscript books in the story. He admits there were and proceeds to explain with, with asservations that everybody thinks he has them, but bless you, he hasn't. The invisible man, it was took him off to hide him when I, when I cut and ran for Port Stowe. It's that Mr. Kemp put people with the idea of my having him. And then he subsidi subsides into a pensive state, watches you furtively, bustles nervously with glasses, and pre presently leaves the bar. He is a bachelor man. His tastes were ever bachelor, and there were no women folk in the house. Outwardly he buttons, it is expected of him. But in his more vital privacies, in the manner of braces, for example, he still turns to string. He conducts his house without expertise, nope, without enterprise, but with eminent decorum. His movements are slow and he's a great thinker, but he has a reputation for wisdom and a respectable parsimony in the village, and his knowledge of the roads of the south of England would beat Cobbett. Whoever Cobbett is. On Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning, all the year round, while he's closed, closed to the outer world, and every night after ten, he goes into his bar parlour, bearing a glass of gin, faintly tinged with water. And having placed this down, he locks the door and examines the blinds, and even looks under the table. And then being satisfied of his solitude, he unlocks the cupboard, and a box in the cupboard, and a drawer in the box, and produces three volumes bound in brown, le brown leather, places them solemnly in the middle of the table. The covers are weather-worn and tinged with an algal green, though once they sojourned in a ditch and some of the pages have been washed blank by dirty water. The landlord sits down in an armchair, fills a long clay pipe slowly, gloating over the books the while, and then he pulls one towards him and opens it and begins to study it, turning over the leaves backwards and forwards. His brows are knit and his lips move pain painfully. Hex, little two up in the air, cross and a fiddly dee, lord. What a one he was for intellect. Presently he relaxes and leans back and blinks through his smoke across the room at things invisible to other eyes. Full of secrets, he says. Wonderful secrets. Once I get the whole of them, Lord. I wouldn't do what he did. I'd just... Well. And he pulls at the pipe. And so he lapses into a dream. The undying, wonderful dream of his life. And though Kemp has, finished, uh, though Kemp has fished unceasingly... No human, save the landlord, knows those books are there, with the subtle secret of invisibility and a dozen other strange secrets written therein, and none, none other will know of them until he dies. That is the end of the story. And the end of The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for coming along for the ride. <laughs>